ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome everyone to another season of the ESL SCT Masters Regionals. I'm Wardy today, joined by Loco as we uh, well as we kick off the Spring Regional. Loco, how we feeling, man? How we doing? Yeah, I'm doing really good, man. I'm excited for another season of StarCraft 2. There's uh, a lot of StarCraft 2 coming your way, of course, in case you're already here right at the very beginning. I believe we're doing like 12 best of threes together today, Wardy. So basically, you can just be with us the entire day. Yeah, we, we are busy, and that's kind of the, the way that this works for the next four weeks of action. We have just got long days, loads of StarCraft 2 across all the different regions. I think on Sunday, there's even a spectacular showing of 16 best of threes, which has never been done before. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be a bit of a ride. Uh, we're definitely in for it. It's definitely going to be a good one. We're very much so looking forward to it. And, of course, we couldn't be here without our wonderful sponsors once ESL again. Nope, that's not the right, right button. I pressed the wrong button on the first opportunity. That's impressive. Our sponsors, okay, <laughs> Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and ESL Shop. And uh, also, of course, this whole Spring Regional builds towards the offline portion of the tournament, which is going to be in Dallas, of course, which you can get your tickets for right now. So make sure you go and get your hands on those if you would uh, like to be there in person and to watch the StarCraft and join us for all of that excitement. It's going to be an absolutely wild time. So make sure you check that out and uh, get your tickets. And we do have one more little thing just to mention here quickly, which is that tomorrow... It is, of course, the wonderful GSL Finals. You can watch that on Afrika.tv uh, oh, slash GSL English. Watch the GSL Season 1 Finals. That obviously helps to build into our Spring Regional in Dallas at the end of the kind of the end of the road. That's where all of our Korean players are playing. So to go watch that GSL Finals because we've got some cool matchups there as well. So plenty to look at in that regard. That's the admin work out of the way. We can start talking about some games and some stuff that we've got coming up. Let's have a look at this standings board. We've got a brand new standings graphic to help show you how Swiss works. Three wins and you're through to the playoffs. Three losses and you are out. And we have eight uh, matches in round one loco here in the Asia region, including, you know, people such as Oliveira, our current world champion of StarCraft 2, is going to be back mm -hmm. at it today. Yeah, I believe we actually have him in our first best of three of the tournament. So today we're doing the Asian server first, and then we're switching on over to Europe a little bit later in the day. Uh, but yeah, Olivero, of course, I mean, incredibly good player. One of the very best, if not the best, from this particular region. So I do believe that he is, yeah, certainly one of the favorites going into the first day of the event here. But it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, we actually have some fun matches across the board as we make our way through Asia today, the first four matches. Oliveira taking on Misaki. Has going to go against Nanami, which I think could actually be kind of a fun and wild one. Max at Coffee is actually a pretty evenly matched first round uh, matchup here in Asia. And Cyan taking on Silky as this region continues to be dominated by the Chinese players. There's just so many of them, and uh, they really do stand atop of this region a lot of the time as of late. So be exciting to get this all underway, and um, we're ready. So I think the players are ready also. So I think we're pretty mm -hmm. much just all set to go. We're going to be opening up on Golden Aura for our first matchup of this 12 best of three long day. Oliveira versus Misaki, our current world champion versus someone that we've just not really heard as much about, Loco. No, absolutely. I uh, was just having a little bit of a look as well, exactly who Misaki has been playing and how he managed to qualify. So in order to actually be part of the regionals you also do have to beat some players along the way in a qualification for the regionals and he certainly yeah took some some games off of well-known names so also a bit of a new name for me personally i have seen him before in the past but it's been a little while uh, i mean Oliveira is certainly the favorite going into this first best of three but there's certainly a chance you know i think upsets are always a possibility right especially in asia mm -hmm. i feel like we have some crazy things happen in asia a lot of the time it does really kind of Go a little bit wilder than you expected to and all the rest of it. So that's definitely uh, one thing for us to think about here as we get this all set up and ready to go. We are going to head on in-game and have a look to see what is happening. So to start things off, we are going to begin with the Red Terran player. In the top left-hand corner of the map, we have representing Dragon Kaizy Gaming, Oliveira. And down here in the bottom right with the blue Zerg pieces, it's Misaki. Fantastic camera work here already by Mapu, who's going to be joining us for every single series here today. 
So if the, you know, the angles are going to look a little bit nicer than you're used to, that would be the reason as to why. There's going to be a massive difference in my observing last season to map who's observing it today. I can promise you that much. <laughs> this is one of the easiest and simplest ways to improve the show. We have our beautiful dedicated ops map here. He's going to be here all day with us as well, showing us the action. I learned us focus a bit more on actually what's happening in the games as well, which is obviously awesome from our point of view. So, yeah, uh, like I say, I gotta gotta love that. Absolutely nothing to hate about it. As we get set up here on Golden Aura for game number one, Loco, we are in this new mm -hmm. map pool that has a bunch of newer and weirder maps, although we are going to start with a map that's familiar to all. Yeah, we have actually seen the new maps quite a bit, and for example, the GSL, but also the Weekly Cups. I was actually a little surprised to see how frequently they've been chosen so far, especially certain maps, like for example, Post Youth, that are just very weird. And we've seen them in basically all the events so far. Golden Ara, of course, a map that we've had for some time already. It's probably been maybe half a year or so at this point in time, but I do fully expect we're gonna be seeing some of the crazier maps as well. And besides, of course, the new, well, maps that we now have part of this, uh, this tournament, we also have a multiplayer balance patch that went live since last time. There are a couple of changes, relatively minor across the board. I would say the most significant change would be to the Widow Mine. Overall, a little bit weaker, but certainly still very strong. Yeah, the Widow Mine is actually kind of fun. The fact that people can just see it so much more easily as well. Like that line that's just like, hey, look, this is what I'm targeting. And I feel like I've already seen examples of where that has been the saving grace a lot of the time. Where that has really been the opportunity to be like, oh, right. I can, you know, in a panicked moment, it's much easier to immediately pick out exactly what's going on where I need to be, how I need to be there, and all of that good stuff. So, yeah, that's uh, actually a very interesting change altogether. Still expecting, as we kind of mentioned, Oliveira to be a big favorite in this one. And kind of wondering if Misaki comes in with that kind of game plan of how the heck do I disrupt Oliveira? How the heck do I put him away from kind of the expectation of, like, letting him kind of control this game? Because Oliveira is like that. He's an aggressive player. He's a feisty player. He will be up in your face at the very first moment if you let him. And, and that's what you've got to try and figure out how to stop, because I don't know if Misaki has the ability to control stuff like that, but we lose the Reaper at the start of the game, and that's a big deal as Oliveira is the first to make a mistake. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, this is one of those moments where Zerk could, for example, if you're feeling really crazy, cancel link speed, add the drones back into the gas, put down a Roach Warren really quickly. You do really want to keep the Reaper alive. That is certainly a bit of a misstep right there from Oliveira. He wanted to get that creep tumor and then got a little bit greedy. All things considered, though, I am fully expecting here that Oliveira is just going to play a safe and sound match, right? So we have a classical 1-1-1 one, one, one here. No triple CC, but straight into a, well, a starport there before adding on that third command center. I do fully expect that we're going to see, ooh, a third CC in a moment, but the armory, I mean, it's 50 gas cheaper now with the new patch. It gets planted down real early, Wardy. These help out attacks cost a little bit less to invest into. Obviously, you're still going to be later on the third CC than you might typically be, but... Oliveira going to utilize, like you say, that gas change, and he's going to put that armory down, get the Hellbats a rolling, and I imagine we are going to be off and across the map very soon. I mean, this is going to hit quickly because that armory can come down that little sooner. So the first, you know, five, six Hellions are going to get across. Only three Marines in that medevac, but right now Misaki really doesn't have much to deal with this. This is going to be the defense with the Queens, and really just the Queens. There's only six Lings on the map, so they aren't going to help very much at all. Oh, here we go. Well, the Hellbats do need to be morphed into Hellbats first. I mean, we have the Hellions for now just taking a bit of a beating, and so far Misaki is doing just fine. Maybe a little bit late right there on the droning, but this may work out in his favor, because so far, well, his worker count is looking really healthy. Oliveira has only 29. Maybe the Hellions in the main base, though, can get some work done. Three workers, totally acceptable. I think he can probably lose upwards of, like, 10 and still be fine. Medivac goes down, and now we finally morph into Hellbats. I think seven drones, totally fine for the Zerg. Yeah, it is going to slow him down a little bit. Now, this is obviously not fully dealt with. There's Hellion on the low ground, but that's going to get dealt with as well. And, yeah, Oliveira kind of flops on this attack. I wonder if he just sort of saw a lack of links. It was like, okay, I don't actually need Hellbats. So, he just tried to micro yeah. with the Hellions, but it just took so long to really get into action. I mean, this is where you can still do well, because Misaki is refusing to rebuild links. He yeah. is just droning. He says the answer to all of this harass and you trying to kill my drones is just to make so many, you can't possibly kill them all. He just made 18 links this entire game so far, which is actually a very small amount considering the aggression here from Oliveira. Keep in mind, there's no third command center done yet here for the Terran. It's about halfway finished. It's at the front. This should be something that Misaki sees, although yeah, that Overlord is not actually poking all the way to 
uh, the vision there, but ultimately Mizaki here is in a fantastic position. I don't really think, being the underdog in a match like this, that you can be in a much better spot within the first six minutes of a game. No, I mean, you have all the drones in the world. Like, you asked yourself for the macro game, but from a fantastic spot, I mean, realistically, what can Oliveira push with right now that has any real strength behind it? As long as you start making units off of this drone count that you've established, you're in an absolutely golden position as that Liberia Siege is going to go after a couple of those drones. Oh. We just see these Hellions, though, are going to get by. And, I mean, at some point, is this Greed going to catch up to her? Maybe right now, there's still not many Lings on the map, and this is where we are. Going to lose a bunch of workers and maybe just holding down oh. the Burum button was not the right answer. 21 will fall, and these Hellions will get a good few Lings along with it. Yeah, the Queens were sleeping on the job. They were all in one big bunch on the left side. And Oliveira said, yo, if that's where your Queens are hanging out, don't mind if I do. And just like that, I mean, the first six minutes of this game were really good for Mizaki. And then the last 30 seconds, not so much. Yeah, this really started off very well and then just went yeah. absolutely horrendous right very quickly afterwards. What a disaster, just out of absolutely yeah. nowhere. Just, I mean, I guess it was coming. The guy was like, hey, I'm just going to drone. And it's like, okay, well, that actually worked the first time because you held this off. But then he was like, I am, and I'm only going to drone. And we're like, no, no, no. At, at some point, we have to, like, stop the drones. Bro. He's like, I'm going to keep droning. But the thing from Oliver was that he kept building Hellions, right? That's something yeah. you don't typically see. You don't see that next wave of Hellions in that kind of number. So maybe Misaki was not wrong. But then when that amount of Hellion shows up, he didn't have Lings ready. He was maybe waiting for the, you know, Marines with Stim and stuff, which is being, you know, another minute down the line. In that case, he would have been fine against the Hellions. Not quite so much. And Oliveira ends up netting himself the first map of victory to start things off today. I think if he had the Queens in a slightly better spot, he would be fine too. So one thing we see quite a bit now at the highest level for Zerg players is that they have multiple control groups for the Queens. Oftentimes also for the Queens that are spreading the creep around the map, they also are in multiple control groups. So one squad on the left, one squad on the right. And we just sort of saw all the Queens standing there in one big bunch. If they would have been in the right position when those Hellions drove in that direction, it would have been fine. But ultimately they started chasing, well, very fast staring units. And yeah, ultimately that was just a little too much. So that's the beauty of a game of StarCraft, right? I mean, that was certainly not the beginning that Oliveira was hoping for, but then like a house of cards, it all came well, tumbling down right there for Misaki. But he did put himself in a really good spot. I'm not exactly sure what his plan was though, going into it, right? So I actually expected him to play something a bit more aggressively because Oliveira is happy to play the macro game and just, well, make a bunch of command centers and really create a massive army off of that so i kind of expected him to maybe do some roach aggression or something along those lines and if he would have had a roach warren down in this game and he just attacked right after for example that first group of hellions fell flat on its face that was a very good opportunity for him to just straight up win game number one but anyways we have to find out here what happens on uh, on ghost river which is one of the new maps a map with a very quick rush distance oh absolutely ghost river i'm kind of surprised to almost see that um <clears throat> this is, you know, I'm kind of surprised to see that this is like even in the map pool in a way, because a lot of people are saying this map is very good for Terran actually, where it's like you can just sit, defend. There's a limited amount of bases, so if you go late game, it's very difficult for Zerg to ever get that one base advantage that they need against a Terran player. So I gotta imagine that that is kind of interesting for me to see Misaki being here, but maybe the Misaki has some kind of aggressive plan in general. Yeah, one of the problems you run into here, as a Zerg player at least, is that you only have one third base option. So if Terran blocks it, you're in a world of trouble. You have to play very flexibly, and then there's that siege tank spot behind the rocks yeah. with like the mineral fields right next to it, the skinny mineral fields too. There's a bunch of really good positions, and like you said, Terran can just, well, sort of mech her up and slowly build up that eco. So I'm a little surprised to see this as well in game number two of a best of three, because we do now have nine maps in the map pool, meaning that the players can actually veto quite a few. And apparently Mizaki let this one slip through the cracks. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely an interesting little factor that we're going to see this map at all. So let's go in game. Let's have a peek and let's see whether or not we're going to have any upset at all. As in the top right, we do have the player who is absolutely the favorite, our world champion of StarCraft 2 from Dragon Kaiser Gaming. It's Oliveira. And up here in the top left hand corner of the map, with the blue Zerg pieces, it's Misaki. Beautiful. Yeah, the camera, the camera zoom, dude. You couldn't do that last season. 
You know what, Nero? Sometimes I forgot to do it. I don't late. <laughs> you know, at, at the end of the 10 hour day, my brain was like, oh, wait, I was meant to zoom in. Now zoom in. Cool cast is already talking about the SCV proxy, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do the introduction. What if you don't know who's yeah. playing? I love how the first thing that Matthew said to me was, hey, <laughs> I hate the introductions, but <laughs> how, how are we doing them? <laughs> I was like, oh, Matthew, you're in for a bad time. We're going to introduce everybody every time, I promise you. I feel like it's the worst if you're an observer, right? You're a dedicated observer, and the casters just will not do the intro, and you're just sitting there with your camera centered on the command center or the hatchery, and nothing's really happening. You just, you know, at some point you start shaking the camera a little bit to maybe try and see if you can wake up the casters, but we'll try and help you out mapu we'll, we'll try and make it easy for you but at some point we may have to do introduction chicken you know or you may just have to do it by yourself <laughs> yeah. at some point you'll just start like typing away but we actually don't have his screen so we can't <laughs> even see him type <laughs> we've really we've really muted the observers completely for this event loco it's a whole new yeah. level no mapu can't even really talk back to us at all he would have to dedicate to typing on the observer chat and that is just that yeah. is not cool I we can't do that can't do that that's a step too far. Yeah, now it's in, it's part of the replay files too, you know? Like, that would just be a disaster. <laughs> so, Mapu has been completely silenced. Well, amongst the silencing, there is, uh, once again, a little bit of a setup going on here. Oliveira is not going second gas just yet, and if he doesn't take it right now, but pretty much what he actually does. So, as I was about to say, then we are going to be seeing that third CC, but second gas comes in, so we will see ourselves with another little bit of Terran aggression, even though the last game it didn't exactly start out brilliantly, in the end it got him there. This is going to be round two of at least doing something a bit aggro or starport before we expand again. This is just something yeah. which on this map especially, I guess, makes a lot of sense. This could just be Hellion Banshee, right? Play very safe on a short rush distance map. Make sure roaches aren't going to come and kill you while also having great harassment options for yourself. Uh, that would be my you know, initial guess, just because it's also a very standard way to play. We'll see what exactly it is that Oliver wants to do, because he could drop an armory and just whack out a help out attack one more time. Yeah, I think Olivera is doing this specifically against Misaki right now, because he knows he's the favorite going into this, and one of the nice advantages, one of the byproducts of opening up with a later third command center is that you actually, well, can't really lose against a whole lot of Zerk aggression, even if you, for example, go up against Roaches, as long as you have, for example, Hellion Benchy, you should have plenty of defensive units out against that sort of attack. Right now, though, yeah, it is a bit uncommon, right? At the highest level of StarCraft to go for the starport before the third command center, but Oliveira just making sure that he's as safe as possible. And even though he did the exact same thing in game number one and he did end up winning it, he didn't really win it based off of that strat. Here we go again. We just have the one-to-one -one copy. It's once he, more an armory. He just wants to send it, man. He's just going to plop that armory down. We're going to get this on the go, and we are going to see what happens as... To be fair, I feel like if he made the Hellbats hell yeah. hell last time, he might have seen more success. So maybe he can just see that adjustment and say, hey, I can actually do better than I did last time. So let's just try and do that this time. Because, yeah, this is the exact same. Three Marines, Chunk of Hellions, Armory on the way. The only defense right now is five Lings, four Queens. Not even a super high Queen count. No, he saw the uh, Hellions also fly by or I guess drive by that Overlord. One of the OVs actually does fall and he didn't start up any Zerklings there until, well, much later. Now all of a sudden though, this Terran army is indeed on the creep. Medivac super helpful here as well. Queens do try to target it down, but I don't think there's even remotely enough defense so far here for the Zerk player. Still not really starting up a lot of links. I mean, he's been a bit supply block, but he's had at least a little bit available to, well, add on some additional defenses. And now suddenly Oliveira is getting the damage done that he was looking for in game number one of this series. Still though, his worker count is really nothing to write home about. But yeah, Oliveira is certainly getting more than what he got in game number one. Yeah, the question now, I guess, is like, hey, do I run into the natural or do I just sit and kill the third base? And he says, I'm going to run into the natural. Right now, there's enough Hellbats still alive without Queen support. That realistically, at any point, you can just always fight the Lings, right? And I think that's what this comes down to. As you say, GG is called there. And that is going to be just plain and simple round two for Oliveira. And he's not going to waste any time at all at the start of the competition, Loco. He is just going to come <laughs> in. He is going to win. And he is going to mean business, apparently. So... There you go, Oliver, yeah. with a plain, simple victory to start off Swiss Day 1 in the Asia region.
It's one of those build orders that historically has never really gotten nerfed. As a matter of fact, with this new patch, I guess it's slightly stronger since the armory is a bit cheaper to build, but we rarely see it at the highest level of StarCraft. So I wonder if maybe that's the reason why Misaki here was caught off guard just a little bit, because losing the game twice in a row within about six minutes or so is not really what you're hoping for. But he simply didn't have any units. He just had a bunch of queens and about six links this time around for the base defense. It's just not enough. Absolutely not enough at all, and uh, that's going to lead us to an end of the first matchup, guys. So we're already done for matchup number one. I only pressed the wrong button once so far, so I'd say we're doing pretty darn nice. good. Uh, we are going to send it to a quick little break. We have got an update. Uh, if you watch previous seasons, we have less breaks uh, this season round, so we're going to have shorter breaks, which means we'll be back into that next series ASAP. We'll just be getting the players online, the game hosted, and when we come back, we should hopefully be ready to dive right on into it. So we'll get that all on the go, and we'll see you guys on the other side.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back as we have a whirlwind of a matchup to start the day off. Olivera, world champion of StarCraft II, takes down Misaki 2-0 and we move straight on in to some PvP because it wouldn't be the regionals without PvP. And we're going to be moving on into Haspers and Nanami. Nanami had some good results last season, so uh, honestly, kind of excited to see if he can put up a fight against a Has who has declined in terms of results compared to what we maybe expected of Has once upon a time. So, should be a fun little best of three that we got coming up next year in the ESL Regionals, Loco. Yeah, I think this one is going to be a little bit more competitive than our previous match so far. Um, both of these guys, in my mind, are relatively close in skill level. I mean, because of Has's history, I kind of feel like he's the favorite going into this one, but I haven't really seen that many of his games as of late. Like you mentioned, Nanami had some good results last time around, and it's a Protoss versus Protoss too, played with the new patch, and the sentry change is actually quite significant, so it should be a fun one. Yeah, no, the sentry change actually makes this matchup really interesting because sentries don't die to adept and oracle openers, which are some of the better openers as well. So you can actually get away with going sentry a whole lot more often. You know, just from the very get-go, this becomes a way more interesting matchup because, you know, basically the option that lets you expand and kind of play a longer game is suddenly so much better that obviously becomes very intriguing. So, uh, let's get into it. In the top right corner, we're going to start off with the Red Pearls player, Legend of StarCraft 2, of course. It is Haas. And down here in the bottom left corner of Dynasty, we're looking at none other than Nanami's main Nexus. Do we have to uh, discuss map pronunciations again, uh, Wardy? Is it Dynasty or Dynasty? I feel like we say Dynasty all the time, though. Yeah, I know, but, but I like, you know, I, I found that some... Since, yeah, since you're know, from, from the UK, you know, wouldn't yeah, you but, say Dynasty? Well, you know, at least these ones are just like, hey, you pronounce it this way and I pronounce it that way. Not like, none of us know how to pronounce it, so we're just going to make it up from the start, right? <laughs> <Fair>. <laughs> you don't say ZVZ either, right? So I guess, yeah, yeah we, we, can, we can call it Dynasty, it's fine. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> so many people actually get annoyed for me for when I say Maru. Because they're like, it's not Maru, it's Maru. Maru. And I'm like, no, it's Maru. <laughs> like, that's just how I say it. And they're like, you're so wrong. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Like, I just, I just, yeah, now sometimes I say Maru just to, like, appease them. Like, once every, like, ten times I say it, I'm like, Maru. I really make an emphasis. Fair on enough. So. Here we go, though. Mapu already highlighting that golden, that golden natural expansion. It's very exposed, however. It looks like Nanami has decided that he doesn't really want to take that expo, not just yet, but he's making it look to Haas as if he did take that expansion, or at the very least that he may be planning on it, because he did wall himself in fully. Has is going to start looking around the right side of the map. Sadly for him, that's the wrong angle. That's the wrong angle. Yeah, it's uh, going to be uh, a little bit of a miss in that regard. We obviously see the Cyber Core coming online. We're going to start seeing the units. Is Adept here already out in Nanami? Look at that. Adept, Proxy, Twilight. We are on the way to DT. Surely that Twilight came down so quickly in the upper left-hand side. Mm -hmm. And the cheese is alive here in the PvP. Absolutely. Haas is looking around the bottom right-hand corner of the map, but he can't find anything. And that's because, well, it's all the way at the 12 o'clock position. He may very well find it here eventually, and picking up on that would be massive. I guess it would also be possible to see if the opponent expended by going towards that golden mineral line. I mean, maybe it's not the highest priority. Either way, where are you going to go? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, at least he could, you know, deny a scouting probe. <laughs> Beautiful. Are you right? I was like, where are you going? And he just he pops over the gold base. I said, you have the probe. He's going to spot it. And yep. Hass is going to know. This is huge as well because Hass is playing very much so a situation here where, well, he sees a Twilight. He didn't see the Dark Shrine, but the assumption is that you can go back and check. Hass only built a Twilight Council, so he was not looking to get detection up early. Hass does have to notice, though. Right? Yeah. Do something, Has. He, he did not actually see the Dark Shrine itself. No. And when you're going into a Twilight Council, he actually just doubles down with Blink here. You don't have... So when you go Stargate or you go Robo, you have a form of detection. In this particular instance, you don't. So the Nami's plan is to try and warp in units over the other side of that golden wall to try and see if he can, well, send them into the opponent's base. This would be really surprising. He just plants down a Nexus and he does go for the Robo facility here eventually. But the Observer is going to have to come out quickly. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you're just going to wall this off and buy a bit of time, this is probably going to be all right, you know? 
I'm worried because yeah. I was like just wanting to make sure he was definitely respecting the idea that this could happen. He has very much so done that. This DT warping never happens in time. That is not a correct warping from Nanami. That's going to be nope. cancelled. That delays your DTs even further. And this is just looking to be a defense from Hass already. He hasn't even had to do anything yet. I mean, Nanami expands. But he's going to be so far behind on Blink. When Stalkers have an Observer with them and they can just Blink around the map and harass and move about, they're going to have the time of their lives. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Hess is uh, ready to, to send it here in just a moment. He's going to have, well, pretty much a full minute, maybe even a minute and a half or so, where his opponent won't have that upgrade. So he's going to have full map control for quite a while. Nanami did take the faster expansion, I guess, by ever so slight margin. So maybe he's going to be able to figure out that he can shut it down. But finding this pylon would be nice for him. It looks like it's not going to be the case. There is a prism coming on the back of this too. I'd really like to see uh, Haas move across the map right now because he does have Blink finishing. Yeah, I'm kind of with you, right? Just, I mean, he's got Blink. He's going to have the detection. I think at this time you just go and put some pressure on. This is where your advantage would lie from having denied those DTs. Haas is actually down in workers. So, like, it is somewhat important that he gets going. Mm -hmm. He's got the Prism coming up, so I expect this is going to happen uh, very shortly. And there is, of course, a little threat where it's like, well, I don't want to be completely undefended if something shows up in my base because you do still have that Dark Shrine available. But uh, yeah, I think you've just got to leave a couple units at home if that's your concern and just send it because sticking around back at home just ain't yeah. it right now. You could even, if he's really concerned about that, just go after that tech, right? But sitting completely at home would be a bit of a misstep. Now he does go across the map, though. But like you said, the worker count is looking really good right now for Nanami. Plus, those are golden minerals he's bringing back. So his income is not bad whatsoever. Problem is, at this point, he doesn't have Blink until right now. Okay, well, both players are going to be able to start that dance. Has does have the larger unit count, right? So that is one of the advantages. Decides to go across that mineral wall. And I think just like that, there's a whole lot of problems right here for Nanami. The very least that worker count is going to be reduced a little. So far, not entirely game over yet. We have two observers scouting each other. That's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. You do shut down the pile on this other side once again. Stalkers are still trading on the bottom side of the map also. So we will just continue to see these Stalkers trading with other Stalkers. I was going to see the super battery popping in this way. Has just steps back for a moment. He will maintain an army supply lead here. That's the thing, right? You know, he's already mm -hmm. ahead on army supply. They're both on equal numbers of gateways. Okay, Has is down a couple of workers, but it's not like Nanami's been mining super cleanly because he's had to pull workers away a couple of times over. So in theory, Has should still at some point be able to overwhelm. The only thing is a lot of Has's stalkers are getting low on HP, so it's kind of difficult to keep them in the fights long enough before they have to blink away to keep themselves alive. That may be what Nanami is hanging on to right now as we're not quite able to break through onto that gold base just yet. Yeah, and Nanami is also really making a lot of shield batteries. Battery overcharge is going to be available again too in just a moment. Those probes just awkwardly in the middle of this fight returning resources, but they really need to because that's the only way that Nanami could ever come back into this. Now that arc though, that concave here, very good as well for Haas. And I think ultimately he will be able to get a very significant advantage out of this, but it is not going very smoothly so far. No, I kind of expected this might be looking a little bit easier, a little bit, uh, you know, smoother. But uh, yeah, apparently not the case. I mean, Has still has the army supply lead. He's just down on workers. He's going to lose a few more now as well as this gold base gets hit again. So he will lose a couple there. And now still keep the pressure up on this other side where an army genuinely, I mean, a worker advantage given time. He is genuinely going to have something a little bit favorable for himself. So progress is being made. And now he is hanging on for now. You were so excited about that sentry buff, Wardy. Yeah. We haven't gotten you, any you, sentries you know in this particular it, game yet. You, you know what it is? Actually, I'm not surprised because Pass is not the kind of player to kind of like be like, you know what? Yeah. There's this new cool way to expand and play macro. Like, okay, let's utilize that. Um, it may be in Europe a bit later on. We'll see the new sentry in a bit more kind of uh, royalty. Because right now it's not. Manami actually anyway. doubling down, by the way, going into the uh, Dark Templar blink right now. He's been trying to warp Dark Templar into his opponent's natural multiple times. Has never been able to really make value out of that, so he decides to go into the Shadow's Trite research. Takes a while, it's quite expensive, but it looks like this game isn't quite over yet. And like you've been saying, he had the worker advantage a long time ago. I mean, right now it's finally been evened up and it's slightly in favor of Haas, but really for like the first, I mean. Yeah, maybe four minutes of this fight going on, Nanami has had a bigger economy, so it really does add up over the course of this game. He's he's actually just stabilizing here. Yeah, no, he really is. Stalker's gonna blink at one another there as we come back through, and we'll just be seeing a couple more Stalkers warped in. I mean, the problem for Haas has really just been getting into a fight, because 
you can't really just blink yeah. across into this, but then you can't really sit behind this and kind of trade equally either, right? So it's a little bit of a dodgy one. There's a few more stalkers get warped in. Hask is going to keep this position, but hey, Blink DTs are about to be on the map and they can cause some trouble. Let's see how well they can do as Hask does come in there and this trade actually looks a little bit better. He's getting a couple of the kills even. Yeah, the concave is just massive here, right? Just the surface area right here on those red stalkers really does help out. Now we do have the blink available, but I mean, I kind of feel like you can fight that if you're really concerned about those blink stalkers. But anyways, apparently we're going to try and see if maybe we can go up that ramp. The Adept's already softening up the pylon a little bit. They're distracting it. And ultimately, there we go. We go across the mineral wall. He was uh, a little indecisive. Haas has been winning this fight with the Stalkers for a long while. But he, like you said, he can't really commit to a massive blink over that wall. He would just be in a, in a huge amount of trouble. Maybe he can still with a massive lead. He's actually just going to kill the CC. Or, well, the Protal CC. Yeah, he's going to cut the Nexus. Maybe Haas can just go now. I mean, this is 64 to 38 army supply, and a bunch of the army supply on the other side of the map is in DTs, remember? So that was an investment. As we do get in, we kill the Nexus, and the DTs get out. This is why you've just got to go. We're going to lose our pylon there and then lose power to those gateways. So I think mm -hmm. Haas, like I say, just... I think it's rough, because if he blinks in, he knows a lot of his units are low HP, so blinking in is not exactly great. I don't see what other he options you really have. Yeah, you just got to go because you've yeah, at the very least you're down to next right now. Here we go. We blink in, but some of the stalkers get stuck. So it's not quite going to be the fight that Haas wants. He's going to move downwards. He's going to want to get his other stalkers in here ASAP. But yeah, this is not it at all. I mean, that's why he was afraid of it. It was not going to be a pretty fight, but his hand was kind of forced, man. Only 17 workers remain right now. Make it 16, 15. He's losing even more at home. That natural expansion is a remade, so at the very least, Haas is going to, okay, be able to shut down that War Prism too, and he is going to be able to get some decent income here again in a moment, but Nanami is now basically more than doubling his opponent's economy, which is massive. Haas was thinking about going around the site with his massive army. He's got all those stalkers, but he hasn't really been able to get a lot of value out of them. I mean, he's been trying, he's been trading cost-efficiently, but Nanami, after his Dark Templar opener, completely fell flat on his face, he's doubled down, and he somehow made a game out of this somehow some way i mean he is up in workers his army supply is looking good enough has only just now gets his gold base back online okay nanami was not mining from the gold the entire time because of has's position but you know so what at this stage as has comes around with these stalkers hmm. going to move back through the center and yeah absolutely we are 100 back into this game as nanami which is something quite incredible yeah insane i don't think this was really uh the original plan that probe has been stuck for a long time. I was thinking maybe blink across and target fire down the pylons, shut down those shield batteries ASAP, but when the blue stalkers take up this much space, just their physical existence on the map, it makes it difficult for those stalkers in red to get across the wall off. So in a weird way, standing your, your, your ground in this like, well, uh, technically inferior position on that left side of the wall. It's it's making it difficult for Has to really be aggressive. I mean, I don't think you want to clump up your stalkers like that, though. That is going to create more service area than you need. But now Has is in a weird position where, yeah, he still technically has more army units than his opponent, but just barely. And very soon, Nanami is going to be able to, well, bring the fight to him. Yeah, I mean, Nanami's not far away from actually just moving out and about himself, right? I mean, what's missing for Nanami? Perhaps a prism if he actually wants to be on the map. He had that once upon a time, but that got cleaned up while harassing. So, no, he's uh, he's looking good. He's the one that's still adding the probe here and there as well. So that in you know additional income is still very much to in play. And he still has the DT that can just blink across here and try and cause some trouble. Okay, the stalkers and the knobs, but you can still grab a couple of probes at least. I'm surprised he didn't just send it in and write a couple of workers down. <laughs> Map was making a good point there, actually. The mineral war is starting to run out. So we actually have a uh, an opening right now with those mineral fields being completely depleted. Dark Templar, of course, can be used as well in this fight if they really want to. There's one observer remaining for Haas on this side in a map at the very least. So if Nanami can snipe the opponent's observer, then suddenly, I mean, he needs his observer to be in range, but then suddenly the Dark Templar can be really forcing the issue too. Man, those shield batteries, I actually thought he was getting a little carried away making that many of them, but they've been so valuable. Yeah, Hass is just constantly trying here, but he I think he's gonna bleed out over the next couple minutes He needs to get something done. He needs to do it soon. And even though it's been a Nami with his back against the wall this entire time I yeah, I'm very impressed with the way he's managed to recover this Yep, oh, he's there's... trying to get the observer. Yeah, he wants to get oh. it so bad oh, Almost and again the obvious just forces this back right as well. Oh, stalkers don't do that. That's a gift oh. a couple going down there from the Nami is Hass still just about maintains the army supply lead throughout this and they continue to trade out over in this position. 
and we'll just see when we'll still this get. This is a hot game, in. all right, there, Mar uh, This is just such a hot game right now. Even if you haven't seen him play in a little bit, it is just so funky. The man likes to play these crazy matches, but I think this one is not really meant to be. He brought a, a sentry too, so we do ultimately get one. Madness. I mean, this is... Uh, Nanami just can't leave his base, though. I mean, trying to do this is not working for him at all. I mean, he's just gifting so many stalkers walking through this choke. Just back up. Just just chill. What, do what you were doing already, you know? Yeah. He's trying his best, but I, I, I don't really see how there's a lot of longevity. Now, he has been rebuilding his work account, by the way. So, once upon a time, he had less workers in his game than he started the map off with. But he's climbed back up to 21. There's going to be that weird moment where Nanami is actually going to be oversaturating his bases because he is running out of cash and has still has some more money remaining in these gold and mineral fields. Now suddenly though, the Dark Templar numbers here are big enough to just start fighting the Stalker straight up. There's also an opening, by the way, in this wall off too, so I didn't even really need to blink across. Yeah, I think he just wanted about to... going after the Nexus. I think he just wanted to blink on top of the Stalker's ASAP as now we actually have the recall coming through. Shot that was just a moment too late. If Yobbs comes across, we can do uh, a little bit of a killing on that. As Has gets away, 10 army supplies still in the lead. As now actually we do get a catch though, he went the wrong way for a moment, which means Nanami is able to kill off a few units and he is able to take a little bit more of an edge for himself. And maybe that's all Nanami needs. And now army supplies even out and Nanami comes to the middle of the map. And this is where Has' oh, units, all being in yeah. the red health, may have an effect as well. Oh, oh he also decides to donate one of his own stalkers. There are two Has. There's just simply not enough units in blue here to really properly fight this. What a Absolutely silly nice. game. In the meantime, the Dark Templar are going to town. There's a warp prism desperately trying to help out, but that warp in was not fast enough in the end. I mean, that was like a double warp in here with the fast prism as well as that pylon. Dark Templar, they'll blink. They use their Shadow Stride ability to get towards that low ground, and now they find a couple stalkers, okay? They just hugged them for a moment before, well, turning their blades against them. Nanami going to the front. Supply count is actually surprisingly even. Yeah, no, I, that's what's had me the whole time. It's okay. like, I feel as though the numbers should not have been as kind of, you know, close as they have been. Cool. Because Nanami should have been able to overtake. And now Nanami just gifts away a bunch of units as Has is going to try and re-expand. The DTs are going to say no to that. So Has just <laughs> isn't allowed this base, but there's not even that many minerals left on this base. At what point no. do you just give up on it? He recalls the uh, Dark Templar right now, and some of them do manage to go back home. I think he managed to get three of them out. All right, there is an observer there, so at the very least, Haas has confirmation that they did indeed go all the way back home. At some point, one of these guys is going to have to take another base, which is, you know, if this if this goes on for long enough, we need to make a new expansion. I mean, I guess Haas is retaking that, well, golden mineral line, but can you really go anywhere else? Nanami had 25 probes on, like, two mineral fields. It's so very suboptimal. Yep, this is not exactly... Uh... Looking too hot at all across oh, the board as well. We get the prism. prism. Prism is actually so costly yeah. at this point. I mean, that's very expensive. You you barely have minerals. Your main base is mined out. The gold is not mining at all. Like this is a genuinely like an economy issue for Haas, as he's going to be in a base trade now. Because what other silly thing could we add to this game than starting to base <laughs> trade it out? Seventeen and a half oh. minutes deep. We're going to recall though. Haas feels like he's in a worse base trading position. I mean, I feel like Haas is the he's guy that has structures. to go. No. I mean, I yeah, guess Yeah, he has so. less structure, so he needs to do something. There's a Nexus now being proxied in the top left-hand corner too by Nanami, which is quite clever. But I think if he's going to do that, he needs to get out of his opponent's main base. Uh, some of the Stalkers here do manage to go down there in the end. Dark Templar kill whatever they can. Because obviously, if you do a base race here, I think Hass was looking at it. He's like, wait a second, I really only have one base. My opponent has two. I've got so many of those shield batteries that have been bothering me for a long time to kill. I guess I need to go back home and... Well, save my expansion. Right now, though, Haas' army is looking massive compared to Nanami, but he's going up against Nanami, who has a hidden nexus, and that base can actually be incredibly valuable. He's yeah. only got six probes. I mean, that's, yeah. okay, that's why I came for Haas was in a bit of a checkmate situation, because he was having to recall home because he's going to lose the base raid. is not great because Nanami, in theory, had the eco advantage of the extra bases, but you're right, only six probes. Maybe it doesn't matter that much. As, uh, yeah, Hassa's army is once again huge, but he's terrified of the counterattacks, and right, rightly so. The fact that Nanami still has access to those DTs as well is also a pretty big deal, so I can only imagine that that is also going to be a factor. Yeah, I suggested at the very start when Blink first finished for Haas that he should maybe go and shut down that Dark Shrine. I think in hindsight, that's probably what he would have rather done as well. Because he could have just picked it up when he first finished the Blink upgrade. There was nothing out for Nanami on the map and it was, 
well, two structures there for free. I still think at that point he would have been in a comfortable position with a small advantage, but he decided to make the game a little crazy. I also didn't really think that this stalker fight for Nanami, though, at the Golden Wall here was gonna go as well as it ultimately did. It was so funky. Now, Hass actually sees this probe. Where is this probe going? It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Is it gonna do a proxy? Are we making another Nexus? Now there's another probe and a third as well. That's a clear indicator to Hass that there is indeed a base out there somewhere and that those probes are being rallied across the map. So this is an indicator to him that he needs to move out and that's what he does. Yep, gonna get a move on. He has 20 army supply up, so he's gonna be good to move out as well. He catches a bunch of the Stalkers here as well, right? That's just a big win. Gets the double obs too. He's already got Stalkers top left, in fact, so he's found this GG. base and apparently that will do it. Haas will take the GG. Haas will get himself a victory here. Uh, how exactly, honestly, I'm still not quite sure, but uh, <laughs> one heck of a game to say the very least, if nothing else, as Haas takes the 1-0 lead. That was a crazy game. Yeah, if you haven't seen a lot of games yet on the new patch, look, the new multiplayer balance patch is nice and all. It's some quality of life improvements. In this matchup, the center change certainly is significant, but the new maps have been really fun, at least for me personally, to watch games on and to cast them. It's been... It's been a blast. I mean, you can't really do this on, uh, well, for example, Alcyone, which is going to be our next game in this series. You don't really have a map feature like that, and the creativity that it forces is just, yeah, really, really enjoyable. I really didn't think, though, that that defense was going to be manageable for Haas, or, or sorry, for Nanami in that previous game, because Haas had the bigger stalker numbers and he had the service area advantage, right? Because he had more space to maneuver those stalkers around in, and ultimately, that usually, at least, means that you're gonna win the fight but nanami just using those battery overcharges and those like i think he made like a half dozen batteries there in the natural extension eventually <sighs> he somehow managed to stabilize there got an advantage and then well i still managed to squeeze out a win but that was a that was a really dynamic match it was just straight up bonkers i mean it really just didn't quite play the way i thought it was going to at any point and then Somehow, I, I think at the end of the day, Nanami really had so many moments where he just gifted so many Stalkers. I mean, I can't get over the yeah. fact he just bled Stalkers through that narrow choke point. He lost like six, seven Stalkers there. That is absolutely mm -hmm. enough to have made the uh, to made the difference. So, I think that's one of those things which you got to kind of look at as well and just be like, like, what the heck did we really just witness? This really was something a bit ridiculous. Um, a lot of mistakes, yeah. honestly, but uh, that's the fun. I, I think Asia. Nanami bleeding out, like, he, he must have bled out, like, at least a dozen stalkers throughout that game, right? Like, there were multiple engagements where the fights just went slightly better for Haas, and that, well, if he had, like, imagine him having, like, ten more stalkers near the end of that game, it would have looked very different. Yep. Absolutely, as, uh, let me just wait for this next uh, game. Looks as though we're just gonna change VPNs and stuff for a couple moments, so it'll just be a few minutes. We get this one to way get into our second round of our second series. As, uh, yeah, we're in the middle of Asia, which is typically a, ma uh, a region, I should say, which I always feel like is very interesting. It always has these kind of weird series and stuff, so it's almost not surprising to see the first PvP of Asia already becoming a bit of a fiesta. Um, but uh, yeah, just in general, we've got fun matches in this region of day. Max at Coffee, I'm looking forward to. I think Cyan Silky could be very fun as well. It's just across mm -hmm. the board, a lot of fun matches to come. As we have, again, 12 best of threes in total. One down, one and a half down, 11, well, 10 and a half to go. We'll be here for a while is basically what it comes down to. Yeah, so What's funny though is that like going know. into that... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I am just saying, making sure people know we're going to be here a while, you know, like... Yeah, just yeah, guarantee. yeah, don't go anywhere. Just put us on your second monitor, whatever you need to do, just stay the entire day, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. What's interesting to me though is that Haas wasn't the one that made that game you know, that crazy. It was Nanami who opened up with the proxy Dark Templar, and that ultimately is what led this, uh, yeah, very strange game. Haas was actually opening up a relatively normal, especially for his standard. Yeah, no, the, the actual opening was pretty, pretty normal. To be fair, over the last two, three years, Haas has gone from being this crazier player to this much more like, yeah. hey, I'm just going to play fairly normal builds and rely more so on my micro and things. Um, and, and I feel like you know, a while back we were being like, oh, why is Haas doing? But like, nowadays it really is. That is just more normal, everyday kind of Haas, right? Like, that is more so yeah. what he just does day in and day out. So, yeah, in that regard, I'm kind of not surprised. But it's still weird because, like, we've grown up and learned to realize that, hey, Haas is a name where you expect him to proxy. You expect him to be crazy and all the rest of it, right? So, the interest as we get ourselves going into game number two here. Haas and Anami coming up right now. Indeed, our best of three series continues. Both players are ready. 
Let's find out. All right, we're going to get this one underway. Let me set this up and get this going. And we'll kick off into round number two. All right. Uh, in the top right-hand side, this is going to be our red Protoss player. This is Hass. And his opponent, all the way in the opposite corner of the map, it's Nanami. Are we going to proxy something this time around? I mean, it is Protoss versus Protoss in the end, right? So you can definitely open up with a more macro-focused style. No low-ground expos or anything like that here for these two players. Only a handful of players really seem to be super comfortable playing that particular style in this matchup. But, of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to be super normal. Haas definitely has normalized his playstyle quite a bit, right? Remember those days back when... I want to say this was like 2017 when he made it to the finals against Serral, I believe, at the time. Or maybe it was 2018. It's been a while. But anyways, just crazy stuff all around. These days, he does play some more normal strategies. And, well, in that previous game, he didn't really do anything too wild. But he's still happy to bring it if he needs to. Well, we'll find out if he wants to here as we head into our side. This is, again, one of the maps which we are more familiar with. This still potential to be a bit wild on our side, and while we see it as this more normal macro map nowadays, it still has a gold base, right? It still has, you know, locations mm -hmm. that can be kind of funky. It still is this kind of map where you have to unlock the bottom side of it by mining out some minerals. So those are all questions we can kind of look on over the next little bit. As we just have our probes Yeah, the about. maps have actually changed quite a bit, right? Compared to like the last, I don't know, if you if you compare the maps that we have in 2024 to what we used to have in like 2022 or whatever, like we consider this to be a pretty normal map now, but this would have been a wild map. Like even just two, maybe three years ago, this would have been a pretty crazy one. The golden base and then that mineral wall you can mine out and the entire, well, bottom right and corner of the map is just not accessible at the moment. It's, it's kind of fun. It's been... Uh, yeah, really creating some dynamic games, I think, and just overall it makes the game more strategic, which is good. No, oh, absolutely. It's uh, going to be uh, fun to see all these new maps kind of looking uh, to be a little bit wilder and to kind of see what they get up to and what everything kind of becomes on them. Now, there's two Stalkers, there's two Stalkers here, and there's going to be a Stargate on the way from Nanami. You know, you're right, Loco. I was really excited about these sentries. We're not seeing them right now. <laughs> and we may just not see them at all in this first PvP of the day. No, they are a little bit uh, a little bit better, but they're still certainly quite fragile and expensive too, right? So margin for error is absolutely tiny. Usually being the aggressor in a game of StarCraft 2 just also feels a bit easier. So, yeah, I guess we have a little bit of a variation, though, as far as the strategies go. So Haas, once again, going into that Twilight Council, probably going to go into that Blink upgrade here momentarily, whereas Nanami is going to go into the Stargate. Yep, and that Stargate is going to be done in just a second, so we will have the option from that. Most likely an Oracle to start, and there it is, Oracle on the way out. So we get that on the go, we get this all beginning. And we look to see where we take things for the next little while, once we just have ourselves... Probe still scouting around. Stalk right in the middle is going to go Nami's way. He has three against two. That is obviously a good number. Only one probe lost so far this game as Haas makes his way to play. What about four versus three, Wardy? Well, believe it or not, when you change the number advantage to the side, <laughs> the other side gets the advantage. <laughs> Expert analysis. That's why we hire Wardy. Only the best of the best. Well, that's why they hire you to set me up for this expert analysis. Would not have seen it without your uh, pointer. <laughs> well, Mapu really set us up for it. He zoomed out and he saw those stalkers waiting on the high ground. Honestly, it's a team effort here. Beautiful stuff. Uh, the way this game works then is obviously Nanami wants to contain Hass a little bit. He wants to make him afraid of the Oracle and try and utilize that Oracle and its map control to gain benefits, which Hass is going to be able to overwhelm generally because of his blink. You can't Careful. lose the Oracle. Because that just undoes everything I'm talking about. If this Oracle is not a threat, then you can just go across the map with Blink. And there is nothing for Nanami to stop Hass in that situation. Because his Blink is a mile away. Twilight Council is still not even done. So we are so far away from that. Do you see this Oracle getting deflected back over the left side for the moment? Yeah, these Oracle's not achieving anything. There's one Stalker in the main base whose job it is right now to just shut down that one Oracle in the top right hand corner. 
There is one in the natural, I mean, but there's no probes. Yeah, it's a bit of a problem here for, or sorry, for Nanami, who's going to be under a lot of pressure in just a moment. Now, of course, that mineral wall has not been mined out yet, so Haas is going to have to use his blink cooldown just to get the stalkers in, and it does mean reinforcing this is all a little bit trickier, or I guess you could walk them around if he feels like that is the better approach. I mean, I, I figured we wanted to bring these units into the battle as quickly as possible, because the more time you give Nanami, the more it is going to, well, be more straightforward for him here to defend against it. There is one stasis ward to prevent a aggressive blink forward. That's nice and all. I think he's got enough here. Yep. Stasis wards just get played. Stop Haas from being aggressive, which is what Haas's advantage is right now, having that blink already. And uh, yeah, this is all Haas can really do, kind of come in a little bit. The problem is you want to kind of get on top of these units so all your stalkers fire at once. You kill without the battery getting a chance to heal. But you can't really get that one-shot factor with the stasis wards there because your opponent will just make you walk into them and then you get trapped and then you're in a lot of trouble. So that's why Nanami is, you know, what he's doing is very much so correct. Has is so committed to this, by the way. Work account is not yeah. there for him to play a longer game, so he is needing to do something very, very soon. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. He hasn't made a worker here in like a minute, so he is essentially putting himself all in or at the very least he needs to deal significant amounts of damage and so far he's done nothing of the kind i mean the nami is right now about 50 percent more economy compared to his opponent that just simply means that in the long run he's going to be able to get more stalkers yes the oracles they're not really achieving a whole lot yes the blink upgrade is much later but as long as Nanami just stays alive here and keeps warping in stalkers he should get the overwhelming numbers here eventually Oh, oh, that was that, cute, though. That was actually really good. <laughs> One stalker takes down the double stasis ward, and that is going to allow you to, at the very least, poke in just a little bit extra. And at the end of the day, though, it's, it still needs to be kind of game-winning damage with the fact you're not building any workers at all, and you're not doing anything. I mean, the stalkers of Nanami will continue to defend, and Haas has just walked himself into a corner that he can't seemingly get out of. And as he continues to fire at the front, it looks like Nanami is looking better and better here in this game number two. I think that game one told us to maybe not call anything too soon in this matchup, but I mean, <laughs> things really look good for Nanami because he's also going to double down with getting some damage. Those oracles hitting strong for a few workers as well. Yeah, 40 workers versus 21. I mean, Nanami is still adding on shield batteries too. I think maybe he should go for an additional gateway or two instead, but he just is more than happy to defend here. He knows that Haas is going to have to shove all in, and that's exactly what we are watching right now. He's not breaking through the front door. Just like that, Nanami manages to even up the score. Just like that, where one and one, Nanami is going to bring it to you a third game. So we're already getting a third game. You know it's been a, a thing in the past where sometimes on day one we have a lot of the two zeros and stuff, but mm -hmm. Nanami showing us that this PvP very much so is competitive. I think we saw that in game one when Nanami honestly had edges and just kind of, you know, let it slip a little bit as well. So we will uh, see how this all continues as we get more action coming in just a few moments. Get this ready to go once again. Yeah, absolutely. Both players ready to just jump into the lobby immediately and yeah. looks like our final game for this series is going to be on golden aura yeah golden aura to wrap it up a map where we actually uh maybe see some interesting stuff i mean potential for a longer game even because again it's this bigger map all the map uh, all the bases are up a ramp as well so attacking in is always going to have that little bit of a difficulty attached to it of course it's pvp so there's a lot of ways in which the map jump ends early anyway but there's definitely some potential here for this game to maybe show us. I mean, I say longer. The first game was 70 minutes. It's just we never got off of mm -hmm. two bases until a proxy nexus at the very end. So we'll see how this goes. Game number three is readying up. Everyone is getting into this lobby. Go, goes. Readies are called. And it is Gold Nora to try and close out our second matchup of the day. It's actually so funny, though, because it was indeed like a 17-minute long game, but we only had two expansions, or I guess two yeah. bases for both players each. And then ultimately, the Nami took one more expansion there, but it was basically just an extended two base all in from both players. Normally, when you think of like a 17-minute game of StarCraft 2, it means that it was an epic macro game where maybe both players managed to go up to like at least five base, but not in this Protoss versus Protoss so far. All right, let's hop in game as we have ourselves down in the bottom right side this time around. It is going to be the Blue Protoss player from Mystery Gaming. It is Nanami. And his opponent in the top left-hand corner of Golden Aura, the man with a very cheesy reputation. We're looking at none other than Haas. Yeah. Almost forcing himself all in there in that previous game, right? Just not making any workers. 
You figured he just simply had the superior stalker numbers there, but I mean, shield batteries are pretty good, man. When you, when you have blink or not, I mean, you still have to ultimately kill your opponent's stalkers there, and he couldn't really get it done. Not get it done. I really feel as though uh, that's kind of been the problem for Haas, because he kind of in game one got a bunch of stalkers, felt like mm -hmm. he had a chance, couldn't get it done. And you feel like game two, he just didn't really get much of a chance at all, but let's see how this round uh, three goes. Can Haas bring it back, get a win. Of course, the way this format works, just a reminder, is Swiss. So essentially triple elimination. You lose three series and you're out. So day one's not the end of the world. Very likely your round two matchup. If you're an upset in day one, round two, it's like, okay, we'll actually probably have a matchup you can win against just someone else that lost out on day one. But man, it's just nice to get that first win and start progressing yourself forwards and closer to that playoff position. Because three wins and you're through to those playoffs. So it doesn't take a lot. Have a couple good matchups. Mm -hmm. Uh, very nice. You're absolutely right. Hass has decided to plant his second pylon right now in the middle of the map. Doesn't necessarily mean cheese in this particular matchup. It just, well, makes the game a little bit more confusing for your opponent, because what are the odds you're really going to be found there? But we'll have to see exactly what Hass does with that in just a moment. Cybercores, though, are finishing up, and, well, there's no unit even remotely close to that proxy pylon to really put down anything too aggressive. Nope. Nothing, there's the third. Uh, too wild. Yeah, let's have ourselves waiting for the uh, waiting for the tech, waiting for the gates. There it is, tech from Nanami. Twilight Council straight away, so he's gonna go for that fast Twilight Council. Obviously in base this time. That's with that panel on the map, but nothing nearby to build off of it. His tech's gonna go down the main base as well. It's gonna be Twilight on Twilight action. This time we're gonna play something a little bit closer to a mirror from the very get go. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm fully expecting both players here to go into that good old Blink Stalker control. And we have been seeing that in game number one and two of this series, but the ways they got there were certainly very different. Scouting probe moving on over towards the bottom left and corner of the map too. I mean, I call it a scouting probe, but there are some juicy golden minerals down here. There are indeed. And a little the crap beetle too. The crap beetle got in these golden minerals. It does genuinely feel like Hass is about to drop this down. So yep. this is going to be a, a question of kind of playing all over and a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit hectically once again, I imagine. So we'll see how this uh, pans over the next few minutes. Obviously, that uh, bottom left base coming online, just something you have to figure out as an army and then decide, do I want to be aggressive against this? How aggressive am I going to be? I think he's set up decently. Like, yes, they both have blink at the same time, but that faster third gateway really does set you up to kind of get across and to go fight. Well, he is checking the Watchtower right now. Or sorry, Haas here is checking the Watchtower right now. Nanami, he passed by his location on the map. He decides to go for a proxy pylon. So even though he doesn't really know exactly what he's going up against, it is still very handy. We also have a proxy gate, by the way, going down right now with that second pylon that Haas put down in the middle of the map. He's also walled himself in fully at home. So oh, we have a proxy gate going down for Nanami. It's funny because neither player really realizes what the opponent is going for here. And the question is, who does this really favor, Wardy? Who does this really favor? I mean, I honestly, I think I love this for Nanami. No, I mean, Pass is just yeah. going to be having a Nexus that's not really going to have a lot of use. But Nanami has to strike quickly because if that gold base gets a recall to it and then the probes start mining there, well, then Haas will benefit from more economy. Then he will have a chance to kind of build a few more stalkers, perhaps, or edge his opponent out. I just feel like Nanami should, in theory, have enough stalkers right away to make something happen. It's really about finding that gold base, because if he finds that gold, he can do a lot. If not, he's attempting to push into a one base situation. Well, that's very defendable for Haas, so information is key. I mean, Nanami knows, so really it's kind of up to him to make the moves. I'm kind of surprised he does go across the map, actually. Yeah, he actually just used his blink as well to get into this fight as quickly as possible, so it wasn't cool down there at the very beginning. Now he finds out about this nexus in the bottom left and corner, though, and do you just completely switch? Do you only send your reinforcements in that direction? I think you have to address it. There's two stalkers. Okay, well, I think you guys should go after the probes. Yeah. There we go. He does indeed retarget them, because losing these workers is incredibly painful. Now Hass is going to have to send everything he's got towards the bottom left and corner of the map, too, if he wants to keep it all alive. Nice usage of the line of sight blockers there as well, which is going to give Nanami a pretty big advantage. Hass's reinforcements showing up, though, and those reinforcements are going to make the difference for now. And Nanami has to back away. And a chaotic uh, couple of moments here in this game as both players go one way, then the other. And like I said, I think just in general, I would have liked Nanami to hit the bottom left harder to start off with. Because I feel like running up to the top just kind of invited Hass to have his units there. And 
Now we're seeing this weird fight where Hass is going to be finding units all over the place. He's getting his reinforcements there because he's still getting units <laughs> off that gateway as well. And it's just a stalk of fight. But Nanami is losing this fight. And that means Hass will defend the bottom left and he's just up the base in general. GG is called because why wouldn't it end in a ridiculous way after the entire thing that we've seen so far? It's funny when you try to like out micro your opponent and then ultimately you find that you're being out microed by your opponent and you just have like a scramble of different colored stalkers all over each other. Well, ultimately right there has managed to get the better of his opponent, but <sighs> that wasn't a clean series for him by any stretch of the imagination. No, uh, clean was definitely not the, uh, the word for that, I would say. So uh, <laughs> can agree with you on that one as we will... Uh... Call it, call it what it is, though. That is going to be our match, and that is going to be a chance for us to uh, head on into another matchup. So the PvP is down, a couple of matchups done. Uh, we don't have an updated schedule in terms of scores on it, just because of a slight graphic issue for this Asia region and day. But just to show you what's coming up, Max Head versus Coffee and Cyan versus Silky are both still to come. So we've got TVP and PVZ. Honestly, some fun matches here for the Asia region. So we're going to be diving into those in just a handful of moments. So guys, do not go too far. We're just going to be heading to a quick break. When we come back, it's going to be Max Head versus Coffee. A very fun matchup. That PVT should be great. So we'll see you guys in just a few.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back once again as we have more StarCraft action coming your way. Max said and Coffee coming up. Max said and Coffee both Chinese players that have been around for a very long time. It's been exciting to see them kind of just still be around in the scene. But, um, you know, Max said used to be kind of the stronger player. More recently, Coffee has been the stronger player with some better results. So I think this is probably going to be a very fun, um, very fun series. Genuinely expect Max said and Coffee to kind of put on a bit of a show, a PVT in the first round that I feel I could go honestly any which way on any given day. No, you're absolutely right. These two, uh, they must have been competing against each other for pretty much a decade now, right? Like it's kind yeah. of wild how how long StarCraft has been around for at this point. We've seen some of these players play against each other so frequently, and this is one of those matchups that we probably did cast back in like. 2013 or so. I'm wondering when the first time is they faced against each other, but yeah. They know each other inside and out. They must also play, for example, ladder games, maybe even custom games against each other too, just for practice sake. So there's a good chance that these two know exactly what the opponent is capable of, but should be an interesting one. So Mexit apparently checking his account real quick. He should get into this series very soon as well. Yeah, they actually, Max said all times 17 to 11 against Coffee. 47 to 41 in maps. It's a pretty close history. Map score, hmm. especially, it's very close. Um, I just feel like, again, lately, Coffee has maybe been my favorite player who's, you know, in this matchup where Max said kind of felt as though he stepped down a bit, whereas Coffee stepped up. Coffee had some good results even offline last year in a couple of events as well. So definitely kind of, you know, coming in with some surprises. This looks as though Max said has arrived. So we are pretty much good to mm -hmm. go. We're going to be heading on into Oceanborn for map number one of this best of three TVP. And uh, looking to see how this is going. A matchup which has been the talk of the town as of late because everyone wants to see Protoss doing better. And we're wondering if that new patch has helped them out in that regard. So just saying that I thought they have been playing against each other in competitive series for about a decade. Apparently the first time they played was back in 2014. So it's, it's been literally that long. Actually a decade. Insane. Yeah, love actually it. a decade. I love it when the decade is... Like, nowadays in StarCraft 2, if you just throw out 10 years, it's actually probably fairly correct a lot of the time. It's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of crazy how long we've been uh, sticking around on this one. All right, well, in the bottom right-hand corner, he is going to be the Blue Terran player with Mystery Gaming as the team logo. It is Coffee. And his opponent in the top left, playing with the Protoss pieces, it's Maxed. Alrighty, already cheeky SCV moving out onto the map. We're going to be proxying our very first barracks at 200 minerals. Bit of a classic. <laughs> you know, I don't understand this if this is one of the new maps, but this is the map they've been playing on for a few months no. already. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. A little bit of a mistimed uh, SCV there, of course. That should have been a little bit neater as that rack sets up on the left side. The refinery coming on the line, getting the gas coming through on the side of Max said. And it's double gas from coffee, so he's really going to just make sure he gets a bit of aggression going off of that proxy. We'll see how aggressive he goes. I mean, there's some crazy world where he proxies a factory as well. Uh, I think hmm. nine times out of ten, though, this should just be a Reaper and then playing from there. Yeah, absolutely. I'm expecting this is going to be a good old Reaper opener just to get it across the map. Main downside of that is that you have to build that add-on on your factory by, well, the factory itself, right? Usually the barracks is going to be making that flight back instead. Just a Reaper for the time being, and the SCV is gonna now, uh, it's gonna now be used for scouting. So at this point, Maxed hasn't seen too much. He's gonna scout the back of his natural expansion just to see if there's anything super aggressive coming, uh, aggressive coming from that angle. Well, now he finds an SCV building a pesky little bunker that'll give him all the information he really needs. Yeah, but no expansion from from Max Hedwig. That's obviously a much easier defense, right? I mean, obviously not great that you don't have the expansion up, but. Uh... Yeah, I mean, he's floating the minerals, so he kind of wants to go out and expand shortly. But that bunker block is going to cause some troubles. We have the Zealot here, which is going to force the SCV away. And by doing that, we just give ourselves a chance to swipe this bunker down. Now the Reaper's on the Zealot. The SCV gets back to building the bunker. And this is where things will get even more intriguing. Yeah, he actually prioritized warp gates right here over the Stalker. So the Stalker is going to be coming here eventually, but it's going to be a while. That means that even the Zealot may be in some trouble. It looks like it's going to fall. Gonna die. And the yeah. bunker finishes. Yep. That's actually pretty bad wow. for Max said, man, losing the Zealot bunk again to finish up here right from the very start of this game. We have a little bit of a high impact play as Stalker chases the Reaper down to the low ground. The Reaper just about gets down there, gets into the bunker, 
now the command center starting up back at home from coffee as he gets ready for his next stage of this game. Max had still 400 minerals banked up. It's difficult to spend your yeah. minerals early as a wow. Protoss player. Now he has to drop gateways. You might just have to transition this into a full-on committed one base all in. Three extra gates, four gate robo. Yeah, I guess this is now one base all in, Loco. Yeah. Coffee also a little indecisive, by the way. I believe he queued up a Cyclone, canceled the Cyclone, queued up a Widowmine, canceled the Widowmine, and then ultimately decided to go for the Reactor on the Factory. He just needs to make units, and he just scouted it, right? Like, he sees that the additional minerals from his opponent have just been dropped on a bunch of gateways. So at that point, as Terran, really, your only focus is going to be to, well, I guess to delay this attack, right? And then ultimately to defend it. Delaying it is part of the defense. Having that second command center, though, especially when you morph it into an orbital command, is going to be massive. Just getting those yeah. mules up, massive economy boost. Yeah, and as well, you don't even have to be that kind of aggressive in expansion. You know your opponent's expansion isn't down, so you don't have to move down there immediately yourself. If your opponent gets aggressive, you can play the one base <laughs> defense right now and just be fine, as this SCV is still good to repair the bunker up. And uh, it's going to be a Widowmine drop to start us off as well, by the way. So Widowmine's across the map to try and force Max to be absolutely guaranteed all in. Yeah, he was already all in, but now we're going to all in the all in. Maybe a couple Cyclones on the back of this, though, would not be a terrible choice. Okay, we're going to go into the tech lab instead. That does mean, though, that he won't actually have that many units available. Plus, on top of that, the Medivac is flying in the direction of where no, these stalkers are no. right now. This, no. <laughs> what, 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 what just happened, Wardy? What just... What just... Did we just... Okay. They're both like, you know what? I respect your game plan. Have at it. <laughs> Take your best shot at me. <laughs> that was pretty much a donation. I mean, it would have still been micro, but we just sort of passed each other in the middle of the map. Those units not on attack move. What is on attack move now is all of oh those units now burrowing into the mineral line. Okay, what well, was already an all-in is now certainly an all-in. Lots of SCVs falling at home as well. Viking, very uh, brave, decided to land on the ground. Siege tank is eventually going to pop, but... Uh, he just doesn't have any units right now. I just love that the Widow Mines just go for maximum damage. <laughs> like, yes. They could Luckily, not... they got nerfed out. Yeah. <laughs> they could not really have done much more. The Siege Tank repair <gasps> is not good enough, which means that the Stalkers do get that kill. Coffee's down to only four SCVs, and none of them are mining, whereas Maxed is on 11, and he is mining, so it does generally trend towards Maxed's favor here. You can just macro with this prism as well. Obviously, Stalkers are very difficult to kill in this situation, and as you can see, they get even more SCVs. There's one SCV left in this game right now for coffee. That is really not a good sign. No, mules are pretty good, but it is certainly a little bit messy here, to say the least. I still can't get over the fact that they passed each other's strategy in the middle of the map, and they just sort of waved at each other, you know? The prism right there waved at, at the medevac. They respected the decision-making. Unbelievable as a Viking may have to be enough to push this prison back. Wouldn't mind trying to get involved as well as Medivac will go down though. And the prison is also going to go down. Two stalks inside. Coffee actually has an army supply advantage right now. Reaper's fast enough to get rid of one more stalker. And we actually still have a little bit of an opportunity here to maybe go across and to get something done. As wild as that may seem, Coffee is not completely dead. He does have double CC. He does have double mule. And for now, that's going to hold him upright. Yeah, those mules just return so much money, right? So in a weird way, despite being behind in the worker count, Coffee's eco is not that bad. Maxet decides to now follow this up. He's been kind of wasting out lots of probes, but he decides to follow this up here with a dark shrine of his own. So he's been really building all of that economy that's been lost. I guess he just simply didn't see the medevac at all. Even though he had, like, complete vision yeah. of it, technically speaking, he just did not notice it whatsoever. Like, the, the, no reaction is... It's, yeah, it's unfortunate right there for him, because if he had just... <laughs> if he would have lost slightly fewer workers, you know, this game would have been so much more manageable here for Mexent. Wow, oh, this is the one SCV rebuild that Coffee is on it. It's, it's looking legitimate, man. I mean, he's got yeah. double orbital as well, so if he stops muling, DTs are not actually that much of a problem. The problem is you kind of want to mule. Um, but yeah, with double orbital, you can actually rebuild those SCVs fairly swiftly too, so that's a benefit. And again, Max heads on one base, so you don't have to do anything too crazy here as Coffee. Sit back, relax. Now Max head starts to expand, but even then, I feel like there's a little while until Coffee has to really worry about anything. Absolutely. As long as he saves up enough energy for a scan, he should be fine. But this is one of those scenarios where you're really trying to min-max your 
command center, right? Like when you're reduced to literally a single worker, life does become a little bit more threatening, but it looks like he saved up enough energy on that right side orbital command. And on top of that, he also just now found the prism here. Yep. Oh, there's an invisible man. And he's gonna be able to shut that down pretty easily, as long as he gets the scan and the units on top of it. Yep, there's gonna be a shutdown as uh, this is looking clean so far. Depot is down, so this GT is invited in. Uh, oh, no, 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 don't walk into the scan! Okay. Not good. That could we have are. actually also just been a sacrifice right there on that one. But. Yeah, we're gonna get the NG in a second to clean this DT up, and then we are good to go again. That DT will go down, and Maxad still does not have very much army supply, but he, he has workers just. He needs to transition that into some army at some point in time. These Reapers are going to come through. They are going to look for some action. And they're just going to run into these Stalkers. Not much to find there apart from the confirmation of the expansion. It looks as though Coffee's like, okay, I feel like I can go. His Raven's about to pop, so he will have permanent detection available, which means you don't have to worry so much about the DTs anymore. Coffee actually doesn't necessarily need to be all too aggressive, as we do have the Widowmine drop, by the way, in the top left -hand corner here. Once more, dealing a lot of damage. Ah, that's unfortunate. He's been hard at work trying to bring that worker count back. Now Coffee, though, even though he could sit back, decides that he wants to move across the map a little bit. He sees the Stalkers going around the site, and he does indeed march back up towards that high ground. Kind of funny that after nine minutes now, it looks like both players are just basically securing their natural. <laughs> We've had a bit of an exchange in the first... I mean, we could have been at minute two and a half at this point in time, right? But... We've had a bit of an exchange here for the uh, remainder of those seven minutes that are, well, I guess, left in this match. Wow, well, his uh, stalkers actually live, and that would have been hits into the assimilator in the end, so it doesn't hit anything. As uh, we're retargeting probes, that's not ideal. Is that the wood of mine? It's going to keep on retargeting forever. <laughs> he just wants to show off the change to that unit, you know? That's very, very convenient. In case you hadn't seen the wood of mine change yet, that line is much easier to follow right there. Much easier to follow compared to in the past. No, oh, that is uh, absolutely a factor as a few more Stalkers wander down to the low ground. A few more of those Stalkers join up. The Banshee Marines all coming about. And we get ourselves the... Well, yeah, I, honestly, I feel as though this is an army that goes and pushes his coffee, but his army supply advantage has yeah. disappeared from before, so... Maybe that moment really is. This is one a difficult game to read, right? So, like, how do you exactly decide if it is a good moment to push? Because he literally got reduced to just single digits worth of workers, and... Uh, he, he sees a bunch of Blink Stalkers going around the map. It's scary to commit right now. Like, we have all the info here, but I can't imagine for Coffee. This is kind of a sketchy game. Oh, first tank shot is good. Yeah, it's hard because obviously he feels like he went down to absolutely nothing. So you don't know how much your opponent has. So you're right. It's That's why the decision wasn't made earlier to go and push. In a lot of other situations, you're well-versed, you're well-practiced. You know what the read is. But knowing what the read is here is extremely difficult because it's just not something you've usually practiced. And that's definitely having an impact as... Now, uh, Banshee production continues, though, and the more Banshees and tanks, I mean, the more just high-value power units there are, the more it feels like we are still set up to just send it, but now Max Ed is going to have tech online. He's already got Blink, of course, charges on the way. This gets better for Max Ed in terms of a larger fight the longer that we go in this. Mm, Stalker's trying to see if they can pick off whatever they can here as the Terran is going for a bit of a push. Additional gateways are coming. It does get one of the siege tanks. Charge is about, well, 80% or so of the way done, so it should be done in time for this attack. In the meantime, we do have a Banshee here. We're going to town to the natural, just being a bit of a nuisance. Mexa trying to delay this attack in whatever way possible, because he knows it's going to be very difficult to hold. Yep. Just trying to slow it down. I mean, that's absolutely the right, the right idea, right? Just don't let this take a straight-up fight. Don't let it get set up. That's what you're trying to avoid. The problem is trying to avoid that it ain't going to be easy. And uh, the army is very slowly getting across the map and is going to be set up very soon. Yeah, now charge is finished though, and charge slots are very scary. Although, well, not if we're going to be sending them in like that. We do have the Raven dropping down a bunch of auto turrets as well. Not to be underestimated, a couple of stalkers decide to hug the siege tanks. They will be able to kill two? No, oh. just one. And that oh, means right. that that Nexus is pretty much toast, right? I mean, yeah. unless he wants to jump on this with the rest of his army. Uh, you well, know what? Maybe he's got barely enough. It's just that he, he can't really kill it all. Yeah. Yeah, the Banshee, it's just the, the high damage output, right? All these units hit and they hit hard. And, that, and that's the issue, realistically. The tanks hit hard, the Banshees hit hard. So you dive in, you get a unit, but by then everything else is already gone for you. And you're going to see those Banshees especially are just swinging away. A couple of Zelts can't stick around long enough, and we are just going to continue to push forward right now. The Banshees are going after Stalkers, which force more Stalkers to warp in. But I think overall, Stalkers are perhaps the weaker unit over just Zelts to clean this up. But yeah, you kind of have to build the Stalkers, otherwise the Banshees will just go uncontested. 
And these are all kind of the problems that we're <laughs> facing. The Marines fight the Zealots, the Stalkers are going to lose to the Tanks and the Banshees. GG is called, and Coffee is going to get himself the win here in the end to open up game number one for himself in his opening best of three of this event. That was pretty nuts, though. The fact that we had Coffee essentially, I think he had like literally one SCV, didn't he? Yeah, no, he was at one SCV at one point in this game. <laughs> yeah, and he actually managed to win that game. Rarely do we see Terra players win when they go down to a single worker. Oh, that unfortunate moment when all of those units passed each other in the middle of the map and well, then the Widowmine drop still managed to deal with that much damage when he probably, Max said that is, he could have probably killed the Medivac there with all mines inside of it. This game would have looked very different, That it probably would have been over about eight minutes earlier, but ultimately, uh, yeah, Coffee managed to get it done there, but very scrappy games we've seen so far today. Yep, super scrappy, super messy. We got ourselves ready now for this game number two. And so we had to swim for Max to join the lobby and to see if he can bounce back in the tiny sub one to one. Asia's really doing what Asia does best, which is kind of scrappy and messy and like not the craziest strategies in the world, like you might see like from North America. But the games mm -hmm. become crazy in themselves. Like the way it actually plays out becomes like a bit wacky. I feel like that's what Asia is becoming known for. And yeah, the games so far today, like you say, have been exactly that. That PvP definitely were. I mean, even the first TVZ, it was fast, but it was fast because it was wacky because the Zerg was like, I'm going to drone against the Hellbats. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been wacky all day. It's actually kind of fun how all the three regions in StarCraft 2 play the game very differently, right? I think a lot of the a lot of the players look at themselves and like, no, 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 this is the way that the game is supposed to be played. And this is how every other region should do it as well. Maybe a little bit more so from the European guys than the others, but it's funny to see how every region does approach the game a little bit differently. And I, I guess it, it depends on who you're competing against most of the time, right? In your practice games as well. We just see these crazy decisions being made all of the time and it... Yeah, it really does change the way that the game is uh, is played everywhere now. So far, this uh, this region has been delivering. I'm going to be going into game number two on Crimson Court, a map we haven't seen yet today. Nope, this is a map we have not seen yet today. This is personally one of my favorites, actually, out of the new maps. I think it's very fun without being overly crazy, and, like, it is innovative. You yeah. see so many different expansion patterns on this map. I've really been loving this map. Uh, like I say, for me, definitely my favorite out of the new ones, or one of my favorites. There's like, honestly a couple of maps in the new ones. As we have at the top right-hand side, the Blue Terran player from 1SCV to 1-0 on the board. Our Blue Terran from Mystery Gaming is Coffee. And his opponent all the way in the opposite corner of the Crimson Court. He is Maxed. So in case you haven't seen this map just yet, there's uh, once again an SCV moving across it, so at least we're gonna be able to see a little bit of it, but essentially the entire bottom right -hand corner of the map, as well as the top left-hand corner at this point in time, is not accessible. You have to either mine out those mineral fields that Mapu is highlighting or destroy the rocks. And because of that, it creates a very dynamic expansion pattern. There's also that forward base that you can quite easily take that we've seen a lot of players experiment with. This has been taken even as like a third base, for example, and you can make use of that rich Vespian geyser. And it creates a lot of very dynamic situations, right? Every game on this map so far has looked very different. Uh, and this is... Just want to mention as well, these maps are being played on the ESL versions today, everybody. So what that means is mm -hmm. there's actually less rocks on Crimson Court. So there's usually two sets of oh, they've been reduced in HP a little bit. Yeah. Oh, no, so, there's usually four of them, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. So you usually have to kill four rocks to move through. Now you just got to kill a couple. That does open up those corners of the map a bit more hmm. easily, but obviously more so from the center of the map. It's not going to really change the gold mineral entrances, which are nearer to the bases in the more common way that the expander goes to, but maybe easier to aggress onto those directions if your opponent has already expanded there. Something to watch out for, because it is a little bit different to, like I say, what you might have been seeing in recent events or also just playing on the ladder yourself. Yeah, these maps are still very new, so we're constantly checking if there are any adjustments that need to be made, and I agree. Those rocks, they, uh, they were nice, but it did take you a long while to knock them down to the point where usually we would just see players only really knock them down when they're being aggressive and they have a little bit of time that they just need to sit back. Usually in order to expand, we do see those minerals being mined out, but maybe that opens up another another way of doing it. As we do have that proxy reaper now being a nuisance once again, Coffee is going to go for two. So let's see. Well, already getting two workers is not bad. Getting not a third. Three. Yeah, this is really good. Stalker pops and the reaper is... I was going to say long gone, Safe. but he actually just survives. 
But he gets back to the bunker, so yeah, he is indeed alive, and he will sit here and just be annoying. That forces a battery, and that's more investment being made right now than what you really want to be making as the Protoss player. So, yeah, but this Reaper comes through. Good grenade, but doesn't quite get enough onto the probe to get the kill. Ooh. We'll hop into the Nexus, as, uh, into the bunker as well, and we just keep swinging at the Nexus. I actually would have liked him to Cyclone hit the Cyclone of Beckett as well, by the way. Cyclone, another unit that did get a couple of uh, relatively minor adjustments, I guess, all things considered. But Coffee could decide to send it across too if he, well, assumes that this fight is going to go on for a little bit longer. Jimmy has also decided that he wants to sit in a bunker too. Actually, kind of a big deal though, because genuinely, Ooh. as yeah, good grenades to allow this Marine in. Beautiful. Genuinely makes a big difference in DPS available. Now the battery runs out of energy much sooner. And one more stalker shows up. SCV will repair what it can. We pop back out. There's a super battery force. I mean, this is all the benefit of just getting an extra unit or so in there. We will turn and finish off the bunker. I like that. It means that the money is lost rather than being regained. Because now the cyclone's like, oh, cool. I can get a kill or two. He locks onto a stalker, but doesn't stick about it. No, it's very difficult to commit against three stalkers in particular. you got to be so careful. In the meantime, though, we do have those reapers swinging around the back once again. They would like to see exactly what the follow-up is going to be, but he did not quite get vision right there of that robo facility. Nope, didn't quite get the scout he might have been looking for. And as our robot comes up, Pylon, Stalker production continues to build in. Our barracks and tech lab continue to come on the side of coffee. And we just have still those couple of Reapers out in the center, just waiting and chilling to see what their next move may be. Okay, so ultimately coffee is going to be able to expand here on the low ground as well. Rather than going for a Widow Mine drop, though, even though they were very successful in that previous game, twice in a row that we see well, a lot of Widow Mines dealing a lot of damage to that mineral line of Mexit. This time around, we're going to try and attempt the same thing, but with the Cyclone. Obviously, that's not going to allow him nearly as quick of a kill on the mineral line, but there's still... There still needs to be some respect for those units, right? You can't just move across the map with the Stalkers and just sort of ignore those Cyclones. They do a lot of damage. They have a little bit more HP now, too. So let's see. Yep, they're going to drop in here and going to go for a couple of probes. And now, obviously, they don't have that lock on, so it's a bit harder to fight. Lift back in. Probes going down to the Reapers as well. Man, Coffee has put on a masterclass of how to be annoying against workers. He is all over the place. These Reapers hop to the high ground and are somehow still going to be alive for a couple more moments as an immortal of the Stalkers. <laughs> They'll get cleaned up, but again, the damage just keeps on adding together, and it means that Coffee is keeping himself in a great economic position, putting himself in a great spot altogether. Eight probes, by the way, in total so far in this game. That is very substantial. Eight workers killed at this stage when really Coffee hasn't committed to anything too crazy, right? I mean, obviously, he's been aggressive. He planted his stuff on the other side of the map, and he went for a proxy, but this is all... As far as, like, the, the modern uh, day StarCraft 2 goes, been relatively conservative play from Coffee, albeit more on the aggressive end of things. Getting eight probes there with a non-Widow Mine-based opener is really, really good for him. He's going to be able to continue macroing up, and now he's going to go into the plus one. He's going to go into the stim pack. We'll probably see combat shields fired up here in just a moment. When those upgrades are done, he can continue pushing once more. Yep. Absolutely, as we just have ourselves the Colossus production coming through the extended thermal lands. Max Head wants to go into that tech. That's what Coffee wants to disrupt with that bioforce, right? When he gets those upgrades, he wants to come across the map. He wants to try and make it difficult for the opponent to really be able to be like, oh yeah, here I am. I'm going to go and, you know, have my splash damage. He wants to kill off a Colossus early if he can. So we'll see what uh, will happen with that as this STV will go down. Absolutely. So he does decide, by the way, Mexit, that is, to just go for the triangular third base and not messing around with any of those mineral fields that he could be mining at this point to try and expand. I guess the easiest way to describe it would be vertically. If you look at the minimap, he decides to go for the triangle expansion instead. And yeah, those Colossi are going to be absolutely pivotal. Coffee is just about to hit a very significant power spike. Stimpak is already done, and soon those Marines are also going to find themselves with a combat shield as well as plus one additional damage. There is an Observer chasing this around, though, and we are about maybe a half minute or so away from all of that finishing up. Yeah, we're going to load up the drop after we kill the OBS, which I do like. He's going to get around the edge here, maybe getting towards the main base, which is cute. But the tanks are siege there. I don't think you can move forward, as Max said, into that. So he's going to back away afraid. But now the drop in the main is going to, at the very least, force a warp in here. There's no warp in available, and this could be really bad as a Colossus pops. Great timing on that. Going to get a few probes, but with the Colossus, it's very difficult for these Marines to not just jump back in the meta back, but they run away from the Colossus nicely. And by running away, they're able to go for nine probes before they live to get out alive. <laughs> the Viking shows up. My goodness, it's not a fun day to be a probe. You called it a masterclass at being annoying earlier. I mean, he's continuing the class. 
You, you thought the, the session was over? No, we are already up to 21 workers killed right now, which is insane. The slow push continues too. It looks like there's an hallucinated phoenix trying to be annoying at the very least. That one did not quite set off those widow mines right here. Yeah, this is going from bad to worse here for Mexit. The only thing he really does have here are those, well, soon to be three colossi. So it's quite difficult for Terran to just push in here, especially with a mostly marine based army. But he can continue, of course, dropping in the main base. And here we go. Once again, Metavex are unloading. Second Colossus is available. We have one Marauder in the mix. I mean, those Colossi, oh my god, they have to walk all the way around awkwardly around those gateways, and the Marines are just going to pile on the pressure. And Kof is just getting so much done. I, I was kind of with you. I thought this is mostly Marines, but the two Marauders helped a little bit to get rid of that first Colossus, and then, you know, you just run back, you get rid of a couple of pylons now, Max and Supply Blocks. He runs into this central position, but he runs into a couple of Mines in Dune, so now he's getting dropped and surrounded a little bit. The units from the low ground will come up here. I mean, just keeping that uh, Colossus busy meant the low ground force was able to do so much better. But Mines connecting in, a couple more of these Zealots will drop as well. And uh, I've got to say that this is not looking good at all for Maxed, as it looks as though Coffee is going to break through. He's got a couple units still chasing the Colossus. That might be <laughs> just a step too far, and we do have to back it up, but the damage being done is incredible. And Coffee is definitely cementing himself in a lead here for this second game. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of those games that feels amazing too, right? When you're playing Terran, because you're just kind of cruising. He's been in the commanding position of this game the entire match long so far. This is not over yet, so it's not like he's got a clear path to victory, but everything's been working out really well for him. The only thing I guess that hasn't worked out so well is that that third Nexus is still alive and those Colossi have been absolutely pivotal. But at this point, there's really, yeah, just one Colossus and four Stalkers available for the Protoss player. Coffee is going to go into the plus one infantry armor too. Looks like he is not quite going to attack with it. Instead, we're going to bring some Widow Mines to the party. They were effective in game number one of this series. Let's see if we can also make them work here in the second game. No vision yet here, no response yet by Mexet. Okay, it looks like he is going to be able to pull the probes. Closest in time. Hopefully he realizes that there's one mine that didn't fire still, because if he didn't, he could send all the probes back. Uh, okay. That could have been be, so bad. Yeah, still a couple, but yeah, if he'd send all the probes to like an upper mineral line, he could have lost everything. So he gets a little fortunate to only lose a couple extra. And Coffee just maintaining the lead that he's created for himself. I mean, he's up the 1-1 one -one upgrades. Maxed hasn't even really had a chance to build forges, you know? Like, he's not had any chance to start yeah. up his own upgrades or anything along those lines, so that is a huge deal. Yeah, this is um, not looking pretty at all, if you're Maxed. Absolutely not, but it's also not one of those scenarios where you really want to tap out yet, right? It's just that everything's been going pretty rough for you the entire first 10 minutes of the game, but he's still alive here. So we do have a transition as well from the Terran into Ghost. I think that's a excellent choice just for EMPs, of course. That is a fantastic tool to soften up that Protoss army. Well, I guess getting a probe and a Stalker is also not bad. And he's going to be able to hang this Medivac in the corner. Coffee ready to go for a bit of a push. Now it's a lot more of a Marauder-heavy force, too. There is no Storm yet, though, here for Mexed. He probably wants to research it, but it's so expensive and he doesn't really have the gas. So I'm assuming we're just going to morph them into Archons instead. Yeah, a couple of Archons coming on by. I mean, credit to Max, uh, Max said, because obviously in that first game, he had yeah. a, a lot of trouble, right? Where the Widow Mines went unnoticed and all sorts. But this time, he's doing a little bit better in terms of just kind of stopping that from being more of a factor as these couple of mines will drop off. The probe's going to get chased about. Kaboom, kaboom. And this is actually going to work nicely as the probes could not split away properly there. So in this case, Widow Mines do continue yeah, yeah, to do yeah, well. Yeah. And now they're all over the place. And just as I'm complimenting Max said on handling this and improving from game one, he's continuing <laughs> to have issues. Yeah, I guess saving grace for him here is that those Widow Mines deal slightly less splash damage than they once used to. So I guess uh, in the previous patch, he would have lost even more workers, but the grand total is all the way up to 39 probes. And that is just simply too many to lose. There's also not really an opportunity here for the Protoss to push in, but I, I agree with Mexed. I don't think he really has much of a choice. All of the setup here is looking really good for Coffee, but there's still certainly a chance that Terran can, for example, miss micro this, that the EMPs don't land, or that the Colossi just get better hits than expected, but that is an excellent EMP to start. Yup, couple EMPs, the Vikings are going freely against the Colossi now. A couple of Archons try to come over, but they're going to melt because of the EMPs out on them. There's just no splash damage realistically in play. The Zelda are doing their part, but the oh. Vikings will land on the Stalkers, and Coffee will end up taking a massive fight in his favor. GG, GG, says Max said, and Coffee gets the 2-0. Uh, kind of 
introed with this, but kind of was thinking Coffee's maybe the stronger player as of late in this matchup, and he definitely showed it in this one. I mean, a bit of a wacky first game, like the adjustment from Max had after the opening, but Coffee brought himself back from one worker there, and he just bullied his opponent into submission here in this game number two. Yeah, game number two, I mean, he was in control from start to finish. That is one of those games that you just... That's why you play Terran for, you know? Like, if you're, if you're queuing good. up for a letter game, that's the kind of game that you envision you're going to play the entire day long. I mean, started with the Proxy Reaper, and basically for the next 12 minutes, he just kept slapping his opponent around, dealing a lot of damage, and just, yeah, slowly but surely whittling him down. Honestly, really well played right there. Well, awesome stuff. We are going to take a couple of moments. When we come back, we have even more StarCraft 2 lined up. One more match from Asia as Cyan takes on Silky in a PvZ. Uh, Silky can be a very aggressive and cheeky Zerks. Maybe come into this one expecting a little bit of wackiness. We'll be heading into that in just a few moments as mentioned, so we'll see you guys straight after this little break.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back once again, everybody, as we have one more matchup here out of the Asia region. It's going to be Cyan taking on Silky as you enter this PVZ best of three. And we kick this off and look to see uh, how they're doing, what they're looking like in this season. Cyan's been great generally. He's actually been very good in online events. Silky is still, to me, this cheesier Zerg who is definitely capable of an upset, but definitely lacks that consistency. So we'll see what happens, because we're ready to jump in. We were just saying in the break, this is a smooth show so far. We are not holding up for anything. No, you're absolutely right. And I also really like the fact that we have a variety of matchups here, right? It's not like we have PvP, PvP, PvP. We've got ourselves a ZVP right now, which is a matchup we haven't had yet today. And it's been uh, it's been fun to see the different, uh, the different games here. No, no, it definitely has been uh, fun to kind of mix it all up. And I think throughout the entire today, we actually do mix it up as each match goes on. As in the bottom right, I'm going to start off this one with the Red Protoss player in the PvZ, representing History Gaming and pausing it up. Sorry, actually wasn't him <laughs> pausing it up, so never mind. We'll take a moment. This, I, I can tell you right now exactly what this is. This is where Silky forgot to set his hotkeys on his new account, even though he got told because this happens every <laughs> season. I swear down, Silky does this every time. <laughs> It might I not be. I see it every. Uh, no, go ahead. I, I mean, it might not be, but like, I feel like every time we start a season, Silky always has to pause in the first game. That's so funny, though, because I feel like every single time I'm at a StarCraft tournament, right? As soon as the players switch to a new computer or whatever, we always see them play at least a custom game real quick, either against no opponent or the easy AI or something like that, just to double check if everything is okay. But I guess sometimes you just want to get into the game as quickly as you can and. Well, usually whenever I have to personally switch my hotkey profile, I have about 17 hotkey profiles that all have very similar names with very minute differences, and I never really know exactly which one I need to choose. So maybe he's running into the same issue here. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Looks as though it'll just be a couple of moments. But uh, yeah, Silky, uh, capable of taking out Cyan, but I do feel like Cyan has been leveling up lately to me, one of the players that can absolutely compete at the top of this region alongside an Oliveira, alongside a Firefly. You know, a coffee on a good day, absolutely, as well. You know, to me, Cyan should be looking to top four this event, if not higher. Um, yeah. Which puts the kind of pressure on Silky here in round one, as apparently he is okay, which means we should be able to get this one going again in just a second, everybody. And uh, get back in game for you guys here for map number, or match number four, map number one, here today, as uh, referee says go. So once we're unpaused, we'll take you straight back in. Alrighty. Oceanborn to start things off with. Very popular map overall. Nothing all too crazy on this one. Game resumed. Mapu apparently had the powers here. Mapu takes charge. He's it. like, the referee ain't doing it. I got you, boys. <laughs> he was just so excited to do the little spin as we have in the bottom right. It is, in fact, the Red Pros play for Mystery Gaming. Cyan. And his opponent, all the way in the opposite corner with the blue Zerg pieces. It's a Silky. Good old Protoss versus Zerg. PVZ. Good matchup. Forced to take the third base. Wow. Protoss is so good. Yeah. He's one probe <laughs> can block an entire hatchery, man. It's, it's unreal. It's incredible. It is interesting, though, because a lot of Zerg players have been opting for that 15 hatch style. I think it's personally very good, but. Uh, some players just don't really want to play it all too frequently, especially on a map like this. I guess you don't really absolutely need to, but I always kind of feel like being forced to take your third base as your first expansion just makes the game more complex, and suddenly you're a little bit more scared of, say, for example, like an adept follow-up or something along those lines, because everything's just going to be a little disconnected. It always makes me a bit uncomfortable. I know it really doesn't happen at the pro level that it's, you know, too strange of a thing, because everybody's played this a million times, but... 
personally, I much prefer having the natural. Yeah, this is, uh, it's very true, right? It's one of those things where it's like, for a while, people are like, was it worth it? Was it not? A lot of the time it is kind of just worth kind of getting that block off. And then Zerg's like, well, you know, now we take an earlier hatchery. We just get the natural on location. We don't have to deal with the kind of distance or anything like that. Let's just see this drone moving about and a probe heading to the upper left side. Absolutely. Just going to scout it out. So the norm in this particular matchup is for Protoss to go into that Stargate opener. I'm fully expecting that here from Cyan in just a moment. Adepts together with Oracles have been very popular recently, where, well, recently, I mean, the last uh, couple of years, really. So we do have the Twilight Council coming, or sorry, the Stargate right now coming up. We do sometimes see that Twilight Council transition instead, but lately we've seen uh, more of those uh, Adepts harassing, right? There's been quite a few of them shading around the map and for example groups of five a little bit later even without glaives they can still do a lot of damage oh yeah absolutely do you have a couple lings here i'm just gonna move about i'm gonna go after that probe would love to get a catch on that as the probe does get the pylon down just to delay on the natural by a few moments longer the stargate is getting close to finishing uh -huh. oh looking very standard the pylon blocks long enough for the adept to get here which means a ling goes down and a drone cannot become the hatchery for even longer, so good play from Cyan, just making Silky's life difficult in these early stages, if absolutely yeah. nothing else. I really like this from Cyan, though, because it just makes the game so much more complex. Suddenly we have all those links off creep, they're slow links as well. Sure, eventually there will be a base made here, and it really shouldn't matter all too much, assuming Zerk handles everything perfectly. It's just that it's very easy to slip up. Luckily for, uh, for Silky, though, he did put down that, for example, that creep tumor, and he's going to be able to connect all of this eventually, and it doesn't look like he's really made any critical errors, but just complicating the game, you know? That's really what Protoss is looking for here. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. As the, the Oracle start popping, they're going to be the map control. They're going to be the way to apply any amount of pressure here for the foreseeable future, so definitely be keeping our eyes on those as one of what goes around that right side. A couple of depths come out from the bottom. These lings are still just chilling out that left-hand side as well, so they're just waiting there, but the adepts move out. They're going to continue to commit across for the moment. Good movement right there on the queens. Adepts in the meantime thinking about maybe making a bit of a slide towards the left side of the map. Third next is coming up at about the four-minute mark. Nothing all too crazy over there, considering he warped in some additional adepts. That is the normal time for certain. All right, let's see. So far, not a whole lot of workers killed yet, right? So we are, yeah, literally at zero drones killed at this point in time. Cyan is going to look for uh, a little more than that here over the next minute or two. It would be really nice to get rid of some workers. The earlier you get them, the more effective it is. If you don't get any, then the Zerg really feels as though they've had a successful early game, and then they're really going to power up through to the next stage of the game as well. So let me see how that pans out as the revelation comes down. A couple of these creep teams getting caught, the Lings. Still looking for the wraparound as the adepts do shade away. We've got one queen here as well. Just going to go pick off an adept moving in. The Oracle gets a couple drones, but honestly, overall, not a bad defense. We no. do not get one more drone there. So, yeah, good cleanup, honestly, across the board. Yeah, no, absolutely. At this point, you don't really have much of an opportunity to harass anymore as Protoss either, because there's a lot of Zerklings out. I mean, obviously, the Oracles can still fly around, but they haven't really achieved that much with one of them going down as well. Now it's going to be Protoss who needs to sit back here for a moment. You never really know exactly how much aggression is coming. Silky, as a matter of fact, is just mass droning at this point in time. But very soon we enter that lair stage of this matchup, right? Where suddenly, well, in the early game, Zerk is pretty predictable as far as what they will do. But suddenly in the mid game, they have a dozen different options available. And all of them are powerful. Another Oracle falls, Wardy. That's not what you're looking for at all. Nope. Oracle's going down. Map control being lost. And this becomes more and more and more of a problem. So... This has really become a bit nasty for Cyan. He gets, well, plus one on the forge, charge on the way. He's readying up his follow-up, but yeah, Silky is, hmm. you know, attacking up. The only thing for Silky is a little bit lower on drones. To some extent, Silky doesn't mind that. Sometimes Silky is the guy where you kind of sit and he has the cast, and you're like, well, build 20 more workers, please, and you'd be in a good spot. <laughs> but instead, he really likes to kind of sit at 60, so we'll see how much he does drone-wise from here, because he did just get to 60. He's obviously got that tech coming up, and he is still building a few more. I'm just happy to see it because, like I said, I've definitely been screaming at my monitor a few times when watching Silky in the past. <laughs> well, if he's going to go Swarm Host, and it kind of does look like that, considering it did make a very quick infestation pit, he doesn't really need that many of that's those, true. Uh, those drones. But that's probably going to be let's the... Let's see what he decides to do. Yeah. That's probably be the one time he makes more than, like, 70 workers. He's like, you know what? <laughs> it's like, finally, he goes 75. You're like, no, this is the only build! <laughs> 
Well, he hasn't actually committed to anything yet, so we made a very quick infestation pit, but at Lairtech, it's just been Glowery Constitution, so just Roach Speed for now. No Overlord prep either. Yeah, he realized he... Okay, he realized he... Oh, okay. Well, Adept's sleeping on the drop here. That's a bit unfortunate. Luckily, Silky, uh, for science sake at least, decided to turn around and only run in with a few of those units. Anyways, the Swarmos here are ultimately coming. Supply block or not. A little bit delayed than the original plan, but should still be okay. Lings getting picked away at the other Lings coming around. Two workers going down so far. Zell still charging, picking up that Ling again, and we do see the Swarm Host still in production. So eight of them popping out. Plus one missile down the Rogue Speed continue to produce. Our Swarm Host still continue out into the center. And a couple of cannons on the way from Cyan as well. Just gonna get those online next couple of moments. Yeah, no Nidus with this, which is kind of interesting to me. Usually, at least from the top level Zergs, usually whenever we do see them play Swarm Host, and it's not a very popular build right now, but they, they always accompany the Swarm Host with a Nidus Worm to try and send those units around the map. Instead, now Cyan is going to be the one who will try to be aggressive. He's got a whole load of charge slots, so at the very least, he's going to try. At this point, the Swarm Host will also be scouted. Nah, I don't really mind this all too much for Cyan. The main problem usually you run into is that your army is just simply not big enough as Protoss, right? So. Wow, that's perfect. Activating that first yeah. wave of Locust, running away. I mean, that's 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 pretty much exactly what you're looking for right there is the Protoss. Absolutely brutal for Silky because now your Swarm Hosts aren't effective for a while and the longer the Protoss has to prep against Swarm Hosts, the better off they are going to be against them, right? So that really is a dream situation as Oracle sets up another stage one in the center. These few Lings are going to get into a few Zelds which turn around and fight against the Lings as well. So damage being done across the board. And do you see Robo oh. Facility in a second bay coming up as our Archon Stalker is going to be there to push the Swarm Host away once more? Yeah, without a Nidus Worm, these units just don't feel nearly as good. Because at least then, if you have to, like, use one of those Locust Waves, at least you can still send them in the direction of a bunch of structures, right? Rather than just sort of awkwardly chase a bunch of units. Really good defense here so far for Cyan. So what Cyan is looking for is just a large army. That is his main goal right now. He wants to just make a whole lot of units because the bigger his army becomes, the better he is going to be against that Swarm Host force. Because you already mentioned it, the Swarm Host are very, very supply heavy. You can't have a lot of workers with them because they do take up so much of your supply. Now, this second wave is looking a little bit better though. Yeah, looking a little bit more hopeful. A few Zelts counterattacking during this as we drop the Archons down. We're going to lose the Temple Archives, but hey, there was nothing that was really building off of those apart from getting more up. Great. This is all catches. I mean, yeah, honestly, could not really continue to have better defenses as Cyan. Okay, you lose the Temple Archives, but like I say, you know, we're going to just get that filled back up. Maybe then get Storm on the way. I mean, right now, we're focusing on Colossi as our splash damage, so the Temple Archives is not a huge factor in my eyes. I think you're absolutely right. Another hatchery is building all the way up north. There is a Hydralis dead in this game. We do have a Hive, but there is, however, no Lurker then, so... That's usually the transition Zerg players like to go for quite a bit. This kind of feels like an extended mid-game all-in right now. And the longer that this goes on, the less damage that these Swarm Hosts deal, the more difficult it's going to be for Silky when this Protoss army does eventually go across the map. The range upgrade for the Colossus just about to finish. Another one just popped out of... Okay, there's a double Lurker then. That's, I guess, one way to solve that problem. But yeah, ultimately, more and more Robo units are popping out of those structures. I think if Cyan attacks within the next minute or two... He should be A-OK. -okay. Yeah, no, if Cyan can just get across the map without letting the Swarm Host pull him back too many times, I think his timing is looking absolutely beautiful, right? He's going to have a scary moment where the first round of Locust maybe drops on his army, but if the Colossi can deal with those, I think, like you say, he's in a pretty darn good spot to just take a fight. And right now, it doesn't feel like Silky's in position to kind of stop him from moving across the map. So Cyan's just going to get here, knock down a base. Prism already in the main base, causing some distractions as well. And, I mean, Cyan is like a... You know, like you said, already looking good. Now these swarms, they kind of have to turn and they are going to stop yeah. to do so. This might be the catch you've been looking for. The Colossi is going to run from the swarm host. I mean, they just kind of came from an odd angle, honestly. He's recalling home right now because those roaches were hiding in the bottom left and corner of the map. In the meantime, by the way, there has been a fleet beacon built as well by Cyan. So he is looking to make a transition here towards those Skytals units in a moment. Dark Templar are coming up too. All right, looks like Silky actually managed to survive this phase in the game so far. And now he does have double upgrades coming for the Lurkers. Now that's that weird moment, though, where you're kind of stuck playing a Roach Swarm Host, and you kind of want to get rid of both, but you can't, because if you get rid of your army, then you don't have an army anymore, which is not ideal. But neither of these groups of units really, yeah, are, are units you want to have for the duration of the game anymore, or for the remainder of the game, rather. 
Okay, Hydras and Lurkers are coming up right now here for Silky. Yeah, Hydra and Lurkers coming up. We actually give up as Silky. It feels like Micro in that bottom left Roach army. So that will go down. The Swarmless Wave honestly got dealt with pretty well also. And now there's just Zealots in the main base that are causing issues. And as Hydra spawned, not exactly looking great either. Ooh, uh, okay. Cool idea, <laughs> but the position doesn't really work out. Huh? <laughs> it was a good attempt. They all just wanted to hug together and, well, really get close to that Lurker then. Okay, now at least uh, Cyan knows exactly what he's playing against. And, well, if he oh, hadn't found out bad. about it from seeing the structures, he would have seen the units over here. Good revelation, though, keeping that one Oracle alive. There's also now an Observer up in the sky. Mama Ship coming up on the back of this two here for Cyan. So many Zells just keep warping in. Cyan is really just red. JD2 workers is really a booming economy for him. And, and nine lurkers are morphing in the front lines. I mean, you see those right now as Cyan. You're just going to make a play to dive on them. You do not want those to get up. And he's going to deny each and every one of those lurkers. There's a lurker still on the top side. Do we have detection? Yes, we have an Observer, in fact. Although now, did we dive we a little going? bit too far? Cyan just keeps moving. And he will, in the end, lose absolutely everything as he gets wiped as he just <laughs> didn't stop no there is i guess he saved the two immortals so that's kind of nice that prism coming in clutch near the end of that fight but he saw an opportunity and he took it and then he kept going even though the opportunity yeah was already quite a bit gone all right so mama ship is just gonna pop in a moment we have more immortal production at home there are going to be archons so i think ultimately cyan should be okay but it looks like we have another one of those games that could very well be flipped upside down we've, we've been casting a few of these here on the asian region today already and well this could certainly be another one of those where technically speaking cyan was just now in a game winning position but he threw away like 60 supply of his army for pretty much nothing Yup. Oh, that's a lot of uh, that was a lot of losses as we see a couple of them all still coming up. The Oracle coming through. Those three missiles is about to finish from Silky. I mean, at least Cyan rebuild quickly, but it still has to kind of sit back a little bit. And that allows you to take positions like this one. Cloak? We cloak? dropped the time warp. Yeah, now we cloak as well because there's no actual detection here from Silky. So Cyan is going to be able to push this away as it goes running down the ramp. But he's even going to prison Micro to get a couple extra kills at the end here. Love that for uh, Cyan, as that is a good hold, and Silky is not rich. Silky can't really rebuild like Cyan can, because he's only at that 66 Whoa. worker count. Of course, Cyan can't necessarily push into those lurkers. Well, you brought up the 66 drone count earlier in this game. You mentioned that usually Silky doesn't go past that point, but it looks like we have found our, our, our way in that, well, situation once again here, too. Those Zealot runbys really have been cleaned up well, but they have been dragging Silky all the way back home every single time. These units are also going to get cleaned up this time around. Cyan is now still sitting in the middle of the map, and assuming he has a prism with his army, which he does, he should be able to continue attacking very comfortably. Yeah, he's going to have storms ready soon. Storm upgrade itself is actually only halfway done, so it's not ready yet, but the full setup is pretty much there. You see a little revelation going to go down in that group of lurkers as well, so keep an eye on this. I mean, the problem is we don't really have the range or the immediate splash on lurkers right now, like Colossi, Disruptors. Obviously, we're about to get Storm, and that will help. But I think that's what's missing for Sign to really be able to find the opportunity to attack on in and to really kind of have a high impact engagement in these next few moments. He just warped in an additional four Archons here and Immortal is just about to pop. Cyan has brought all of the pieces together to one engagement and that is gonna be taking place right over here. Does Silky have enough to defend against this massive Protoss army? All of the Mothership cooldowns should be available. Time Warp goes down and all of those lurkers are in a world of trouble. This is the first time he sees Sonic Storm and it's right in the middle of all of his army. Beautifully played right here by Cyan in the end. I think it got a little sketchy when he, uh, well, first off, jumped this unit composition. I mean, maybe this is going to get cleaned up by the Zerk eventually, but I'm not he worried. may be winning the fight, <laughs> but I don't think he's winning the war. Yeah, I'm not worried if this gets cleaned up. Silky has no rebuild potential where Cyan does, and he got rid of most of the tech units. Now there's one Lurker left. The two Immortals here will absolutely smack anything in their way, and Cyan will be able to take victory here in game at number one. It took, like you say, a little bit of an effort and a little bit of a bump along the road. But we got there in the end, and that means that Cyan is up by one over Silky in this best of three. Um, cool stuff from Silky, but overall felt like Cyan controlled it well. Just, again, maybe his own decisions got him closest to being in trouble than anything else. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of those things that uh, I don't think Silky is going to be all too happy about, right? Like when your main opportunity was your opponent making a mistake, that's usually not the way you want to play a game of StarCraft 2. 
Now, interestingly enough, game number two in this series is going to take place on Post Youth, which is one of the strangest looking maps I think we've historically had in SC2, at least as far as the main base section goes. If you haven't seen it before, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about in just a moment, because it always reminds me of a 2v2 map, but... Yeah, interesting style from Silky. I'm a little surprised he decided to go 66 drones and then just swarm host with roaches, but no Nidus Worm. There's a good reason why we normally do see the Nidus Worm accompanying those swarm hosts, but yeah, he wanted to play them straight up, and I think Silky just, or sorry, Cyan just handled that really well. Yeah, no, I, I think he really did just handle it well. That's what it came down to in the end. As we get ourselves ready for this next map, Cyan and Silky going into post youth, as you mentioned. We'll head into this and see how things are going to turn as we go into a yeah, very interesting map. I'm surprised this one has been played so much, but people seem to kind of feel like it's just sort of fine, which is interesting. It's, yeah. it's cool to see people actually just trying these new kind of more intriguing maps and they're not just being like insta vetoed every single time. So uh... I'm with you. When I, I first saw this map making it through to the ladder tournaments and then or sort of ladder maps and then also the tournament maps, I kind of figured that this was going to be like one of those. OK, we'll maybe see it in a best of five, a best of seven, but we've been seeing it in a surprising amount of best of threes. Yeah, people seem to really like it, which is just like I say, that's kind of cool, you know, that's uh, good to see as we have in the bottom left side down a map looking to bring it back. It is SSLT's Silky. And his opponent winning the first game in the series, he is Cyan. Although he's playing in red, just to clarify. Playing just to make red. it confusing for everybody. <laughs> yeah, just to, just to really confuse us all. So here's the main base that I was talking about. It feels so weird to me. There's two ramps, a couple skinny mineral fields blocking that slightly wider than normal ramp. And then the main base has half golden minerals and it's on the same level as it's it's all funky it's all a little weird but it's been actually totally fine i also quite like how the gold base like there's another gold base uh, for both players usually has been the fourth for both of them but it's it's actually come into play quite a bit i didn't think it was going to be that good of an expansion when i first saw the map because it's down on a low ground and obviously while well, siege units usually have a grand old time shutting it down but this has been a very dynamic map once again, just like the others that have been introduced. And yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised. It's been a lot of fun to uh, see this map develop as well. Yeah, I decided to keep seeing all the new maps. Like, obviously these new maps, they come from a uh, team looking map contest where the idea was freestyle. The idea was to go crazy. So we kind of took the, the best of the crazy. And that's why we kind of only had five maps into the map pool as well, right? So you still have some of the more standard stuff around. And it's just made for a very... So far, fun map pool. Obviously, it takes a little while for us to know for sure, like, you know, is stuff balanced? Just, you know, is this map pool specifically very good for one race or another? But so far, I think the main thing is it's just diverse. And I think that's a combination of A, the map pool, and B, the fact that we just have these nine maps available now instead of seven. Such a positive change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I 100% I agree. We've had now nine maps in a map pool for maybe like, I don't know, a half year, a little over a half year. And it's been one of the best changes, actually, I think, for the competitive... Just the competitiveness of this game in general. I mean, if our goal is to figure out who the best strategy player is, I think having more map variety is an excellent choice. I also think it just is more interesting, not just uh, as far as players go, but also for, for viewers and maybe for casters too, although obviously we are at the bottom end of the interest here. But it's been a lot of fun to yeah, just see these maps develop and to see more and more strategic variety as Silky has decided to, well, aim for, I guess, nine golden mineral fields here early on. Uh, this is something that a lot of people are trying to do on this map. They just do go towards and accelerate into that gold base. So Silky going to be doing that. But I tell you what, Cyan's build choice, I think, is absolutely spot on to deal with this. Twilight Council early, that means you're going to be pressuring on the ground quickly. That's the exact thing you want to punish someone that's expanding further afield than they're meant to be. If this was a Stargate, it's like, oh, cool. Well, I put a queen or two on this base, a queen or two on that base, and I'm defended. Against Glaives, it's a way more complex situation now. So this is perfect for Cyan to be able to stop Silky from getting set up with the greed that he's looking for. Absolutely. This is uh, a very disconnected Zerg, right? All of those bases are, well, I guess the main and the, I don't even really want to call it a natural, uh, the main base and then that second hatchery inside of the main base, those are connected, but that third, that golden base that he's taking is very, very far away. It's gonna be difficult to defend against this from the, uh, for the Zerg player for sure, but Adepts are soon gonna be moving across. 
Yep. He doesn't have a robo facility with this, by the way. It's just gonna be, I guess, yeah, warping just, it at home. Yeah, just warping it at home, wandering across the other side. I like it. As a few more adepts continue to come through, that glaives is coming by as well, so we get all of that on the way. And, uh, yeah, Rotron coming up, a few more drones and lings and the queen coming about. The adepts will be moving into the center, and right now there's not a lot of lings are available, and if the first few lings donate themselves on these adepts like that, this really ain't good. Multiple lings going down for no need there, and already drones are evacuating the gold. And a couple of them going down as well. These adepts will sit here, kill a queen. I mean, this is already a win for Scion in my eyes. He's stopping a gold base. He's stopping a third hatchery from mining. Yeah, he, he's got to love this all together right now. Absolutely. The only way Zerk can really defend this is with overwhelming unit numbers, right? Like, that's his best way of doing it. Because road speed is not even remotely close to finishing, because we need a lair for that, and that one hasn't started up yet. So if this would have been a Dark Templar follow-up, which it isn't, uh, that could have been... Well, basically the end of this series. Instead, it's going to be charged on the back of this. Five additional gateways as well. We have the plus one ground weapons researching for Protals. I mean, Cyan is uh, improving his lead. He didn't decide to go for the Dark Templar follow-up, which is a pretty uncommon follow-up, I guess, all things considered, but would have worked out perfectly for him here. He doesn't really want to take the chance, but he's still not even remotely done here with the Adepts. Nope, these are definitely going to try and come back in, and well, we'll continue to shade back down the bottom where Ling Roach is going to be settling. And uh, these adepts this time do get caught, so this is a pretty big deal as these adepts get captured. We're just going to have ourselves a clean up, and Silky will push this back, take some map control back. Cyan just needs to be able to defend because Silky is making nothing but units. 31 drones. Cyan just desperately needs to get units, units, units out right now. The plus one will help, the charge will help. All of this will help. We just need the numbers. Yep, Suki is completely all in right now. Luckily for him, though, charge slots kill everything here for the Zerg. Plus one is finishing up. Charge is 10 seconds away. As long as those upgrades are done, I think he should be all right. It's going to be very difficult to land proper corrosive piles against units like that. In the meantime, there's a Stalker making itself look very wide on the top of that ramp. Good rep around so far, but the Zealots did back up, at least somewhat, to the safety right there of that battery. Yeah, we're going to want more Zealots in from the main base as well. And honestly, Zealots are finally tanking this situation. The problem is now going to be the roaches, right? Because you don't have blink or anything. You open glaives, glaives, charge. Both not exactly the best against roaches, especially if you just don't have enough numbers. And charge charging now before any reinforcements get here. And this may give you an opportunity assigned to defend. He's up 20 workers, so really in a fantastic spot. There's Ravager Rav just getting caught in the corner. That is going to be a defense. That is going to be a hold. Plus adepts on the other side getting a couple of workers here and there. And this is looking beautiful here for Cyan. Absolutely. His economy right now is booming. Silky decided to take a chance. He really wanted to get that golden base going here as quickly as possible. It's so far away, right? So it's technically, I guess, if you look at the minimap, it's kind of like your third base, but it's, it's, it's a mile away from the main. So he connected the bases with creep now. That is going to make life a little easier. The problem is that Cyan has literally doubled the worker count. He's even going for a fourth nexus, likewise on the mirrored location with the golden minerals and... I mean, he is going to start attacking right now with whatever he's got. He goes into a robo facility here. He could go into Blink if he wants to. He can play this out normally if he wants to, but I don't really think he needs to. No, I don't really think so, as our Zalt's going to come in on a couple of sides. We just continue to push forward as sign. He is just going to send it, and, and honestly, why not? If he's got the numbers, then great. Reinforcements are showing up, though, and that might make Cyan think twice about his decision. Still, though, he's killed seven drones in this whole process. Still has more zealots arriving. I just don't think it's necessarily going to be enough. And Cyan seems <laughs> yeah. to think so as well, but which is fine. We're about to have plus two against no upgrades. We're about to have a robo in play. We're taking our own gold base. I think we're fine here as Cyan. The most important part is he doesn't throw away too much, and I honestly don't think he did. No, he was trying to uh, swarm the Zerk, right? That's always uh, an interesting decision. I mean, uh, 20 workers is not a whole lot of workers already, so he is just trying to see if he can potentially end this game. Now the Zealots are dragging this entire Roach Zorkling army all the way back home. I mean, the problem here for Silky is that there really is no way out other than his opponent throwing away too many units, right? So that is why he's chasing this to the best of his abilities. But even now with these Zealots going down, they're getting decent value. And in the meantime, we've got an Immortal coming up, Sentries and Zealots on the production tab. I think this is all very, very solid here for Cyan, who now even has the Golden Minerals available himself. Yup, yup, yup. There's really uh, not much else to add on this one, man. I mean, Zion is just looking absolutely spot on for the moment, so... This is looking great. This is looking good. I can't really say anything else, man. This is just looking as though this is all about Zion. 
Obviously up 1-0 in the series as well, looking to make this a 2-0 advantage, which is obviously going to be big. Absolutely. He's going to try and push down towards this low ground. Now there is a photon cannon and a third shield battery coming up. He realizes there's really no way of getting it done. So Silky decides to rip off the Bendate himself. It's going to be Cyan who obtains the victory 2-0. Well played. GG's. Well played. And Cyan takes it to wrap up day one of the Asia region. All the players that are one to know advance to play against other one to know players. That will not be tomorrow, but the day after. Whereas all the players who will be 0-1 will play against other players who are 0-1. Again, will be the day after that. So, uh, exciting first day. I think we saw some kind of crazy matches. Mostly the uh, results we expected. Hassan and Nami, probably the closest most back and forth at PvP uh, as we went through Asia. And uh, like I say, a few of those players already begin to move on through into that next round, Loco. It's gonna. Oh, mm -hmm. The thing with these regionals is it heats up, right? Like, every round becomes more difficult because you're playing players who are more, in theory, evenly matched. So it gets better and better every single time. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing of this Swiss format as well, right? You just start facing more and more evenly skilled opponents, I suppose. So maybe the first round can be a bit predictable, but we should get past that point pretty quickly. Honestly, the games have been very competitive here today. I mean, the first series that we had, I guess, was our most one-sided one, but we've had some fantastic games. The Protoss versus Protoss also came to mind that we had earlier that... Uh, it was uh, Hass going up against Nanami, game number one. I mean, 17 minutes on two bases with Dark Templar and Blink Stalkers going all over the place. Just such a mess. It's been it's been a blast. We had some uh, some really fantastic games so far. Yeah, and uh, we're going to be continuing that as we swap regions over to Europe. I, I actually thought Europe was in 40 minutes, but apparently it's in 11 minutes. So we do not have too long awesome. to wait. So we're just going to throw it to a break. When we come back, it's European action starting off with DNS vs. Shadone, and then plenty more to come after that. So stay tuned to the ESL Spring Regionals.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody, once again, as we are here in a new region. It's Europe time, and we're going to be getting going once again with this in just a few moments. We get this ready to kick off, begin. I'm getting ready to have some fun because we love Europe. It's an extremely competitive region. It's the largest region we have as well. As we do, of course, have this uh, event play over two different groups in Europe. 32 players in total, which just makes it that much bigger, that much better, and that much more fun. So uh, definitely expecting all of that to be very fun to see as well. As we will be having in a moment or two a uh, look at what our schedule looks like today. But also where the standings are at in these groups. And again, I'll just take you through uh, how this basically works. Of course, basically it is still the same as the uh, as the Asia kind of section because there's groups of 16 players it's just there's two groups if we take a look at our first group here the group a standings you can see players such as clem neoness um Gyal. yeah i mean just a whole bunch of players basically a yeah, great set of players and you can see that once again they're gonna go through this swiss system just as we expect them to loco in this mm -hmm. what we're mostly going to be casting today is group a as well so definitely looking forward to that and definitely expecting that, that is going to be uh pretty fun right no, you're absolutely right. We've got ourselves uh, eight best of threes coming up here for the European region, just because the region is indeed so big. So in case you're just not tuning in, we're only a little bit into today's broadcast. Some of the series so far have been relatively quick, but I've got a feeling we've got a lot of close matches coming up. We've actually got France going up against France, Poland going up against Poland. We got a, a lot of uh, countrymen fighting each other. Uh, a lot of countrymen fighting each other here as well in the European region. Later today, we have some Germans taking on each other. And in the end, apparently Harstam taking on Euthermal, who decided to play a random for this event. He managed to qualify playing a random. Yo, we haven't seen a random player in yeah. one of the regionals in ages. It, never, I don't think, actually. It's uh, okay, yeah. actually kind of crazy, but he has been playing random. He always plays random as of now, but... Uh... Yeah, he's going to keep on playing random, and that's very exciting as we move our way through this schedule today. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. I am looking forward to that Hostum Youth Thermal match, a Dutch showdown. Yeah. Two players with a big rivalry, but then Youth Thermal is now playing random. You know, he much more focuses on the content and YouTube and stuff, so that's just going to be a ton well, of Harstum fun. Well, knows he's going to be in a video for sure. Like, whatever <laughs> happens, there's going to be a Youth Thermal video regardless. I've got a feeling Youth Thermal has got something special cooked up, too. So, like, it's one of those series where, like, in my mind, Harstum versus Youth Thermal, Youth Thermal playing random. That should be Harstam, easy peasy, right? Especially since Euthermal doesn't really compete at as high a level anymore as Harstam does these days. But you know he's got something cooked up, so I'm excited for that one too. Yeah, going to be uh, a lot of fun, I think, as we get uh, this ready to go. So we're going to get started in a couple of moments and uh, head on into our game for a fresh set of action from a fresh region. It's a Platinum Hero Showdown actually to start us off. Both these players from the same team. And we will be starting off in the top left-hand corner of the map. Oh, no. You know what? In the bottom right, that's where Mapu's at. So in the bottom right-hand side, <laughs> ah. is going to be our Red Protoss player, DNS. And his opponent, playing with the blue Protoss pieces, likewise also from France. He goes by the name of Shadon. Alrighty, let us have a look. So, we talked about the sentry changes a little bit. It technically makes playing defensively in this matchup a little bit better. Now, we didn't really see that so much in the Asian region earlier today because, well, that featured Haas going up against Nanami, both of those players. Definitely not necessarily known for their passive play, right? To, to put it lightly. Um, these two, though, I can imagine we're going to see at least a little bit more of a macro focus approach. Yep, <clears throat> absolutely expecting some... Uh some macro to come about here as we have uh these guys as dns especially loves to play the macro stuff i mean sometimes in pvp you can't avoid it becoming a little bit cheesier a little bit dirtier but uh we will see how it all goes and again a couple of gateways coming about the assimilators coming through probes are on the way i'm just going to be having our little gate still building on that high ground for the moment as well so getting those finished up cybercore will go down let me just get established, waiting to see where the two gates apiece go from. I do expect to see some sentries this time around in this PvP. <laughs> they were a hot topic in the earlier PvP that never came to fruition in all, at all. I really do expect to see a couple this time. Yeah, we used to sort of see it sometimes, but basically these days they're not quite as, as, as flimsy, I guess, as they once used to be, right? So they're a little bit more stable and it really does help you... Well, assuming you correctly micro everything, it really does help you stabilize some 
for example, a couple of expansions a bit easier. We'll have to see exactly what they fire up now with those Cyber Corps finishing up. It's going to be double Stalkers versus an Adept and a Stalker for the time being. We'll have to see though with the second set of units, Wardy. Any moment now, okay? I've got faith. I really want to believe in the Sentry, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> I really think <laughs> it, like it's good. Like, it genuinely makes this match very it cool is. as well. But uh, people don't want to play it. But this people is also a tournament it. match, right? So, like, it's one of those things where it's been a couple weeks tops. I think it's been, like, two weeks or so since the patch went live. So maybe players aren't 100% comfortable yet with either, right? When you're playing a tournament and maybe you're also feeling a little bit nervous, playing your tried and true strategies may just be a little bit better overall. Stargate on the way up from Shadon, so that's going to be his gas spend, and Deanna is still building Stalkers, right? So, as long as he wants to keep building Stalkers, Sentries are not going to be on the table just yet, because he's going to basically take this game via aggression. I mean, he still has the gas, though, but he's going to expand before he does anything else. So, is our Nexus going down? Comes on the natural, and we will work our way forward from there. Absolutely. Stargate is going to finish up in just a moment. I'm assuming this is going to be an oracle. There it is indeed going to be uh, started up here. We'll have to cancel that pylon if you want to leave. And would you look at that, Wardy? Two sentries. Yeah, 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 so we are going to see some sentries. And again, obviously, they're very useful still for, if nothing else, the ability to just kind of hallucinate and get information. They can hold their own more easily now because they do bonus damage to shields. And they don't die as easily to adepts or to oracles. They just don't take as much damage because they're no longer light. So... It really has been a big overhaul of the Sentry that doesn't really affect any matchup bar this one. Maybe, like, you know, TVP, they don't die to Hellions as quickly and stuff, but pretty minimal effects otherwise. Yeah, so the way that armor works in StarCraft is that some units deal bonus damage to certain types of units. So it getting the armor, oh, sorry, the light tag removed right there as the armor, as both players lose a Stalker, basically makes it slightly more tanky against certain interactions, and it really does help in this particular matchup quite a bit. Shadondo flying that very first Oracle towards the other side of the map. Two sentries are waiting. Two stalkers as well, but let's focus on the sentries. They're going to be able to protect this easy. Look at them. Absolutely shutting it down. Yep. I'm just going to be seeing us all that blink stone up on the side of uh, DNS as well. That will not be too far behind on the other side. As we get all of that ready to go. Hallucination does super nice as well, right? Remember once upon a time, they reduced the energy cost of the hallucination. That suddenly made a, a little bit of a, a, it allowed a bit of a comeback, I guess, for the Sentry at the time, um, because we rarely used to see the unit. I'm expecting we're gonna see it a little bit more as well, though, moving forward now. The unit overall does seem to still be a bit flimsy, but certainly more powerful than it once used to be. The Blink Wars, they should be beginning. Now, there's the force fields going down, and it looks like the four legs right there of that one Stalker in blue are going to be able to carry it away pretty far. And on top of that, it also carried that entire Protoss army in red away pretty far. So three probes end up going down. Yep, three workers going down. Oh, we might lose the Oracle, though. We just keep it alive. That's Ooh. such a big deal, because that is one of the advantages you want to have throughout here, Shadone. You want to keep that up. You want to keep that running. That's not something you want to just be giving up easily, so... Yeah, Blink coming up on both sides. Next in the gateway, continue through. Our stalkers and sentries will continue to gather up. And we just got our next going down as well. Already a third base. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about that other PvP we saw earlier today, where 17 minutes on two bases on both sides. Not quite the case here. Five and a half minutes, both players are indeed already expending. Now, the Stalkers in uh, in red, yeah, they have found an angle. Shadon now marching all the way back home because he was trying to do the same thing on the other side of the map. Turns out DNS has managed to catch his opponent off guard just a little bit. Couple nice force fields as well, but sadly for him, a blink just finished up. Those sentries, okay, they're gonna be helpful. Maybe we should have had a guardian shield though. That's a little funky, right? Because DNS is kind of cornered yeah. in, but he's the one with more units. So the guy with more units gets cornered. He can fight his way out of it. And continue to blink back around here, and we are going to go for a couple more Stalker kills out in the center, so we'll get a grab on a couple of those. Sentry goes down, this army of DNS still prepping up. You're going to see a couple more of these Stalkers getting jumped on as well as the damage continues to be done. Absolutely, DNS has found a, a very nice opportunity off of the back of this Sentry push, and it's been very powerful using the blink against blink i mean ultimately it's the player with the bigger numbers right that will end up winning here the defender's advantage is of course in favor right here of shadon just because he gets to warp in quite literally in the middle of this battle there's no such luxury right here for dns but so far i mean these fights have been really good here yep they've been, yeah they've been really spot on right he's been getting a lot of value out of this he's getting a few pro kills now but he is going to run out of stalkers without doing too many more workers 
And that is interesting because you can see DNS has an army supply lead. He's still down a couple of workers though, so as he gets cleaned up a little bit and pushed back, he loses his momentum. I think Shadon comes out of this kind of feeling fairly okay. Yeah, DNS decided to spend a lot of his money on a whole lot of additional gateways. So he invested into a future here, I guess, with charge and then additional gates. So there's going to be six of them added into the mix, bringing a grand total up to eight, whereas Shadon apparently feels compelled right now to go into that dark shrine transition here instead. So a little bit of a deviation. I don't know if I love Dark Templar at this, uh, in this particular position, Wardy. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. It's like, it, it kind of feels like a bit of a risk to take when DNS is the player already being aggressive, right? That's what yeah. I'm kind of thinking. It's expensive too, so you're spending all that money on things that probably won't help you out in the next couple minutes, and I feel like those next couple minutes are going to be absolutely pivotal, but... Anyway, uh, either way here, DNS is going to expand behind this, but he's also finished up all of those gateways as well as that charge research. He just found his opponent's nexus. Wants to go after the pylon, backs off for just a moment because there's an immortal in the mix right now too. Decides to blink forward, grabs the immortal, but there was a lot of walking involved. Yep, absolutely, as now these few Zorgas getting warped in as well, though DNS can reinforce so quickly into this, and this is where that investment in the dog trying does not pay off for you at all. It's still not even finished, and you're lacking stalkers as DNS powers through. He's about out of charge, so if he wants to add in a few Zelda yeah. to tank as well, he can be even more powerful here. Yeah, he's got lots of money in the bank too, so he can do a nice little warp in of well, Stalkers and then leftover minerals into a bunch of Zealots. Now a Dark Templar does get warped in, but there is an Observer in the mix, so I'm assuming it's going to go across the map, and that's exactly what it does. It will aim for that fourth Nexus at the bottom of the map, but Shadon's fourth Nexus at this point is gone. That Dark Templar is going to have to put in a ton of work in order for it to justify itself. Yep. I'm just going to be seeing our uh, Stalkers still taking position from DNS. I mean, yeah, this DT shows up. There's already an Ops here. We just need a couple of units. There's a Cannon there as well, so the defense is going to be spot on. Um, maybe over on this Natural is no Cannon, but the Ops is coming over. The Stalker can fire some shots. The Probes will pull just to help with the DPS. So we get a few kills, but not too much in the grand scheme of things. One more Immortal in the mix right now for Shadon. That does really help out against the Stalkers as soon as it starts firing. No charge or anything like that, though. Coming up here yet for the player in blue. Zealots now dropped right on top of those Stalkers as well. Prism is going to hide in the top left and corner. I guess there is still technically a Stargate out, but no Phoenixes or anything like that to really easily shut that down. And the Stalker numbers right now for DNS are just superior. Zealots in the main base is just such a problem as well, and just is, again, this cascade and effect of that army supply advantage that DNS had earlier. He has kept it, he is running with it, and it looks as though he is on his way to clearing up this game. The DTs are going to delay the del end of the game just because they can play cleanup for a little bit, but honestly, DNS's army out the front with the Observer is pretty darn strong as well, so it may just be no stopping it at all. As you blink forward here, Immortal number one, Immortal number two go down, Shadon says GG, and DNS take home a 1 0 lead. Clean. Not really running into a whole lot of issues here. Carried off of the back of those. Uh, let's let's pretend at the very least it was carried off of the back of those two sentries, Wardy. It was the sentries, man. It changed everything. It, was it changed kind of... everything. Honestly, they were very good. <laughs> sentries actually are like no joke, very good right now in PvP. The thing yes. is, though, if if nothing else, you've got to respect what the sentries can do now. So it changes the way you open as you know a Stargate player, even right? Because nowadays it's maybe not even as good to go double Oracle because. The four against enemies, you'd be able to like two shot them or so, and that just doesn't work. It means the adept openers aren't as effective because they can't punish sentry openings as much. So it has a lot of impact, even if you don't see it game by game. It has that impact on what's on the mind of the players and what they are thinking about in these games. So definitely think that that is a uh, pretty sizable factor as we get ready for a game number two here. We ready up for more action in the European region. DNS leads 1 0 over Shadon. It's going to be Ghost River, one of the new maps once again. The new maps are really making their ways into these best of three series. So very exciting to see Ghost River once more, this time around in a Protoss versus Protoss. A matchup maybe where taking your uh, expansions is not quite as critical, but there's a very quick rush distance, especially if you end up knocking down those rocks. So well, yeah, we'll see in just a moment what the players decide to go for. Already though, players are readying up. So we will be jumping into game number two in this best of three series here in just a moment. A bit of an aggressive one here in game number one, at least, but at least there were a bunch of expansions, right? Nothing all too crazy, but at least we did see some expanding. Absolutely, as uh, DNS readied up, so we are good to go. We saw some expanding DNS, the aggressive throughout. 
We'll see what Shadone does differently. I mean, Ghost River, kind of wild for PvP. If you get through those early stages, this becomes a stalemate of a map. You're pushing into your opponent yeah. on a limited amount of bases. There's not a lot of move, room to maneuver around. It, uh, it can become pretty funky pretty quickly. It is close by air, natural to natural, which is maybe impactful as well. It's not going to maybe affect like the first Oracle of the game or so, but could be a factor later on for warp prisms flying across and just prisming into the natural. So things to look at there as well as we enter one of the newer maps of the map pool, Ghost River for map number two. In the, I'm just going to double check where Matthew is. He is in the top left this time. <laughs> in the top left hand side, the blue Protoss player from the Platinum Heroes, it is Shadon. And his opponent in the top right, looking dominant in game number one, he is DNS. Not really running into a whole lot of issues there. In the first game of this series, that gives you a nice little confidence boost as well moving forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No low ground expending, though, for either of these two players. Do um, who, who's out there still doing low ground expense at this point? Max Pax. Is it just Max Pax? But he doesn't. He doesn't even like to gateway on the low ground anymore as much. He even gateways high ground into expand still. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean, fair you enough. say low ground expand, all the expands would be low ground, right? But. But yeah, I mean. <laughs> fair enough. I thought, yeah, well, it's kind of yeah, hard to do a high ground expend on this map, Morty. <laughs> I see, this no, is I, not post youth anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, guess I see what you mean now. No, no. What I meant was like, um, I didn't know if you meant like if the gateway is at the front or not. Because even Max Vex doesn't just expand like gateway low ground and then expand behind the wall. Even he's been yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, gateway yeah. and high ground as well. So it's really just him. Fair enough. Alrighty, she's done scouting out exactly what's going on on the other side of the map. Got ourselves a bunch of gateways coming up again. Followed up, of course, with that cybernetic score. Cybercore opens up a bunch of different opportunities as far as the tech goes, so we'll have to see exactly what both of these players end up going for here in just a moment. It's going to be the Twilight Council, the Robo Facility, or of course the Stargate, or you can save yourself some money and go for the expansion instead. Yep, absolutely. As we do have our Cybercore finishing up, we'll see what happens, see what the techs are. We'll see we have probes in the main base of both players, so anything you tech up to right now is going to be visible. So we're likely going to see units first tech later. In this situation, one of those units going to be Stalker Zealot from Shadone, double Stalker from DNS, so pretty similar to what we saw last time. Ah, there we go, cancel the Zealot, build a sentry, so that basically hides that you couldn't afford the sentry straight away. So this time, Shadone's mm -hmm. going to get that sentry super quickly. He'll have a very fast hallucination available, and he'll be looking to expand, because if you put the gas into a sentry, you don't have gas to tech. You're absolutely right there. He's not going to be able to get that, uh, that tech going here anytime soon. That does mean, though, that DNS will be the aggressor here in the earlier stages of this game. He fires up two additional Stalkers as well. So we're going to certainly be sending all of those units towards the other side of the map. Now he's got 150 gas, 150 minerals. What exactly do we decide to go for here? Are we going to go for any sort of tech whatsoever? Apparently not yet. Got a lot of money. Okay, we're just going to make an expansion with 250 gas in the bank. All right. Maybe a couple centuries of his uh -huh. own. Yeah, I mean, to be yeah. fair, if you just have that gas, you can spend it afterwards, right? So, expand there a couple centuries. Yeah, get that tech on the go. Get that on the way. There's a few stalkers still coming okay, across. Yeah, there's that hallucinated phoenix you were talking about. Absolutely. Yeah, and that hallucination is super nice because you can scout out essentially anything. Unless you accidentally fly it over a bunch of stalkers, which we almost saw happening just now. You can pretty much always get the full vision over here of your opponent's tech and... The expansions, or, well, whether or not they decided to take one at all. So I'm just going to hit that Nexus. Sentry, Stalker, coming about here. And let's just have, obviously, the Stalkers are still good at firing away. The Sentries actually do good, like, decently against Stalkers, just not quite good enough. So, uh, Shadon will just take a few shots right now. We'll take a few hits. And, uh, we do have the Twilight Council and the Nexus coming up from DNS as well. Absolutely. Now with that low ground expansion, oh, okay, we're gonna pop the Guardian Shield just in case, even though the units were already, they were already running, but just made double sure that apparently they're going to disappear. Robo Facility on the back of this, of course, here for Shadon, so he has decided to go into the Immortal tech, whereas DNS is gonna go into the Blink Stalker. Yep. The Blink Stalker play coming through with the Immortal coming out. I mean, Shadon's gonna have a fairly powerful army pretty early. It'll be interesting to see if he wants to try and do anything with that. Uh, looks as though he's just going to be going for the expansion play. So he expands nice and swiftly there down to that third base. That's going to be his setup. 
can get that on the way. And again, just wait for DNS to have blink, because until the DNS has blink, not much else is going to happen here. Shadon doesn't really want to do too much of a push. You know, this is a move out, but the moment he gets that ramp on the other side, I don't really see a world in which he pushes up, unless, I guess, yeah, you go down the bottom, and maybe he can grab yeah. one quick cancel on the third before blink is ready. Uh, there are a bunch of force fields, though, so I <laughs> yeah. don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, the sentry's really helping out in this regard as well. Even when you do find yourself caught off guard just a little bit, probe here, scouting out, see if that, that army decides to stick around. It is important not to overextend, though, because another warp in or two, and suddenly DNS's army is very, very scary. So Shadon is going to start marching back home once again. There's going to be a Twilight Council to get away with a forge as well here for the player in blue, so he should be able to get similar tech going here in a moment. Yeah, it's going to be a long time to get the bling, which means Shadon just has to be a lot more defensive. I wonder if he even just goes charge first, right, and gets, you know, mm. into those zealots and so on because he doesn't need blink necessarily straight away. It limits your mobility, but if you're expanding faster and playing a more tech to bomb, you may not need that mobility. That said, he is warping in a lot of stalkers, so blink would naturally help a lot of what he already has. Force fields here, but of course this is where DNS has blink available, so blinking away is not going to be a problem. And so we are good. Adepto right now in both natural expansions. Shadona's going to be able to kill quite a few probes, and in the meantime, DNS is doing the same thing on the other side of the map. Bit of a wash here, I guess. Both players just trading out those units they still had from the earlier stages of the game. Shadona ends up uh, well, losing four right there, which isn't really the end of the world. It is just going to be good old Blink together with the Dark Shrine once again. Yep, Blink and Dark Shrine both coming up. Plus one attack from the Immortal on the way. A few extra probes are coming about as well, and... And here, Shadow on the left side gonna come through. Our stalkers move up the ramp. Force field goes down, and the stalkers just blink immediately, so nothing gained, nothing lost. And they do have the plus one charge. Now, on the way from DNS, Shadow did eventually start a blink. I think just he has so many stalkers, you may as well improve them, so away we go. Absolutely. DNS going into the charge research, too. Always nice to have that one, but ultimately, both players really just poking at each other a little bit, trying to deal damage, but they're really just building up their economies. They're always looking for mistakes from the opponent. If you can find yourself a bunch of free probes, or for example, a tech unit or two, that's fantastic. But ultimately, we're really just seeing both of them trying their very best. We do have a cheeky little blink here across that, well, bit of terrain, through the trees, over the grass. Apparently, you can ultimately make your way across, except for that guy. <laughs> That uh, one stalker just didn't do enough blink training, man. <laughs> His blink PB is uh, is not high enough, not long enough. He's got a couple meters less distance than the other guys yeah. somehow. It's a little sad. Can you imagine too. that? Each of your stalkers can't blink quite as far as each other stalker. Like, everyone's just a little <laughs> bit different. <laughs> That's the RNG we need at StarCraft 2. Like, certain units just don't benefit from upgrades as much. <laughs> yeah, man. Everyone's different in this world. Why is everything in StarCraft a, a so similar? A random marine just takes double damage from Stimpak. You're like, no, not you. So some lings that just naturally get lost, you know, from the packs, so they just split away themselves every now and then. <laughs> Don't have a good sense of direction. Yeah, fun. Ooh, Immortals coming down that main ramp, and the observer ends up falling. Stalkers have to run away. Really, no easy way of fighting this right now for DNS. This game is looking a little bit better for Shadon, isn't it? At least compared to that first match in this series, where things uh. just fell flat on their face the entire time. It's competitive on both sides, right? That's a nice catch on the DTs as they come in. The Adepts are still there, though. They also get some damage. We'll have to see the Stalkers leave the other DT to go and clean those Adepts up. Um, so, yeah, very playable on both sides, right? Our work counts are similar enough. Our army counts are similar. Tech is there. I think Shadon, yeah, a little bit of advantage, maybe. He's on his way to plus two. You know, Shadow Stride as well. He's set up well for the later game, whereas DNS is missing a couple of those tools already, such as, like I say, DTs are a great part of the later game PvP. Having a bunch of DTs blinking around the map as a harassment squad is so difficult to handle and to deal with, so that can be a big factor. Um, so because of that, I like it a little bit more for Shadon. That plus he's the player with the slight edges in workers and so on, so yeah, definitely looking way mm -hmm. better than a game one. But uh, very much so in the balance here, very much so a competitive PvP still. <laughs> He's already thinking about making another base as well, all the way in the bottom left hand corner, whereas DNS just finished up his, well, fourth base. The air to air distance on Ghost River is so incredibly short, so even if you've just scouted that section of the map, the prism can go across in a heartbeat, especially if it's maybe a little bit later also going to be getting that speed upgrade. Here we do have some vision of the high ground, much like those blink stalkers from earlier. They were thinking about doing the same thing, but they decided to make the small little jump instead. Yep, just a little one. Let's do have. Well, oh, Dark Shrine coming up from DNS. Yep, he really is just trying to match his opponent, catch up on that upgrade, catch up on some of the tech available here. Shadon just a step ahead, though, will expand into the bottom left-hand corner, uh -huh. so he takes that advantage as DNS 
Is going to find this run by, but the entire rest of the army from Shadon is across the right side. So Deanis might lose his fourth base, loses the cannon on the natural as well. This is going to be a good multi pronged attack in from Shadon. He's going to benefit massively. Looks like the fourth is dead. DNS counter attacking. Can he get rid of a base before Shadon can just realistically recall and get home safely? Other comes the question, yeah. I think, is. He's going to make some good progress. DNS is going to be competitive there, but everywhere else, it's kind of already fallen apart. Yeah, DNS a little indecisive right there for just a moment when he first noticed that the entire army of his opponent was on the other side of the map. Aggressive blink in right now, but he's already lost so much at home. And what was looking like a small advantage for Shadon has turned into a massive lead. DNS, though, is going to try and see if he can equalize this. Forces the recall here, and a lot of those units are going to be turning back home. Uh, picks up another Stalker before ultimately being forced to leave. But where in the world do you go right now here if you are DNS? You're behind in every way. You're behind in, well, I guess you're, you're even in upgrades, but that's really about it. GG is cold, and it's Shadon who evens up the score. Yeah, we tie it one to one. We're going to go to game three in our very first match of Europe, which is what you love to see. This is one of the matches today where I looked at him like, yeah. Either of these guys could go 1-0, either of these guys could be 0-1 at the end of the day, because this is an evenly fought yeah. matchup in my eyes. Um, I don't think it's surprising whichever way this goes. Shadon has been on the up in these regionals, he's been doing better and better. DNS has always been a contender in Europe. And it's PvP as well, like this is not a matchup would say one guy is better than the other at you know, anything or anything like that. To me, this is just one of the closer matchups of the day. There's a few of them that kind of have this kind of vibe. You know, I look further down the line, like mm -hmm. Mana Goblin has that kind of vibe to me as well. Even a laser Geralt up next kind of has that vibe a little bit. Maybe a laser more accomplished, but Geralt can absolutely hold his own. So a lot of very fun matches and uh, glad to see this one go into the game three to uh, kick it off right here in Europe. No, you're absolutely right. It's also, of course, a Protoss versus Protoss, one of those matchups where technically, even if you are the better player, it is so easy to accidentally make a mistake. There's a very slight margin for error in, in pretty much every matchup of StarCraft 2, right? But I always feel like it's especially obvious in the mirror matchups like in this particular case i mean dns was not in a bad position i mean i was slightly behind but suddenly that opponent's army managed to move across the map and yeah you have to almost commit to a base race it's very difficult at that point in the game to decide to do a recall i don't think he really could have done that regardless so yeah what was looking like an even game is suddenly over just about a minute later or so and well that means we're gonna go to site delta which is gonna be well game number three Game number three, and uh, decided map here for these two. Which of them will get to that beautiful coveted 1 and 0 position in this group? And he will be having to dig themselves out of the 0 and 1 trenches come round two of Swiss as we start off in the top left corner of the map with our blue Protoss player, Shadon. And his opponent, likewise also from France, likewise also playing Protoss, we have DNS. Suddenly, these uh, games can fall apart. The one moment you're macroing, and the next moment you fu suddenly find yourself with your army completely out of position. Protoss in general usually doesn't have quite as much vision, at the very least compared to, for example, Zerg, right? Zerg seem to always pretty much see everything around the map, but in Protoss versus Protoss, you can easily be caught off guard like that. And well, Shadon only really needed one opportunity there. Yep. That's all it takes is a couple of probes gonna pass each other by, fly past each other right there. Gateways coming up, probes and assimilators all continuing to come through and get ourselves settled in for a ride right now. And let's just see a low ground gateway, obviously with the ramp allowing you to expand, and that's what DNS wants to play for. Well, Shadon will not. Shadon is just gonna play that high ground gateway and uh, second gateway as well. Absolutely because of that ramp leading down from the natural expansion towards the rest of the map. You can usually expand a little bit easier, but obviously it doesn't really make that big of a difference in the end. But it's these small little changes that can ultimately affect the outcome of a game. DNS just harassing over here inside of the main base. Shadon doing the same thing. Stole five minerals from his opponent, and now he's going to be bringing that trophy back home. But don't worry, I think uh, DNS is going to do the same thing. Yep. Yep, 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 as you see, our uh, probe on the natural is going to patrol around a little bit. Other probe going to chase for a while. And cyber cores are going to complete it up. And I mean, obviously, Shadon just wants to try and block this expansion for as long as possible. As uh, DNS will just finish up the Zealot. This is necessary just in case a pylon block gets placed down right. I'm going to put the Stargate mm -hmm. down first as well. This is just a very typical way to expand. 
And I can only imagine that Shadone was planning to play against us to some extent once he saw the low ground gateway at the very least, if not even just beforehand, because it is a map with a ramp on the natural. This is not an uncommon way to play this map out. There's a plan on going down just to try and be as annoying as possible, but also to delay that expansion. You get a little bit of vision. Sometimes you can even see exactly what's going to be made inside of that Stargate. So Shadon just trying to delay this to the best of his abilities, but this is like a gentleman's agreement right now, right? This is what we always see. We know we're going to get blocked. Now, this over here is not quite an agreement that DNS is going to make the assumption of, but he's going to scout it. Nice movement here with the Adept. He sees it immediately. Can he do much about it, though? He's going to be sending the uh, the Zealot in this direction. It is going to be an Oracle first. Stalker's on the back of this right now as well, though, for Shadone. He's going to bring more of them across and be added on more gateways at home. I think, yeah, a Void Ray makes a lot of sense here. Yeah, get a Void Ray out. Just be safe, right? Just guarantee yourself a, a bit of safety. This is exactly what the Stargate expansion lets you do. Get a Void Ray up. Have a way to play defense. Have a way to be safe in these early stages. So that's exactly what we're going for. Looking good in that regard. I was just going to be seeing a couple of Stalkers chilling. Yeah, absolutely. Void Ray is going to be very handy here when it comes to that base defense, but Shadon is going to certainly give him a run for his money. That high ground does make this game a little bit trickier. No easy way for Shadon to look up that ramp. Obviously, the expansion is going to finish up here for DNS, though, and that means that slowly he's going to be building up a superior economy, so that does indirectly put Shadon on a timer here. He needs oh, to absolutely. commit, and he needs to get something done. Yep. No, absolutely just going to be seeing this uh, regressing along as our Stalkers come up. The Void Ray activates, pushing that Stalker back a little bit. One probe coming down this ramp. The Stalker's going to chill. I mean, just tough to push up the ramp into this. This is why you get away with this so often. Cannons, batteries all coming through, all making this so difficult for Shadon to break in with just basic Stalkers as well, right? There's no way to, like, blink on top and have that big one-shot potential. Uh, no, with good control, ahead. DNS should be able oh, to hold no! on here, but the pylons do actually get no! shut down over here, and that means that all of the production here is not going to happen. Wow, that's huge, man. I didn't even think about the fact that one pylon was just mm -hmm. chilling there, and if that went down, everything was a disaster. Oh my goodness, this is really bad. As a bunch more probes yeah. drop, these stalkers break through. GG. DNS wow. just has to GG. Oh, wow. I just didn't re double power up his front wall. <laughs> Brutal. Yeah, no, that was uh, that was flipped upside down really quickly. I was just thinking, like, what if he just targets, fires down that pylon? That is exactly what Shadon decided to go for. Just shut it. Like, normally, there's a second pylon, right, as a, as a backup plan right there in case that first one falls. But that's the only error you really need to see. And, well, apparently that now ultimately allows him to just straight up win the game, even though that defense was looking really solid initially. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. We're going to be heading into Garrett vs. Laser. Apparently, they're already getting a lobby up for that, so we are going to be zooming on through. So, I'm not going to hold us up yet. I'm going to keep the day going because we have so many games to pack in tight. We'll be back in just a few for more StarCraft 2 action straight after this. Thank you.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back once again to StarCraft II Action here in the ESL ST2 Masters Spring Regionals. The build-up to Dallas, our offline finals this season. And Lazer and Geralt look to start their campaign there today in the ZVP. Round 1 of Swiss for these two. Two Polish players have played each other a fair amount because of their, their natural occurrence to meet each other in the Polish scene. But it's a one-sided affair. 36 to 8 in series in favor of a laser. Can Geralt find one of those rare victories against a laser on one of the bigger stages? It's certainly possible, right? It's uh, it's one of those matchups that I I would probably call this maybe like a I don't really want to do percentages because I always regret it whenever I say like, oh, it's 70-30 or whatever in favor of one player. But I, I do see Geralt winning this potentially. It's just that Elazer has been really, really good at the game for a very long time, right? He's one of those players who doesn't necessarily win a ton of tournaments, but he's always been very solid and he's always been very good. So I do think this is going to be a bit of a hurdle for Geralt, and I do think Elazer is going to be the favorite going into this. Elazer, by the way, with a quick last-second portrait change in-game. He was playing the default portrait, but he quickly, quickly switched it over. That's an important. That's an important thing. You, you know gotta micro what? your portraits. In intimidating, right? Because you know these guys are all playing <laughs> on these new accounts that are only for this tournament, and now yeah. Geralt's like, "Whoa, this guy's so prepared. He had a portrait ready for me." Like you know, no this... Kaczynski anymore. What's going on right now? What are we expecting from this, this particular series? This is a, just a new level of of mind games and meta games going on as we hit back into. The European Regional Swiss Round 1 here in Group A. And we're going to be starting it off with the Blue Zergy, who is in the top left side of the map. It is a laser. I had to do my own spin because Mapu is so far down the observer list, I couldn't find him in time. <laughs> Poor Mapu. He did a spin as well. I was on his uh, I was on his camera, Mapu. I saw it. I, did, I know you did it. Anyways, there's a photo right here in the top right-hand corner of Ghost River. It's Geralt. Mapu hard at work. He's just not even giving him the camera time. Wow. Wow. It's okay. I found him now. I just I was so used to earlier in the day there was like only us in the lobby. So I found him really early. Yeah. But obviously for Europe all the other casters come on and they start joining the lobby, so then everyone's like it's harder to find people, so I just had to go a bit further down the list and I just wasn't wasn't ready mm. for it, wasn't expecting it, you know. You know, those other casters missed out. We had some fun games on the Asian region for sure. Definitely some fun StarCraft to start the day off with. Now we are on Europe, though, with a whole lot of best of threes to come. So don't go anywhere. We'll be live for basically the rest of the day, right? That's essentially what it comes down to. This is going to be a good old Protoss versus Zerg, though. A little surprised, actually. Elazer allowed Ghost River to come through the vetoes. Not exactly sure how the pro gamers perceive some of these new maps, but I always kind of feel like Ghost River is a bit of a tricky map for Zerg. You have that very quick rush distance, especially for flying units. So units like an Oracle, like a Prism, can come across the map really quickly. I guess you get your Overlords in as well, but that doesn't really benefit the Zerg quite as much. I feel like the air-to-air -air rush distance is going to benefit Protoss a little bit more. And on top of that, there's just not a lot of bases. So you only have one third base option, for example. If Geralt somehow manages to delay that third base from Elazer, the game gets very messy very fast. The game gets very messy very fast, as we just tell ourselves. A couple of queens and an overlord coming up. And get that uh, ready to rumble. And we just wait to see where we, uh, where we go, what we're going to do. Aprobi checks around. Obviously, PvZ is a very uh, plain matchup for the early stages, right? It's very rare if something really kicks yep. off or anything crazy, although a Twilight oh, Council is that? quick. I mean, that's kind of Geralt, though, you know? He's not always the Stargate guy. He will mix up. He'll go even like DT's Archon drop sometimes when you don't expect him to. So, could be a little bit of an interesting factor as well. As we get this one on the go. Absolutely. Generally speaking, we do see that Stargate opener in this matchup because it's considered to be the best all-round build, but maybe because of the rush distance right here on Ghost River, you can get to your opponent's natural very quickly from your own natural, especially if you decide to knock down the rocks, although I don't think that's really an option. He decided to go for the good old Twilight Council instead. Now, if he wants to go for, for example, Glaives, he really needs to start it up. Yeah, it would be good to get it going ASAP. We'll see what he wants to do. He's got a lot of gas. If he gets the minerals, he might just close yeah. the Dark Shrine straight away. I can say that's not something that uh, we've seen Geralt wow. afraid to do in the past, but he just goes for the Robo straight away. So Robo first, and then the tech choice to be made after. I still think this is a, a DT Shrine. Yeah, it has to be. I don't think you really do anything else, but this is 
or a little suboptimal, it looks like. Well, maybe it's all right now because he I, does spend, I guess, the next 250. Like, you're not really hinging, I guess, on that robo facility so much. Yeah, I think the, the timing of this just works out. It might actually be a bit early yeah. of a prism just for the fact it's fairly close by air anyways. I mm. think uh, generally it's... Yeah, so it looks kind of sloppy to put down the robo facility with like 170 gas, but it probably lines up perfectly. Yeah, exactly. Specifically for this map. Well, a couple of things. I'm going to fight that Adept. Dark Shrine about halfway done. The Robo finishes up. A couple more gates coming through. The lair is building a couple very of quick lair. Yeah, the lair is super Yeah, quick very lair. quick lair. And no third. So this is all, all a little bit funky. Laser opening up with two base Zerg, which rarely happens in modern day StarCraft. He decides to start mining out some of these mineral fields too. So with the lair, he should be able to produce a very quick... Of, uh, I was going to say Observer, but Overseer would be an even better choice. Difficult to... Uh, get one of those observers going here as Zerk, but he should be able to go road speed pretty easily too. I, I think he's all right defending this, and that's going to make this game a little bit awkward here for Geralt, because unless he's in his opponent's face right now before the lair finishes up, I don't think the Dark Templar are going to be able to achieve too much. Yeah, no, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of with you as these uh, few adepts kind of move forward a little bit. The fact that it's just going to be an Overseer soon enough is, is just going to be a huge factor, and a laser is looking to be very safe, playing two base Roach to get set up and to push himself into, like I said, just a very safe opening, and just very difficult for the pros to then do anything against this early on. All right, so already Ghost River. This is why I was a little surprised we saw it. Ghost River apparently is delivering here and changing up the way that the game is usually being played. We have a couple of depths in the main base, a couple of depths in the natural too, just trying to be annoying. And now finally the Dark Templar come up. We do have an Overseer morphing in. I think the Prism yeah, it certainly got spotted there and he saw a bunch of invisible units being warped in. How do you see invisible units? I don't know, dude. It's one of the secrets that Zerk players will not share. He just he just knows, man. He, he can see them yeah. because he just believes in that they are so much. <laughs> As the laser send it, by the way, he has mined out minerals to access the other side of the map. Then his army, I assume, is going to knock down the rocks on this side. And that's our play. This is it. I mean, obviously, the Robo being up now gives you access to Immortals with the Robo Bay finishing. Maybe even a Disruptor comes up quickly here to try and be part of this defense. But the laser absolutely utilizing the map from the very get-go. Showing us just how short a rush distance this can be, and here we go. We are at the front door of the Protoss player, as Geralt have enough to hold on. The first set of battles don't do much, but they weren't really positioned to do anything else anyway, so not too big of a deal. As now we start to work against that wall off, and Laser's doing a great job of getting all of his units within reach of this wall, making sure everything has a chance of firing. These new maps are really delivering, Wardy. We see a lot of creativity right here as both players decide to go for different builds than what we normally see in the current meta of StarCraft 2. The Overseer gets a couple of transfusions, desperately needs it as well, because of course there is still that Dark Shrine down, but I think the Ravager Queen count here is overwhelming. We do have a Disruptor popping out. Okay, grabs only two, I think, Ravagers there in the end, which really isn't that amazing. Sometimes we see an entire uh, bulk of Zerk going down, and I think ultimately, that was do or die, right? There is going to be a second uh, Disruptor coming up in just a moment. First one should have a Nova available once again. The Robo Facility itself, though, ends up going down. And I think with that, this game is going to get harder and harder for Eli or for Geralt, rather, with E-Laser overwhelming the Protoss here. Yeah, hard to really imagine, especially when the wall off is down, right? Because so much of the Protoss defense relies on being able to choke up the opponent and stop what can access but with no wall off here like that just feels impossible that was a heck of a disruptor shot it reached and it took three uh, ravages down was not really expecting that i mean Geralt has to work with just what he's got right now but he's making the most of it the problem is again units can just flood through as they wish there's really no stopping them and that is going to be the problem at the end of the day that is just going to be yeah. so much zerg that keeps on arriving one problem here that the laser is running into is that he's used to think with this push to have a third hatch he hasn't had a third hatch, so he doesn't have that much larvae. He's actually got a lot of money in the bank. He's been remaxing here or reinforcing this, I guess, with tons of Zerklings, but Zerklings take up a lot of your larva production. So he's got quite a bit of money here saved away. Okay, now Roaches are coming up. He's going to be forced to go back home, but I think he's still Geralt that is in a world of trouble because those Roaches are very likely to just all turn into Ravagers and then suddenly that money from Elaser is going to start disappearing. But for now, Geralt is holding and that's mostly because Elaser had a, a bit of a resource problem there. And the resource was not minerals, it wasn't gas, but it was the larva. Decides to go for a Spire? I think you just continue here with Ravagers. Yeah, honestly you can, but at the same time, the Spire, there's no answer to it, right? So... 
So you just get yeah. a bunch of mutas up and you're very gas heavy right now in your bank. I don't or hate you do it. both, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not just send both, I guess, yeah. I was going to say, the fact that right. this creepier is so rough for Geralt as well. Like, you can't do anything oh, properly prison. as the prison goes down. And yeah, Even if he holds this wave off, the, the mutas are death sentence basically at this stage, so. For sure. Ah. The queens do end up getting <laughs> popped, except for one of them somehow managed to survive where the others did not. The Ling Ravager ball here is already enough. And on the back it is, the Mutas are, well, only about a minute or so away from arriving on this side of the map, but I don't think Elaser is going to need it. Very aggressive game number one here. But I think ultimately, it can only be won by the Zerk. I think so too. Cool build. Just uh, seeing the new map in action being put to use right from the very get-go is obviously incredible to see. Uh, love that. And with that, we're going to be heading into a game number two with a laser on that 1 0 advantage. And uh, yeah, I, I do think this is a matchup where Geralt has a shot, but it's definitely a kind of an outward shot. So I guess we'll see what happens yeah. heading into a game two and see if he can make that shot because he clearly came in with like a bit of a different build. Like I say, to me, that's something that Geralt still does. But it's not the kind of the day in and day out norm. And I actually think it's not a terrible build necessarily against a lot of the Zerg pushes because if the Zerg's going to get super aggro and you have DTs, usually that's a defense. It's because the laser's yeah. build was too based lair that it actually ran into the brick wall. Like, it was probably the worst build he could have fought against because he's aggressive, which you are meant to stop with the DTs, but with detection, that's not meant to be there with Zerg aggression that early. So, yeah, I made that a little yeah. bit of a funky one. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So the reason Geralt, I think, went for that build is because of the size of the map. And then he ended up hitting a bit of a brick wall because he laser also because of that same reason decided to go and play a two base zerk opener which is very strange so playing dark templar against the two base zerk with a very quick lair it's just an unfortunate circumstance right like he saw so he tried delaying his opponent's third base and he managed to successfully do it to a point where he laser decided i'm not going to even make the third base anymore there's that weird moment where you kind of want your opponent to take the third base because that makes the build for the protos work way better but you don't really want them to take it when they wanted it to right so it's one of those funky situations where ultimately it's almost like a game of rock paper scissors there obviously you're trying to play it as strategic as possible but yeah the dark templar tech just did very very little very little indeed as we get ourselves set up to rumble into the next one Ready, GLHF, we get this set to go. Geralt and the laser are going to be playing here on Oceanborn. And uh, we'll see if Geralt can indeed take a map back ahead of all the rest of the matches we got coming up. Uh, actually, amazingly, this is after this series, halfway through our day, by the way, guys. So uh, hmm. it's been kind of flying by. Uh, I feel like we've got some less breaks than last time and stuff. And yeah, just zooming through games. So hope you're all having fun. This is the ESL Spring Regionals. I'm going to go back into laser versus Geralt right about now. Game number two. On the bottom right hand side, I'm just uh, I'm just doing my map you check if I go awkwardly silent at the start of the game. <laughs> In the bottom right side, that blue Zerg from Team Liquid, it is a laser. And in the top left hand corner, our Protos, it's Geralt. On a more conventional map this time around, it's going to be Oceanborn. Loving the new map so far, though, especially if we have a little bit of variety as well throughout a series, right? So this is a, a pretty standard macro map. I guess there are some queen marches you can technically go for here. Used to be quite popular when the map was first introduced. Haven't seen it as much as of late. Apparently, Laser, though, a little concerned here for, well, some proxy shenanigans or maybe just a probe that could block it. Sent that drone real early, though. Yeah, he just wanted to know what was up. Patch now goes down and, well... Geralt pops his gate in. I'm very intrigued to see what Geralt goes for game two, because obviously he was not playing the standard in game one. Obviously, this is more of a standard map, so does that mean we just see the Stargate, we just play into the rest of this? I guess we will see. Absolutely. Probe is going to come across the map here relatively late, all things considered. It's not going to be able to achieve all too much, but it is at the very least, it is going to... Well, I guess confirm for Geralt that everything is quite normal. He would like to probably see the Zerg take a third base, though, this time around. Because it's funny, two base openers are... I think Protoss players have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. It's, it's one of those things that you rarely play against because it's not considered to be that good. But then when you do play against it, it's one of those situations where it's also very difficult to figure out exactly what the correct response is, right? So it's a subpar build for, for Zerg at the highest level at the very least, but it at the same time also creates a lot more randomness that Protoss doesn't really enjoy playing against so much. Yep. Very, very true is uh, Cybercourt next is Probe. 
We'll continue up just for the moment. We got ourselves a couple queens on the way. The Lings, the Overlord, continue to come on by. And you just see another Ling popping around, and a probe going to move from the main to the natural. Still scouting. Just wants to know exactly what is up throughout these early stages of the game. Twilight Council once again, Wardy. Interesting. So, I would say nine times out of ten at the pro level. Right now, in the current meta, we see Stargate openers. Oracle into a quick third Nexus is just so powerful. I thought Geralt decided to go for that build in the previous game, specifically because it was on the map Ghost River. I know he's a fan of this opener in general. He's been playing it for years, but to play it as well, twice in a row right here on Oceanborn. I mean, obviously there's a lot of variety too, right? This doesn't necessarily have to be once again, like a robo facility together with a bunch of Dark Templar. Well, there goes the robo facility. It could be Dark Templar once again too. Good indeed. That robot is on its way up, so we'll see what his plan may be. I mean, maybe he just says, hey, look, you know what? I played the worst build possible last time. I actually like this build. Let's just send yeah. it a second time around. Let's just commit. I, I believe in it. I'm going to do it. We'll find out in a sec, because, I mean, as he goes past 100 gas, it pretty much confirms what we're going to be seeing. Mm -hmm. Could be Blink, Wardy. <laughs> Stop blink right now. Crazy That's day. Wild. <laughs> blink and then you harass with like big. two two adepts on the robo while you get the blink ready to go. Yeah, okay. That would be insane. Hey, if, no, if we're doing that, I, I think I, I could make better build orders. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think you just make Zerklings at that point that you'd be totally fine as a Zerk yeah, player. It. But it could feeling. technically be something else. I agree. So he's gonna go for like a three minute and yeah, maybe 50 second-ish, maybe a little bit later than that third Nexus, which really does look like a Stargate opener. So Elazer is scouting around here, and this this all looks like a Stargate opener. You expect the Oracle to arrive on your side of the map right about right now. The only problem is that there is no Stargate, and technically this third Nexus is pretty risky, but I don't think Elazer can really punish it anymore. There's not a whole lot he can do. If he starts up making mass Zerkling right now, I think he will fall against a bunch of DTs. So nice little mind game right there by Geralt. Does end up getting the third Nexus down very early, considering this is a DT opener. Absolutely. Let's just have our dog trying about to finish up the Nexus, the Stalker, all building into play. Roach and the Spores are coming up on the side of a laser and we just wait for... I mean, him to get the, the inside of defend, which is going to happen, right? The Prism's not even across the map just yet. The Stalker will go after the Orbi. The Scout is good. And we're just going to have ourselves... The opportunity now to just say, hey, well, you know what? This is our moment to kind of go and uh, just send it onto the other side. And I think a laser is going to be ready, and that's going to be a sad time for Geralt. Yeah, that being said, though, Geralt does have that nice economy on the back of it, right? So already he's leading as far as the work account goes, and he goes straight into a robo bay as well. All right, Geralt is cooking up some, some fascinating StarCraft over here. Not going for the Oracles, but still finding himself with a quick third Nexus. Not really rushing out the damage here either, but still maneuvering around the map as if he will. Ultimately, just threatening that you're able to do damage may actually already deal damage, if that makes any sense. Like, Elazer has been very much so respecting the potential for his opponent to deal a lot of damage on the other side of the map. But up to this point, Geralt has been playing this pretty passively. Like, technically speaking, Elazer could be sitting at 75 drones right now, and he could be cruising. But instead, he's been... Uh, yeah, he's been respecting his opponent enough here to not just hold down the drone button. Yep, absolutely. As our queens get over there, Prism just going to get chased away. The few depths still on the bottom right. Going to start shading around as the light comes up. The drones are building. More overlords and a roach continue to produce. And get those queens moving out down the low ground. Still a Prism on the bottom side, trying to have a look around, trying to see what is going on. Oh, he gets the council on the fourth hatch. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's, that's actually not bad. Yeah, that's really quite nice here. He's he's going for a speed prism with disruptors on the back of this too, but a lot of blink stalkers. So what a fascinating build here right right now by Geralt. I, I don't think you can really do this kind of this type of build multiple times in a series. I mean, I guess this is technically the second time him doing it, but I think if he does it again, say he wins this game, he does it again in game number three, I think he laser can shut it down pretty hard, but Game number one was so wild that Geralt decided to bring it back again. He didn't really get to show his, f like, full plan, I suppose, but I'm, I'm really liking this here for Geralt. Yeah, I mean, I'm into it, man. This uh, prison speed still coming up, plus one attack and blink continue through. So we get all of that on the go. So the prison here is going to take a few more shots. The TT is going to get active, and the queens will help to push it away. I mean, anything you can do, just slow down and make use of your DTs. Interesting that he keeps them as DTs, right, rather than being like, hey, let's get the Archons going or anything along that line. Because usually yeah. that's the line of thinking. You get the Archons out, you start trading. Geralt yeah, believes in leaving these couple of DTs. Usually, I guess, with Archons, you want to go up to four DTs. So you have, you know, two Archons. That there might be this go. moment now after he tries to get this cancel. 
He's trying to go for another council right now. We do have a bunch of adepts. Not target firing down the drones, but he is going to get the kill. Not a council, but a kill on another hatchery. And really, now finally is when we shoot. Ooh, where's the prism? Hello. I was going to say we should see the disruptor drops. That would be a massive blunder, losing those units for free. Where was the prism? You guys were supposed was, to be inside yeah. of that plane. It was on the right side with the DT slash Alcons, right? So... Yeah, he finished just... Graphitic Drive, by the way, like a minute ago. It's been it's been a while. Yeah, been a hot second and setting up. And a laser is uh, 65 drones, obviously no fourth phase. It means it's not really worth going a bit beyond that just yet. He's on his way to that Lurker Den, but I'm not sure he's really got the economy to kind of boom into those Lurkers like he wants to, especially with this amount of Disruptors already up and available. The first wave of Lurkers is not going to be an unmanageable kind of situation on the side of the Protoss, so might be a factor. Hmm. It's a very strange build right here from Geralt, and he's not really achieving anything with his damage. But at the same time, he's also managed to get himself ahead economically every single time, which makes this very cool. Now, this oh. <laughs> could have been an issue. I was going to say it's... An, it, no, it's not an issue. <laughs> that was really close. Absolutely clutch that was, as uh, the lanes even backed off for a second before they went for it. They might have made the difference. Hey, these Archons, though, they're getting active, so finally the Archon drop comes through. It is going to deliver a few drones Lovely. already, and we're going to get even more. Geralt is just farming over here. You need to see how well this game is going in the supply as well, because he is up 20 supply when you really shouldn't be as a Protoss player. This is a laser losing that fourth base a couple times over has absolutely just crippled him throughout this game so far, and now he's struggling to get back on his feet. Yeah, it's going to be, I guess, Lurker drops right now for Elazer, and that is... I'm saying it a little hesitantly because it's such a weird thing to do, and it feels like almost like a desperation move. I think Elazer is reading this game correctly. Everything's been going really well here for the Protoss, who's all the way up to 87 probes, by the way, which is a ton. He's adding on additional gateways. He's going to go all the way up to 10. He's going into the Templar Archives, too, so he's ready to start really piling on the pressure and just warp in unit after unit after unit. That Prism has got the speed boost, so he says goodbye as he zaps into the main base. Well, if you get shot down, this push already from Geralt is looking good with the Disruptors available, like I said before. The first round of Lurkers does not seem that scary because he can kind of blast through them. They don't even have their range upgrade yet. At the moment, Geralt will get halted, but he's got so much money to spend. 1,400, 1,400. He spends 800 minerals on Zealots. Started a second robot facility. He's just got the Temple Archives to potentially upgrade Storm from as well. I mean, the, the options to spend his money are there. He just needs to get around to spending it. So he decides to double down on Robotech, which is a bit interesting. I feel like a lot of Protoss right now would take this as an opportunity where they have the Zerg pinned back to go into Skytals instead. But Geralt is saying, no, that's not what we're doing. In the meantime, though, Elazer may finally find a bit of an opportunity to put on a bit of pressure on the Protoss, because so far it's, been, it's just been defensive play for a long while. So he's, well, trying to do a Lurker drop, but there's already a, uh, a Photon Cannon there as a detector. But apparently this section over here is out of range, so we do have a couple of Novas connecting. Yep, Nova's getting through, delivering a little bit as we just have ourselves a Ling still jumping onto Stalkers, chasing down Disruptors. Lings really will go, and they will pick off that Disruptor as well. That's seven probes going down, by the way, with the Lurker drop on the natural. I love that. A laser making something happen here to find some value, and he kind of needed to get something going, and that is going to help. So, hmm, I haven't liked the main engagements very much for Geralt. He's had a million and one gas in the bank for a while, but no real plan of spending it. And then he took the gases over here up north, too. I kind of feel like most of the time when we see this mass gateway style, it's very aggressive with loads of units being warped in and far less gas. Obviously, Archons are really nice here, and they basically counter every unit that Zerg currently has, but you're going to need a lot of warp-ins, and suddenly Elazer is knocking on the front door of the natural expansion. Geralt has looked really solid in the first section of this game, but suddenly, I mean, Elazer didn't take crippling amounts of damage. Suddenly, Elazer is all over this. You give the man a, a, a finger, he will grab the entire hand. Elazer is starting to overwhelm. He is everywhere, and he's just started to play a little faster than Geralt can seemingly handle. Loved where Geralt was at, I feel like Geralt was in the better position. DT's <laughs> about to show up, though. We are going to need some detection in return. We are not getting it. That was just splash damage as we're actually going to reborrow these Lurkers, <laughs> but they are just going to die the DTs Sick. on the cleanup. Well, yeah, you kind of need detection, bro. The Dark Templar uh, putting in so much work that our Lurkers wanted to run, but they ran into a bunch of Stalkers. That exchange was actually not bad there for Geralt in the end, but there was no way he planned for that, right? Like, that was so sketchy for him. Recalls a bunch of units up north, grabs those Lurkers, okay. 
Whew, I think he can breathe again. That being said, though, no, Elazer has knocked the front door open. Is there a unit in the wall off in the natural expansion? There is not, and Lynx are running in. Yep, again, it's Chaos that Elazer is looking to really pursue right now because Chaos is where he can probably do the best with the least amount of units, and he did not really have much of a rebuild following that cleanup, so his supply is struggling and it is going to be a bigger fight. On the other side of the map, we see the Zelds, the Archons, the Stalkers Ooh. pushing through the Lurkers. Initially, do not do great, but then they start to hold their own. Now the units from the other side, we're going to re-engage through this, and it looks as though we are good to go play cleanup as the Archons, though, still have to walk a long way through Lurker shots to get there. And it's actually yeah. going to be good enough for now for a laser to survive this. Trying to catch these few Archons. We are going to get the kill on everything. So Geralt gets completely wiped himself. And a laser will very much so stay alive. <laughs> wow. Yeah, these are very close battles. Like, ultimately, that was the laser holding there. But it's one of those situations where if you, if you run that simulation a dozen times, right? Like, there's a good chance that... Zerk will actually get overwhelmed a couple of times. You really need those Lurker shots to line up properly. And I guess luckily for Elazer, most of that fight took place on Creep. Uh, a lot of those Archons, they really came from, from way in the back, right? Technically speaking, I think the number of units that Geralt had right there was enough, but they just came in from so far. And then the reinforcing Zerklings allowed Elazer to stabilize. Geralt, by the way, still with a 10 worker advantage at this point. Yep. Up 10 workers, just gonna be seeing these few Hydras. Playing away, we've got the lurkers looking good. Then this is this is amazing. Yeah. Just the positions, and the problem is the archons can't really fight well against lurkers because they just gotta walk so far before they can shoot them. So they take too much damage in that process. And now a laser is once again pinging back across the map and looking good. A ling drop is getting chased away and will go down without much else happening. But we've denied the fifth base, and these lurkers might just go again. The secret this time might be just having detection in case DTs try and clean them up. If we have that, <laughs> we might be golden. <laughs> Having vision indeed is very handy. Now, so far, he doesn't have it for this particular army just yet. There are, however, so many lurkers. Disruptors are coming. There is an overseer as well. Disruptors are really the only ground unit that feels good in this instance. I mean, technically, Geralt could pull the switch and decide to just go and, and fight this with his Archon Immortal Ball, but it would be so risky. Those lurkers have so much hit points. You do need a second Nova as well to shut all of it down. Elazer is inviting him in, but... Ultimately, he decides to start knocking here with the Zerklings and the Hydras. Maybe a little overzealous, but now that fourth Nexus is in a world of trouble as well. It's gonna fall, and with that, I think that Geralt has to commit to an all-in. Problem is, he's got a ground-based army against, well, one of the best anti-ground units in the game. I guess Disruptors are decent, but when the Lurkers are this spread out, for example, good luck trying to kill them. Yeah, and they even just dodge away from that shot as well. Uh, I was honestly thinking, like, I was with you with that overzealous kind of engage with the Ling Hydra, but he knocked down a Disruptor with it and then got an Archon too. I was like, man, he actually got tech units, only lost Ling, so even that wasn't so bad. He'll fight out down to the south from this position. It's just going to be a couple of Zealots and Stalkers still, still getting cleaned up. And as Geralt is just bleeding units. And of course, now Geralt has this issue of, hey, I've got a bunch of pros, but I can't even really use them. He walks into the Lurk, he's not expecting them to still be there. That means he can disrupt her towards them, but he doesn't even get a kill. Just one connection on one of the Lurkers is not exactly going to get it done. The one thing I would love to see from Elazer right now is like a Viper or two. Abducting those Disruptors. I mean, without the Disruptors, this army of the Protoss is absolute toast. And he fires up four of them. Thank you very much, Elazer, for making me look smart. Appreciate that. Um, he's going to morph the Lurkers, though, and just move them ever so slightly forward. Ah, this is tough. Elazer is starting to overwhelm the Natural a second time as well. Again, diving very deep, but he realizes <laughs> that the Protoss' economy has been nowhere to be seen for a while. We had a lot of dead units there covering our camera for just a moment. Battery overcharge helping out, but I don't think there's enough. Well, I, I think they hit us in the face, man. We <laughs> got a little bit of a yeah. jump scare. As you knock down a disruptor, <laughs> we knock down the rest of these immortals. You're right. I don't think this is going to be enough at all from Geralt. This has been a little bit of a while coming. I feel like he's been unable to really answer this force of a laser for a couple of minutes. But again, he's had his moments in this series. Mm -hmm. I feel like Geralt missed the opportunity to tie this one up because it felt doable, right? It felt yes. like a winnable situation for sure. GG's, and that is going to mean that we are going to be at 2 0 for a laser. So he knocks this series down he wraps it up and he moves to that one and no position in swiss Geralt will be out down into that zero and one setup so again a little bit of a ditch to call out of but definitely not the end of the world there's a long way to go in this tournament five rounds of swiss you get three losses and you're out or three wins send you to the playoffs and uh mm -hmm. that's obviously uh always very important note so yeah that's where we're at and the laser picking up that victory
I think strategically, Geralt played that game really well. I actually think he was at a very substantial lead until suddenly Elazer decided to pick up the pace, right? So Elazer decided, you know what? I'm going to use my like 500 actions per minute to start overwhelming you everywhere. And a lot of those fights take far less attention for the Zerg to execute than they take for the Protoss player to, for example, defend, right? If you want to defend against Lurkers, I mean, the Zerg just burrows the Lurkers and the Protoss has to keep their eyes on it, make sure that the Disruptors go into the right direction. It's quite tricky. And suddenly, I think uh, he was uh, just a little overwhelmed. He had all of the tools there to defend against that Zerg push. I think he was in a really good position, but ultimately those main engagements didn't quite go so well. But really cool opener right there from Geralt, though. Playing a lot of mind games there, not even really dealing damage. So he went for like Dark Templar into Archon drops into... What was it? There were some Disruptor drops in there too, and he killed yeah. like no workers, but was still economically ahead. Like strategically, it was really clever, but I think he just got outpaced a little bit in the mid game. Well, here is where the schedule stands, of course. There are a couple matches down here in Europe. Elazer gets that 2-0 over Geralt, and he gets that little blue dot next to his name. That means he has got a win out of these five Swiss rounds they play. So three blue dots, you advance. Three red dots, you're out. And Geralt has one of those by his name. As you can see from the schedule, Clem versus Milky Cow is up next, and then Spirit Battle Strange before we move into the second half of Europe today. So plenty of StarCraft to come. Do not go anywhere, will once again just be three or four minutes when we return. It is more StarCraft 2 action with Clem taking on Milky Cow.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back once again, everybody, as we are ready. Guess what? For more StarCraft 2. I feel like I'm ready to say that for the next four weeks. We are going to be <laughs> here for four weeks of regional action. I think this is the first regional season where every single match is going to be on the mainstream. It's, uh, mm. There's no B stream. There's no C stream as far as I'm aware. I think everything happens on the mainstream. And we're just going to be go, go, go. And like I say, Sunday, there's something like 16 best of threes. There's like eight from Asia, eight from America. It's a, it's a wild, wild time to be watching StarCraft. There's loads of cool matches, loads of different players in this fun Swiss format that we have as we're heading into. A fun one here, Atlanta champion in Clem takes on the challenger Milky Cow, who's been a hopeful Russian Terran player for a while now, but has never really had a bigger result. And is definitely going to be a little bit outclassed here, most likely, Loco. I definitely agree with you. I think uh, going into this entire tournament, Mr. Clem is a, one of the favorites to win the entire thing. So we'll have to find out together exactly how much of a fight the man right here in the bottom left -hand corner of Amphion can put on. He is Milky Cow. Rapid Team Liquid in the upper left looking to claim yet another European title. And what a time to do it, you know, Serral isn't playing, Reyna is in Korea. Yeah. This really, yeah, he is the favorite in my eyes from the yeah. very start of this season. It's Clem in the upper left-hand side. You know what? We find ourselves on a map we haven't seen yet today. Good old Amphion. Every single map is having its place right now in the current, well, best of three format. Especially, you know, like whenever we, we have a, a season that goes on for a little while and we don't really have a map pool update in some time. Usually the best of threes, they get narrowed down to the same three maps, right? At some point, everybody's like, okay, these maps are the best. This is what we prefer playing on. But right now we're in that exciting phase of StarCraft 2 where every map seems to be viable, right? We just see everybody playing every map right now, or at least I'm sure the programmers have different different uh, preferences, but I mean, it's exciting to see that even the stranger maps, like for example, this one, do get played. Yep, absolutely. As a uh, SCV comes out through the middle of the map here, well, it's just gonna be on its way. It's gonna have ourselves a Rax, the SCV is coming through, Reaper and an Orbital already coming up from Clem as well as Milky Cow will match him. And I guess the big difference is that Clem just wants to scout, whereas Milky Cow's happy taking the risk not scouting. He's clearly the player who's like, well, I, I have less to lose, right? So I'll just take the risk of not yeah. scouting. Don't think Clem's going to proxy me. Clem has to check. Hey, is there a ba barracks in your base? Cool. Now I'm a little bit more aware of what's up. He's on his way to a factory early as well anyway. And this factory should lead them both to an expansion, as I believe we've pulled out a gas on both sides. So a little bit more gas mining for Milky Cow than Clem, but only just. Yeah, how in the world do you beat Clem? I've had a look at a lot of Clem games over the last few months, and Clem is just looking ridiculously good. Micro and macro-wise, the man is rock solid. Once upon a time, we could sort of criticize, I guess, his defensive play, but he really worked on that. Especially, like, for example, Terran versus Zerg over the course of the last year. This is going to be a tough match for Milky Cow. I think cutting 17 corners may just be the way to do it, you know? For example, skipping the scouting right there and trying to just play a greedy game. I mean, this might be a... A little bit risky, but he is going to be able to grab that expansion here. But it's so it's so difficult. Uh, you're, you're going to have to either just throw a curveball and catch Clem off guard, which is really difficult to do. Or I guess you just try to play the same build and play it super greedy and, well, cross your fingers and hope it's going to work. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, you just... TVT is a tough one as well because right now you've got so many of these Cyclone builds that help the opponent control the game. And if Clem just opens like that... It's so tough for Milky Cow to really out micro him in that position, and then there's not a lot that basic kind of just Cyclone builds kind of straight up lose to. You see a couple of Hellions being reacted at the moment from Milky Cow, so that'll be interesting to see where he takes it from there. As Clem is about to finish up his reactor, he's got another Cyclone building. And as the Tech Lab finishes for Milky Cow, what are we doing? What are we putting on that? Most likely the starport, or maybe the factory swaps there. So the factory is going to swap on over there, so an early tank perhaps. And then a medevac to go pushing across the map with? Question mark? Yeah, there are, of course, some cheeky siege tank positions on this particular map. There indeed is the Medivac fired up for Milky Cow, who is going to need a little bit of supply. I think he just created it. Um, that command center will finish up and will prevent the supply block here, ultimately. There are some cheeky positions on this map, I guess, on Amphion, where you can hide your siege tank behind that mineral wall. Now we do see a few units diving deep, though. And ultimately, no damage done there by Milky Cow. Clem grabs one of his opponent's units for essentially free. Now... The thing about a lot of these siege tank positions is that you can almost sort of ignore them. They're really scary, 
if you decide to push into them but there's a lot of those a lot of those siege tank spots that you don't really have to consider that much yeah it's scary that your opponent is parked behind for example these mineral fields but you don't really have to go out there and fight nope not really as uh, clown ties into this main base by the way he's gonna get some stvs already so these cyclones are gonna have a good time only a couple of workers honestly not so bad all things considered we're gonna lock onto that tank but obviously the medevac will micro right back so it's safe uh, Clem's just going to boost across. He can go to the natural, maybe get kills there. He's going to drop to the other side of this mineral line. That works as well for one more kill. Kind of get two, but not quite going to make it. Now there's a Viking, and now Clem has to make a real run for it. Yeah. Losing a Medivac with two of these expensive units inside of it would be a disaster. Luckily, the Medivac boost is once again available as Clem is making the transition towards the good old Raven. He's going to need to research that interference matrix as well. Not a little supply block right here for Milky Cow, and this one is a lot more substantial. I think for that first Medivac of his, he like ended up canceling an SCV that was building or something. But these are the types of mistakes hitting a big supply block right now that you cannot afford ever against somebody of Clem's caliber. He decides to just cancel everything and go for another command center fair enough but uh, that's that's dangerous yeah a little hellion drop here clems on top of it gets there to deal with it very easily a little bit of scv lost mine time but that will be all i mean i like that milky cow gives it a go but you can already see the differences in the map for as well 40 to 35 workers so clem taking advantage there and clem gonna add another factory down so he is gonna be sending it into the mech here on amphion which is becoming a pretty popular <laughs> way to play it because it's kind of this left side of the map you play from there it's very easy to take base by base and defend it with mechs, so it doesn't give the bio player a lot of opportunities to drop you or to attack you or to find ways around. So, uh, yeah, it may seem weird to see Clem play a mech, but this is something he does now and again. It's going to be something he tries to utilize here on Amphion. Uh, that's yep. nice. <laughs> I think this is indeed a very map-specific choice. Now, that was kind of cute. Grabs a bunch of those SCVs, but loses the medevac and one of the Hellions in the process. And now that, uh, that one Hellion on the left side of the map, unless there's a medevac coming for the rescue, is sort of stuck there. There is no way out. You need to either mine out the mineral fields or destroy the rocks. Uh, I think that will happen before too long, but that's probably not the direction that that Hellion really wants to be going into. Nope, not quite. It's just going to be seeing our uh, medevac loading up. A couple cyclones come out to the left. Just going to be dropping down there. As we have again a couple of tanks, a couple of Vikings, all continuing through for the moment. And we just continue to get set up. Interesting, really, though, to see Clem playing mech, right? Because that is not the type of style you really associate with Clem whatsoever. Bring in a little bit of variety here, a little bit of spice as well. I like it. On this map, yeah, you already mentioned it. Those left side bases, you can just sort of grab them one at a time. I guess technically Milky Cow can outpace his opponent with expanding. Nice grab right there as well, by the way, on the Viking. Not bad whatsoever, but... Yeah, it's, it's dangerous. So I, I don't think Milky Cow at this point quite realizes it yet, right? Like, I don't think he realizes that he's going up against Mech. Nope, the scouting just isn't quite... I mean, was he, I mean, at any point really able to see it? Not really. No. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough for Milky Cow right now, that's for sure. He's uh, on his way to that bio play. He's building just Marines, no Marauders on the way, which are obviously pretty useful against Mech as well a lot of the time. And, uh, yeah, Clem is going to be the one scanning about, seeing the third base of his opponent, already seen again different expansion patterns. The triangle base is so much easier to defend in TVT, because obviously you don't mm -hmm. want to kind of deal with drops, right? So by expanding to the triangle, you protect the main base drop, or the drops that head into the main base from the south. So it just is a very nice layout to actually defend from, and even seen some crazy games where players try then try to expand to the 9 o'clock next, so that's obviously kind of in the middle of the map, but they're like, yeah, what, whatever, man, I yeah. can get here the moment it's going to be a depot there I think for it's who's pushing. Yeah, if you, if you go for a mech, I think actually taking a 9 o'clock base here after that triangle third is pretty safe. He goes double armory right now too. Didn't he already have one? No, I, I thought I saw one on the production tab earlier. But anyways, he's going to go for a big push over here. One of the siege tanks in red that does get shut down and suddenly yeah, all of those tanks in blue are firing Yo. at that orbital command. It's certainly going to have to take off, but now suddenly you're fighting against those Vikings that were hiding underneath all of those ravens. Yep, the SCVs come across. They will be able to repair this and keep this alive, but obviously this is not looking too pretty. There is Matrixes available, so you can actually push further forwards here with the tanks as Clem. That's obviously a big deal as well as that uh, Orbital tries to land elsewhere, but this is already looking rough for Milky Cow. In full retreat mode, definitely not where he wants to be. I mean, obviously without a third base in position, it's going to be tough, and Clem just pushing up into these tanks. Great, you know, one Matrix at a time, you can take out a tank, and there's a little counter drop for Milky Cow, but I'd be very shocked if Clem wasn't prepared to deal with the drop across the map because it's got to be something of an assumption and there uh, you see already the couple medivacs getting jumped on this is not going to go anywhere 
Nope, not at all. He also flew straight in through the sensor tower there, so Clem saw it coming in from a mile away. He's winning the fight over here at the front too, it seems like. Now, finally though, there's a little bit of retaliation. Milky Cow shutting down his opponent's siege tanks, but he simply does not have enough. Clem makes it look easy in game number one, playing a style that we rarely see him play. Yeah, I just played the mech, right? And then it didn't even really come down to playing mech. I think he could have played bio no. and done a very similar thing. Um, the mech just gave him map control, so he was even more easily able to kind of just go across with, like, the air units and just be like, cool, okay, here I am, wandering across and having a good time. I think that uh, had a lot to say. So, Clem is going to get a win against Milky Cow to start off with. We'll see if Milky Cow can bounce back heading into a game two. Get that sorted out in just a second here, so get that figured out. I'll be off and away into the second game as, I mean, Clem's a favorite, right? We're expecting him to go very far in this event. No surprise to see him opening strong against Milky Cow, who's a player who's struggled to make playoffs in this tournament in the past. Yeah, I think pretty much everybody's pretty sad to see Serral not participating in this tournament right now because he has to go and do his military service. But I think the one player out there that's pretty excited about it all would probably be Clem. When you ask him straight up, people probably say no. I like the competition, but I can imagine secretly. Yeah, Clem feels like this is his tournament to win now. Yep. Are we ready yet? Still a couple of good players, though, of course, but... Uh, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I mean, even in the past, he could already win against Serro and TVZ. Well, it isn't unheard of. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, that's the thing. It's not that Clem needs Serral to be gone or Reynor and Korea to do well. No. It's just that he was already in a great position to win this event anyways. Now he's in an even better position to win this event because his two greatest challenges are gone. Can Clem lose in a TVT? Yeah, of course he can. Has he improved his TBT? Yes. Is he more resilient there? Absolutely. He's been really good against Showtime the last couple of times. I've seen those two guys play against one another as well. Like, yeah. yes, there's players that can beat Clem. There's ways Clem can lose, but, like, there's no way he's not the favorite, you know? Uh, he is. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's... Uh... Obviously, pro gamers can always have an off day, right? But this is Clem. I mean, he's very good offline, too, but online he's always been a star. Uh, yeah, I really do believe that this is going to be... Uh... The favorite going up against somebody who is, well, strong, but probably not quite at Clem's level. Yeah. All right, well, we get into map number two. In the bottom left-hand side, the blue Terran player. This is going to be from Team Liquid. It is Clem. And his opponent in the top right with the red SCVs. He goes by the name of Milky Cow. Still one of my favorite usernames, by the way. Milky Cow. Could have gone with any animal. Decided to go with Milky Cow. Could have been Milky Goat. I'm just saying, Wordy. I, I mean, you say any animal. I feel like there's some animals that are not milky. <laughs> if you actually look at his Liquipedia page, he's got about a dozen usernames that he experimented with once upon a time. They're actually oh, pretty really? funny, but... Any uh, there are a lot of milk-related usernames, yeah. They're all milk-related? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Really? Okay. We do have a proxy barracks, by the way, coming up right here for Milky Cow. Uh, that's cool. I'm going to look at his names. <laughs> Cow lo cows love milk. <laughs> I don't know if they do. <laughs> Milky Kekek. <-kek. laughs> Skilky Cow. <laughs> Milky Winky. <laughs> okay. That was some good ones Milky Winky. There you go. <laughs> Hey, it's a double proxy barracks over here for Milky Cow, so let's see if he can maybe make some work out of that. Clem at this point doesn't realize what he's playing with, or what he's playing against. So this could certainly be the edge that Milky Cow is looking for, and there is going to be a supply depot over here trying to block off at least part of that uh, that jump-off spot. Yep. Let's just have ourselves the uh, river coming out. I mean, the thing for Clem is it's double gas, so even though he doesn't SCV scout, he's already playing it fairly safely. We'll just see what he does with the Reaper, because the one thing you don't want to do is to get overly kind of involved with that Reaper and to kind of send it somewhere when you kind of need it. So uh, that's one thing to watch for as we get second depot over home from Milky Cow in his first Reapers. Because he's not being scouted, he'll wait for two Reapers at the same time, so he'll not go straight away. Now he's going to get scouted. Now he's going to try and start making something happen. His clan will take an extra shot there, two shots. So uh, we'll fall back, but obviously now the high ground and an SCV to help him. Clem knows what's up, and Clem will start to play properly against it, I imagine. Absolutely. Factory is going to finish up in a moment. We should see some Hellion production from it, and that's going to make defense much easier. So Milky Cow is on a bit of a timer, building his own factory at home, but he needs to justify building two barracks on the other side of the map. Okay, one Reaper pops out of the barracks. He wanted to grab it. Okay, good control right there. 
actually from both players Ooh. to think that the Reaper, there you go, is gonna end up going down, but he gets a Reaper in return as well with those SCVs, putting in a bit of damage as well. Yeah, he finished off the low HP one, but the SCV is helping to get the kill, and that is a big deal as now the Reaper's on the other side. That's not a good jumper because the hell he can reach, no. and that's a second Reaper lost. That's already a big deal. Early game, Milky Cow is not quite doing what you want to with this proxy. Command Center sets up, factory finishing. We get ourselves continuation here as a Reaper of Milky Cow heads back to the upper right. Yeah, no, you're gonna have to fly those, uh, those barracks back home, or at the very least, use them for scouting. It's... A little bit of, I mean, it's going to be nice, right? It's something you can still continue getting vision with, but the damage hasn't really been dealt, and this is Clem surviving and now getting a slight edge. It's nothing really to write home about. It's nothing amazing, but you really want to try and prevent falling behind against people, for example, Clem's Caliber. So maybe you can try and lend it. Hey, you can actually steal those in StarCraft 2. Fun fact, I can imagine there's a lot of people that have never seen that before. Technically, those are neutral. And obviously, Clem is going to be stealing it back here in a moment as soon as that thing is gone, but... It did actually temporarily switch sides, plus it actually does grant him vision if Clem does not grab it back. Yeah, uh, once they lift off, it will be Milky Cow's reactor for the foreseeable future, as we will just get rid of this uh, barracks, and that means the reactor is going to be... Uh... Well, this is awkward, because now Clem has to make sure to not actually attack, move in his base, because otherwise yes. he'll hit the reactor. So he has to actually be very careful with how he targets things, because it's an enemy unit or an enemy structure until his own structure lands on it again, which is going to be now, but... <laughs> Actually, very funky little uh, situation right there. It's something that rarely happens. It's actually really fun. But there you go. Yeah, he was just... He wasn't even attack moving there. He just sent his units into the main base and they arrived in location and saw an enemy unit, so they automatically started firing. Anyways, all is safe right now here for Clem, but cheeky little move there from Milky Cow. Who grabs both of those Reapers? Yeah, nice to clean those out. Just a little bit less to worry about. How often do you see the two Reapers showing up a minute from now and they get two or three workers? That's now not a factor. Oh, this is a big deal. The Cyclones both lock onto Hellions, which means that now you don't have lock-ons available. Okay, Clan just locked onto SCVs, so that's going to undo that kind of factor I was talking about. He instantly lifts back up, though. Good micro. The fact he has a medevac is very OP in this battle at the moment. He's already netted one Cyclone kill without losing anything. He's actually going to lock on again here, looking for a little extra. We do have the repairs. Clem! Oh, oh, oh disgusting. <laughs> Absolutely disgusting. What is that? He gets away with everything. That is one of those things where you look at it and you're like, okay, I'm going to give that a try in my own games, and then you end up losing the Metafix with both, <laughs> with both of the Cyclones inside of it. And you're like, okay, yeah, no. That was suboptimal to say the least. Incredible value right there from our Terran player in blue. Well, that is absolutely something a little crazy. Let's just have ourselves a factory coming up here on the side of Clem. And, uh, yeah, we see where he's going for round two. He's just going to mech it up once again and uh, just maybe try and set up three base and just go for a big push once more because he's already netted himself a similar lead to last time, that five worker advantage or so. Absolutely. So what do you do now if you're Milky Cow? He needs to try and play the survival game, but he's going up against a mecking Terran once more. The previous game, Clem didn't even really need mech. Now he's in an even better position than he was last time around. No, he does have himself an engineering bay over here. Yep. Maybe the uh, factory is going to swap on over. So I'm just going to make a little bit of a move. And Raven Cyclones moving up at the top. We've got a couple of Cyclones here in the main base. are going to get a lock onto the Viking. That clears the pathway for escape. So that works out really well for Clem. And he's going to knock a bunker down at the front. He's got Ravens here too. This natural mineral line wow. is not looking pretty. As we can obviously drop Auto Turrets to help fight against Cyclones. Now Auto Turrets drop on the other side. But we've already lost 12 SCVs. Okay, man. I Killed mean, a Raven too, by yeah, the way. Like that Raven is so worthwhile. Medivac harassment in the main base in the meantime continues. All right. Clem is now just styling. Yeah, this is uh, this is kind of a big deal. As just see a couple more Vikings coming through the factory. Continue to pop out some tanks. Cyclones are still going to go after a depot, but I mean, this really does not look great as our uh, Cyclones lock on again. Vikings continue through. The tank is halfway done. I mean, Clams is going to be ready to push, no? It's time to send it. Yeah. The amount of value you can get out of StarCraft II units when your micro is really good is actually insane. It's one of those things where... In theory, you understand how it works, right? But if you actually try to execute it, it's so difficult to make it work properly. Clem really doesn't need to take those chances anymore at this point in the game. I think what you do is just save up a bunch of units and go for an attack. Stimpak and Combat Shields are miles away from finishing, so Milky Cow is not going to hit a power spike on his bio army for a very long time. 
I think this is a perfect opportunity for Clem to just, yeah, send across the map everything that he's got. There's no medevac available for Milky Cow to really put on pressure. There's no way he's going to send that one raven that he's got towards the other side too, or he's got two ravens right now. I mean, there, there's no way he's going to be sending those, right? So he's going to need them for base defense, but he just does not have the amount of units here. Clem is moving forward, looking absolutely dominant here in game number two. And he ends up obtaining what looked like an easy 2-0 win. Yeah, really kind of, I guess, what we expect at the end of the day, right? Clem is the Atlanta champion. He is definitely the player who is, you know, been looking great as of late. He always has been. He always does. Um, and he comes in here and he does just look extremely convincing against Milky Cow, which means that he gets himself onto that uh, winner's circle. That's obviously a big deal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's obviously a, a good one to see. So that is some good news for Clem. Gets himself that victory as we are going to get ourselves ready to go into a little bit more action, believe it or not, once again, guys, we get more SD2. Uh, up next is actually going to be Spirit Against Strange, which can be actually kind of a funky one. So we'll get that ready. We'll come back. More StarCraft 2 is on the horizon with that TV.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back once again, everybody, as we are here in the European region of the ESL SC2 Masters Regional Spring. As we have Spirit against Strange coming up next to uh, TVP, where again, Spirit is maybe the more accomplished player, but Strange is absolutely capable of taking a series here and there. I mean, this this one is closer than many might expect. 13 to 7 in historic match score, which suggests Strange really does have a fairly decent chance that, you know, 33% of the time he mm -hmm. gets a win. So, really not a bad opportunity here. As we get ready to go into this TVP, I think we're all excited for Spirit, but Strange could throw a curveball in the way. Yeah, most of the wins, though, that Strange has had over the years are historically... A long time ago. So the last 10 series that these two played against each other, it's actually been Spirit who came out ahead. So I didn't think Spirit is going to be the overwhelming favorite going into this, but I mean, it is certainly possible. It's just that, you know, <laughs> there's been a lot of two ones, I guess, you know, so that that's nice and all, but it is certainly an uphill battle right here for Strange. Well, with that all uh, noted, we're going to be kicking it off into this TVP. It is Alcyone for our opening map of this series. So we're going to get this party started and see what it's all about. And as we hop on in to, as I say, Alcyone, and into the bottom left-hand corner of it all, with the blue Terran player representing Na'Vi, this is Spirit. His opponent, all the way in the upper right, or upper right-hand corner, rather, playing with the red protos pieces, it's strange. It's actually quite interesting. If you look at the historical results, they really have had a lot of two ones. So Strange must have been on the cusp of winning a lot of them, but ultimately it's been since 2018 that he last won against Spirit in a series. A mm. long while ago. Yeah, that is a, uh, a long way back. I think Strange was very good back then. I feel like he peaked a little bit more recently and then there was a season of this uh, of these regionals where he didn't qualify, and it was such a shock. And I remember Roddy was talking about it, and he was like, man, it's like, it's crazy, because Strange is the kind of guy who, if you're playing on the EU ladder, you know he's top 32 in Europe. It's not even a question. But that's just how brutal yeah. Europe can be. He missed the qualification. He didn't get through. He missed out on a season, and that made a lot of people kind of sleep on Strange, but I feel like he has been coming back with a bit of a vengeance. We'll see if he can get the upset. It would be an upset if he was to take down Spirit. We'll see if he can get it done. Spirit has been so consistent over the last uh, few years, of course. It's one of the things that he's greatly improved on, and he's very happy to play any kind of a game, a more aggressive game. He's happy to play it longer if he needs to. He can really play in all sorts of different manners. No, you're absolutely right there. Spirit really is one of the best Terran players from the European region. Strange, though, certainly always very highly ranked on the ladder, right? Like, he's always been very good for a very long time, but making that step to actually beating the top-level Grandmasters is uh, quite a significant one. Either way, we'll find out together here exactly what ended up going down, or what is gonna go down right here between these two. We do have a cheeky little Engineering Bay block. Yeah, Engineering Bay block already just sort of seemed to strange, I think, is like... Hey, I don't want you to mess around. Like, I'm going to control the pace of this game. I'm going to be like, hey, you can expand here. You can expand that. You know, basically, Spirit says, I want to be in control of this. I want to be the one who is absolutely aware of what's going on. And uh, mm -hmm. Engineering Bay Block does that. It keeps the unit home. It delays that initial expansion. It just gives you a bit of control and an idea of what's going on early as the Terran. Absolutely. So Spirit is going to just open up pretty normal here, right? Other than that Engineering Bay Block. Pretty common strategy. Gonna start just checking around the map, see exactly what's going on, confirm whether or not a Nexus was actually built. It'll be a Twilight Council opener right here from Strange. So broadly speaking in the matchup right now, we see a lot of Stargate openers, but also of course a lot of Twilight Council openers. Uh, this should just be straight into good old Blink. But when your expansion gets blocked right there, it's, it is quite tricky, right? To decide if you want to say, for example, go for like a four gate Blink push. That would be very committed. Yep. Could be the kind of aggro that he wants, though. Get off to, like, a good start or so, and Reaper gets an immediate scout on the Twilight. So that's great. You get in, you scout, you get out. So the Reaper can still be used for more information later. It doesn't really get too much better than that, honestly. Absolutely. Hallucination scout over here is going to confirm exactly what is going on. Additional barracks have been scouted. There is a, uh, a star port on the back of this as well. I don't think this can really be much of a surprise, but getting any, any of that... Uh, yeah, confirmation is always extremely nice here for the Protoss player. Just know that everything is A-OK. -okay. 
He's gonna go for the blink. We'll have to see how many gateways he decides to add on from here. For now, it's just gonna be a singular one. So we're gonna go up to two to get it with a robo facility. Yep, bringing that uh, robo up. I mean, maybe with the robo coming up, that's a, that's a world you can still add gateways, of course. Expanding is very viable as well. Just move to three bases. Mm -hmm. That's a fair map to, to play the more macro game on. As the Stalker this time hits the Reaper hard as the Reaper comes in. We will get a grenade to delay. The Hellion gets in as well. We're going to see everything again, although there's not much else to confirm apart from, I guess, at this point, a lack of additional gateways coming down in the base. And yep. yeah, just obviously the threat of hitting those probes a little bit. Forge goes down as well, so we really do stay strange now settling down into that macro setup but i mean it's still a forge before nexus so he really wants to prioritize that upgrade yeah that's a bit of an interesting one but it is definitely looking like he is planning on making an expansion over to the third base here momentarily spear is going to continue putting on a little bit of pressure bringing a few widow mines inside of a meta vec towards the right side of the map and he'll be looking to see if he can potentially land those inside of the opponent's base you do see a Robo Bay on the back of this too, actually, for Strange. So he decided to go Forge and Robo Bay before a third Nexus. Yeah, so it's, hmm. it's really too base heavy, huh? Like, he does not want to do an expansion too soon. He does not want to fall into trouble. But this does mean that his army is going to be very strong. But if Spirit doesn't overextend, the lack of a Nexus, the lack of economy is going to be a problem for Strange further down the line, almost definitely. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is one of those openers where Terran doesn't really need to do all too much. He actually scouts the timing here as well that Strange had envisioned for the third Nexus. So that is also very nice. I mean, Spirit is... He's got his finger on the pulse, right? He's all over this map so far. He's been scouting perfectly pretty much everywhere. You probably also noted right here that there is a little observer flying above. He does have that Widow Mine drop hiding on the right side of the main base as well, and a little bit of dead space there just to make sure that he can fly in. And at this point, that observer does not quite see it. It's going to be arranged over here, and finally a third Nexus, arranged for the Colossus, that is. But, yeah. The economy here for Strange is really nothing to write home about, and I don't think Spirit really needs to do a whole lot at this point. He can just continue playing Macro himself, make another Command Center in a moment, and maybe test the waters a little bit, but he doesn't really have to punish Protoss for playing Greedy or anything like that. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, Spirit just sits here. I feel like Spirit kind of likes this. Like, man... You know, you're taking yeah. a very slow expansion. Yeah, okay, you're very tech heavy, but that just gives me a chance to get into the macro game. We know Spirit loves that. That's kind of his sort of uh, style That's as what well. he used to do every game, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, feel like he got better when he stopped doing that every single game. But this is like historically, this is what Spirit loves to do. Yeah, and look at this. Because he knows there's no pressure coming, he just drops the third next, uh, third command center down on location as well. So he knows there's not going to be much to deny him from doing that. He gets a couple of probes here, three, four maybe. Good play. Widow Mind drop in the main base. It's now all of a sudden he's hitting everywhere. It's been a very slow going game. Whoa. So Strange has to try and catch up with that. He slipped the wrong set of probes somehow. That wasn't even as disastrous as it could be. There'll be a second mine in the natural. <laughs> and Strange is being kept busy because there's an the main army moving around the left side as well. Strange still hasn't seen this. Okay, now he does. He pulls back one probe only. And let's see how he deals with the push onto the third. I mean, there's a Colossus up. I don't think Spirit should really be trying to fight here. No, I agree with you. Charge and range are just about to finish here. Range for that Colossus, is, or for that group of Colossi even, is going to be fantastic. I feel like I feel like sitting here out on his opponent's side of the map is very dangerous, because there is just about to be a power spike right now again. for... Oh my god, more probes? Yeah. Did he never clean that one up? 15 workers in total. Yeah, that, that's brutal. A little bit more work and damage done, and now Strange's economy is really... I mean, it wasn't good to begin with, right? Now it's going to be even worse. <laughs> as, oh, we kind of jump on this force. The tanks were not siege. I mean, that's good. That's really the best part of this, right? Because Strange really yeah. caught Spirit unawares, and that's going to benefit him. But, boy, did he need something like that. Yeah, and that was obviously him almost getting a little bit lucky, catching his opponent middle of the unsiege. If Spirit would have been sitting there sieged up, that fight would have gone very different. Now the reinforcing Terran units, though, have shown up on the other side of the map, too. Colossus 1 goes down. Colossus number 2 is not going to be far behind. The third one is not necessary, apparently. Maybe he should have been there with his brothers. Raven over here, though, still being annoying, but that is really unfortunate. Losing 22 probes is just a little bit too much. And now suddenly, I mean, Spirit will be happy to sit back, right? He will... He's got three base economy now. Um, he needs to defend this army, but as long as he does, he's golden here. Yeah, no, he has to He has to play defense, right? But, I mean, his army supply is fine to play defense, and there's only one Colossus. If you're ever going to lose this game, it's because there's, like, still three Colossi alive, and you can just never yeah. kill them. But that's just not the case at all, right? The Colossus can't be knocked down. It's a huge part of the victory here for Spirit. 
And he's going to clean this up for a nice sub 10 minute game to open the opening map with. And uh, it was all going kind of fine for Strange. Like, okay, it was a bit of a weirder build. It was something a bit different. And yeah. then because the game was so slow, it just felt like he took a moment to like switch on. The moment Spirit started doing everything, right? And then, you know, the Raven did a bunch of damage. The Widow Mines did a lot. The Widow Mines did even more. It felt like Strange was almost too comfortable playing slowly. And then, like I say, when the game sped up, it was very punishing for him. No, absolutely. Just a uh, multi-point aggression right over there. Suddenly hitting the opponent at three different sites at once, right? That Raven in the natural, the army at the third, and the Widowmind drop in the main base. And that Widowmind then also got the fire twice. That's a sequence of events that should have gone a little bit better right there for our Protoss. But yeah, he ended up taking uh, damage at ba basically every single angle, except for over at the third base where he did manage to catch his opponent off guard. But Imagine if that army was still siege right there for Spirit. Yeah. This it would have been it would have been a landslide victory. I mean that's the only reason Strange had any hope at all. He caught one army unseaged, yeah. and that was okay. But even then, he lost to Colossi, right? And so yeah, yeah. All right. Well, game number two, Crimson Core. Let's hope Strange can bring something a little bit better out. Just for the you know, again, his build was fine. Just needs to be ready to deal with that aggression because you know Spirit will play like that. He is very capable of playing quickly and all over the place. You can't just let him kind of go unchecked. You can't just make mistakes like that. So, with that said, let's get ourselves into Crimson Court. We're going to be in the bottom left corner to start things out. Representing Na'Vi, the blue Terran player is Spirit. And his opponent, all the way in the opposite corner of the map. We're looking at none other than Strangers Nexus. Yeah, sometimes when you're playing a passive game, suddenly your opponent will hit you everywhere at once. And you have to be able to just switch on, right? Like playing macro, you can kind of chill a little bit. You can cruise a little bit. And then suddenly when you're under a lot of pressure, that's one of the reasons why we see a lot of APM spam, for example, from players in the early game. I get that question all the time from people that don't watch a lot of StarCraft. It's like, hey, why are these guys spending 400 actions a minute making a bunch of drones or making a bunch of SCVs? Well, it's so they are turned on from, you know, for that base defense the entire time as soon as the opponent does decide to bring the heat. And I think Strange just found himself suddenly under a lot of pressure that he didn't expect. And well, he took way too much damage from it. Yup, yup, yup. And this probe comes back across the natural. He's going to have a little check around already. As do you have me. Uh, a little bit of a setup going on here. And just waiting to see what goes down. Probably gonna nibble at that SCV for a little bit then. So we get that on the go. And, uh, yeah, next goes on to the natural as well. So we get that set up also for now. And we just wait to see what's next. Absolutely. Cybercore goes down. We've got ourselves that Reaper Scout coming up in just a moment. Everything's very normal. No cheeky little engineering bay block or anything along those lines this time around. I don't think that really was something, though, that Strange was really caught off guard with. It's one of those things that happens frequently enough that I don't think it's really a, a curveball that Spirit uh, yeah, showed him for the very first time, right? It's something that happens all of the time. But the follow-up was a little bit funky there from Strange. We both expected that the third Nexus was going to go down quite a bit sooner than that. It seemed like you're pretty typical double gateway into a third base with the Blink opener, right? Blink keeps you safe against most things in that, uh, in that situation. If it was more gateways than that, maybe we expected a bit more aggression, but it kind of looked like a two gateway with blink into a third Nexus opener. And then we saw the Forge coming down and then we saw the Robo Bay following up. And ultimately it ends you, it, it, it means that you end up with a lot of very powerful units, but obviously those units do need to be in the right place at the right time. Maybe if you play a little bit more greedily as far as eco goes, it's also easier to justify losing a bunch of probes. But especially when you do a follow up like that, you can't really afford losing any workers. No, oh, you gotta keep them workers alive. You gotta keep that uh, economy intact because you haven't got anything else going for yourself. So, mistakes were made. And this time, a couple of Hellions on the way up from Spirit. We'll see how he tries to utilize those. Stop all coming through. And all of this is being done with the CC on the high ground. Now, flow into the low ground. So, we'll have that in position very shortly as well. Get that CC set up to build. Absolutely. Command center safely made inside of that main base. You do have to make, uh, yeah, you have to make the little flight over there, right? It's going to be another Widow Mine opening here for Spirit. Can't blame the man. It worked out really well in the previous game. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things where the Widow Mine did get nerfed, so the splash damage, I think it got reduced from like 1.75 to 1.5. So in the previous patch, maybe we would have seen a couple more, as we should see. Okay, enough defense here. That grenade was really lovely. Bumping a bunch of those units out of the way. There was no energy for a force field or anything like that, but not enough damage here, really, to deal significant amounts of damage. Just needs one more shot. You can get it. Still a couple of probes, but yeah, nothing too crazy. A minor probe pull off the line, so a little bit of lost mining time. That'll be about that as our hallucination comes over. The medevac loads up the four widow mines, and that will begin to boost out through the center across the upper right as well. Yeah, absolutely. Alrighty. So, what exactly is going to be the follow-up right now for Strange? He is already moving on over and building a pylon a little bit closer towards that rich Vespian geyser, that base that we see taken quite a bit lately. Not exactly sure if you want to be taking that right here against the Terran player, though, but cheeky little Widow Mind drop coming in. Now, there are Stalkers in the main base. Okay, this time around, the one in the main not dealing a lot of damage, but do we see oh. this, please, Strange? Okay, he does pull the yes. probes. Oof, yeah. that was so close. So just gonna unburrow, reburrow. I mean, if you do that a couple times, it just buys you even more time. As the Widow Mine is now dropping the main base, this one will connect. Okay, yep. it's only a probe, so it wasn't really that bad. Could have been a whole lot worse. As we have the uh, Stalker just gonna go over, Widow Mine just gonna lift back into the Medivac and go away from there. The Raven about to finish up from Spirit. That Robo Bay now drops in as well. Yep, apparently a big fan of going straight into that Colossus style once again. Third Nexus, though, is going to be taken in that triangle position, not opting to go for the forward expansion, right? The one with the, the rich Vespian Geyser. It's been something that players, uh, that players have been experimenting with, but in this particular matchup, it's not the priority right now for Strange. Still one cheeky little uh, Widow Mine opener. Yeah, one, one drop still ready to go in. One of the main advantages of opening up with a Stargate is that you can shut this sort of aggression down with relative ease, assuming you micro it correctly. But now it's always going to be a threat, right? Now it's always just going to sit there in the corner. Whether or not you go Robo or, for example, Twilight Council is your uh, tech of choice first. That Widow Mine is going to be... Uh, it needs to be in the back of your mind the entire series long. Yep. It's just, just one of those things that keeps you permanently out of position with a couple of units and... Such a cheap thing to keep there from the Terran player, then. Just why the heck not? Obviously, the Terran on the way to yep. all of those bio upgrades. That's where Spirit will see a power spike in this game. That's where he might try and get something done, even against this you know, Colossus production coming through. We're going to see that Raven showing up once more. Going to go around the right-hand side and look to hopefully grab some damage. You're looking to order turret in the back of that natural in a moment or two. I'm actually going to find an observer on the way, though. That's nice to grab because that removes map control, and that allows drops to be more effective as we continue through this. Nah, I don't know if he had enough energy for another turret there. I think he just barely got it, but and he wanted to drop one. The Stalkers were already there. May as well hang that one on the right side of the map too. So we have a Medivac drop, we have a Raven ready to fly in, and you know what? We found a bit of an angle. <laughs> That's so cheeky. Just dropped it down. He's like, hey, I got one hit point. Come and take me down. And then he picked it back up when the probes were sent to fight it. Yep. Takes it up, backs away. It's going to be seeing that combat shield from Cluster Shells and plus one attack. <laughs> so mean. Coming through. There's a couple gates will drop in as well. And now this bio push. Sending is a little reminder. Yep, now suddenly Spirit is ready to go for a push. So he's got himself Stimpak already done. Combat shields finished up as well, plus one infantry weapons within a half minute or so. Concussive shells. He's just about to hit a uh, very powerful army. That being said, though, Strange is already way up the, uh, the tech himself, too. So he's got himself the Colossus range finishing up nice and early once more. Plus one in the forge also is going to be wrapped up in just a moment. And he's adding on a load of gateway production from here. Plus one attack, send them to lands, charge halfway done. We got a bio coming through in the pylon, going to get knocked down. Is there's a lot on the way and soon here for our Protoss, but there's also a good, powerful Terran army as well. So an interesting moment. You can even see that one medevac peeling up the left side. Trying to go and get something done. We'll be coming around the top very soon and moving into position in the next couple of moments. Absolutely. More Widow Mines flying around the map. It is one of those things where suddenly it can hit you in the face if you're not careful. <laughs> he scans, reveals that it's fine to back horns off once again, but. All right, now we have a Medivac drop heading on over towards the Natural Expansion too. This is one of those locations behind those Golden Minerals that's quite difficult to actually defend. Those Colossus, though, are having... Those Colossi are having a grand old time here. Yeah, the tank's obviously going to get a few shots off, but not really while supporting anything else. Everything else already lifted off and Good. backed away. 
as the Widowmine goes, hits a Stalker as well. I'm just going to be seeing this Widowmine going to lift up and go elsewhere. This Stalker is also going to go down to Aster across the board. As, uh, oh, this Widowmine goes down to the cannon. <laughs> He was waiting for his time to shine for like five minutes now, and finally, well, he just got shotted by a photon cannon. In the meantime, though, Spirit once more unloading the Metavex in the exact same spot. I kind of feel like he could even click the Nexus, which is just gonna be next, so... The Nexus? Anyways, he's gonna try his best to see if he can shut it down. In the meantime, though, Strange has sent his entire army towards the other side of the map. Loads of SCVs have gone down, and keep in mind, he committed to Tekka really nice and early, so his army is strong. Widowmine is going to be ready to fire once more, and loads of mines as well inside of the natural expansion of Spirit. Man, SCV is going down all over the shop, and obviously this push from Strange looking good, but then you've got this Bioforce on the other side, still applying some pressure, still getting some damage done, and that is adding up. I was just going to be seeing the SCVs continue to drop the bio up on the high ground, dropping a couple of EMPs. Problem is going to be those Colossi are not going to be really handled very well at all. This is why I said last game, right where the problem is, if there's three Colossi, it can be so difficult to reach them and do anything about them. And that is kind of what we're seeing right now. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of damage coming out of those big, big Protoss units. 47 SCVs have gone down already. Where's those Metavex? Finally, they are back home, and they're going to be an absolute necessity. Nice pickup control here so far by Strange, trying to save those Colossi to the best of his abilities. Even gets greedy enough to warp in a bunch of units in the middle of this fight. I wonder if maybe he should have committed to microing them there instead. Either way, additional Zealots did pop out of the prism there. I think Spirit is going to be able to stabilize, but at this point, Strange does have the economical advantage. Yep, that is going to be kind of a wacky set of fights. Is obviously now, I mean, economical advantage, but the army of Spirit is still just good. I mean, a lot of it's a medevac. Strange has a Colossus and soon to be a couple of Archons, but that is really about it. So Spirit can kind of go, right? I mean, and he, I guess as well, the fact mm -hmm. that Strange has to rebuild the Nexus from scratch is kind of a big deal as well. So... That's yeah, no battery overcharge, no nothing yeah. over there, so it's going to leave that base incredibly vulnerable. As a matter of fact, right now it's not even powered. Yeah, he doesn't know exactly what is left over, right? But I guess if you have map control, you have those Metavex, you may as well go ahead and give it a try. I think he wants to add on maybe a ghost or two before he really goes, because he knows that there will likely be a bunch of Archons. That Observer sees everything right now. The Spirit does not see the Observer. Oh, don't siege it up. Yeah, you make it so it. obvious. <laughs> Don't let him see it, absolutely. It uh, becomes way more obvious when it gets uh, siege. That blur is there, but of course, when you're playing quickly, it's very easy to miss that blur, so not always a guarantee. As we just tell ourselves, the few more zealots and immortal who's coming up from the side of Strange. I mean, his army is getting rebuilt and reestablished. A Viking finds the prism, though, and that's a big deal, because obviously getting rid of the prism is just going to remove so much of the potential of what Strange can do, and now those zealots are going to yep. be just kind of stuck there as well, so... Huge catch from Spirit. That goes so, so big for him. The fact that Spirit managed to save that command center, of course, was absolutely massive, right? Lifting it up, sending it into the main base. It really makes the... Uh, there he goes once more. It really makes the follow-up here quite a bit easier to play. So despite the fact that he lost 48 workers, he can kind of climb back into this match as well economically. Now even apparently spending some of his cash on getting that plus two infantry attacks upgrade going, which is... A very important upgrade, of course, but it takes a long time to finish, so he believes he can get it done. Strange not really looking to go for any sort of aggression of his own. He fires up the plus one armor together with the blink research, tries to rebuild the Colossi. So in a way, this game has almost been reset a little bit. Spirit not committing to the fight there. After that, uh, that, that big push finally got cleaned up. I kind of felt like he could counterattack, but he's just saying, no, I I'm just going to sit back. I'm just going to defend. I don't really need to take any risks. I have this uh, this hit squad on the left side of the map in case you do decide to move across so I can maybe kill a Nexus or at the very least deal some damage, maybe boost into the main base if I really need to. But other than that, I'm just gonna, yeah, play this relatively passively. Yep, yep, yep. All of that looking, uh, looking pretty uh, reasonable. I mean, this is no reason for kind of rushing to anything from Spirit and from Strange as well. So we just sort of sit... I think Spirit feels very comfortable about things. I mean, there are more upgrades coming through from Strange again. That armor upgrade, the blink, so a bit more utility available. At the uh, same time, Spirit works on his plus two attack, so both players advance in the situation, and Spirit decides to back away with that medevac squadron. Fall back home again. Down a bit of workers, but still maintain that army supply lead. 
And now that he's kind of on a more comfortable economy, you can just continue to build into the tech units on the rebuild as well, right? So Vikings and Ghost numbers are starting mm -hmm. to look good. And that really means that in a larger fight, you're going to probably be feeling pretty darn good about things altogether. Command center is going to be flying on over towards the left side of the map. That is the good old main base. The command center that he started the game off with. So he would be taking that on the left side that is not quite as easily fightable, I guess, for Strange. Although he's going to start to expand in that direction himself too. One Marine very far forward leading the rest of that army. The commanding officer himself. You love to see it. And he should scout that this Nexus indeed just started up. If Protoss does not move on over in that direction in a second... Okay, he is moving in that spot. Ah, that Nexus can actually just be picked off for free. It's a massive EMP potential too, by the way, in this choke point. Mm-hmm. That uh, choke is looking pretty... Pretty scary with the uh, gold minerals still choking up a lot of it. Here we go. EMPs drop and Archon just disappears. A couple of Colossi in the back already starting to drop down. We should finish off one of those. And I think the other dies before the Vikings are going to be gone. Wow. We get to land the Vikings. It's very convincing yeah. from Spirit in the end. Took a little while to get there, but convincing it was. And Spirit is going to be taking the 2-0 knockdown Strange and to start his tournament off right, of course. We expect Spirit to be on that kind of 2-0 train, right? That's absolutely the kind of position uh, someone like Spirit should be in. Uh, so that's not too much of a surprise. Just uh, good to see him actually delivering on that. So GG's and well played. Yeah. It kind of became a weirder game and a weirder situation, but... Like I say, just being able to kind of stay calm in those situations and kind of see it through to the end. That's exactly what Spirit managed to do to knock himself forwards, Loco. No, you're absolutely right. It's one of those scenarios where, yeah, technically Protoss had more workers available after that fight took place. The, almost like a base racy type of fight. But then ultimately, yeah, those, those mules are really nice and he didn't really have the Nexus over at the third base anymore. Plus on top of that, Spirit managed to keep the third command center alive. And all of it together just allowed Spirit to slowly play this one out. And his army was massive in the end. Yep, it really, really was. As we are now going to be officially halfway through Europe. We've done our left side of matches on this schedule. And it is uh, Spirit, Clem, Eliza, and Shadon so far to lock themselves into that 1-0 Swiss standing scoreline. Up next, Battle B takes on Wayne in a fun TVZ. We've got more PvP from Mana and Goblin. But Jumi battles Hero Marine in an uphill battle. And to end the day, our first ever random appearance in an ESL regional. That's going to be Youth Thermal battling on Harstom to wrap today up a one single match from Group B. So with all of that coming, guys, we'll see you in just a few for more StarCraft 2. That Battle B Wayne best of three series is indeed up next.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, guys, as we continue our way through the European region, day one of Swiss in ESL S2 Masters Spring. It's Wayne and Battleby going head-to-head -head up next for some TVZ action, and uh, Battleby has shown us some spurs of hope throughout the course of regionals uh, in the last year or so. Never forget the series he played against Serral, where he was doing great in a game. Like, he really played his heart out. If he can play like that against Wayne, I think he would win. Uh, but obviously, bringing that level every single day is, is not something that happens. And sometimes, you know, someone like Serral makes you kind of play better, almost to just try and beat him, you know? So, be interesting to see how yeah. this one ends. This battle will be in Wayne, and it's uh, already loading in the game. Yeah, we're nice and quick here today. All of the games have been smooth so far. Very low downtime in between the matches. Hope you guys are enjoying it as well. We have a lot of games coming your way. It's our first one in this particular best of three series takes place on the strangest of strange maps. We find ourselves on post youth and in the bottom left hand corner, we have a battle B. In the upper right hand side is going to be our red Zerg. This is going to be Wayne. Wayne, of course. Playing this game for a very long time. Once upon a time, under the nickname of Vanya. Before that, Ratata. Or actually, it's the other way around, I think. I think he went from, Van from Vanya into Ratata. Vanya. He should have gone to Eradicate next, but... Yeah, he, he didn't evolve. Something happened. No. Well, he evolved to Wayne. Maybe yeah. it's a new generation. Yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not in the original 150, man. I'm not into it. <laughs> it's original form of Eradicate. I'm not into it at all. A good old ZVT right here on this map. We do have all the, uh, I think it's a Nova artwork, isn't it? Yeah, that's cool. There's a lot of cool art actually around these maps. There's, uh, there's a part where there's little, uh, the little dudes, the little bears are watching it. Yeah, yeah, they're watching it in many different uh, spots yeah. on the map. There you go. <laughs> what a life. You can actually hear it when you go past those, I'm sure. If you're an SCV, you're scouting across the map, you can hear them drumming. Look at those guys over here. <laughs> They're really close. My mom never allowed me to sit that close to the television. Did she not? No. Huh? She told me I would get square eyes. I don't know why, but apparently this is a common thing that Dutch parents would tell their children. If they sit too close to the TV, your eyes would turn into squares. I was like, mom, that makes no sense. But I remember very distinctly that that is what she told me, and I, I was scared enough to not sit too close to the TV. <laughs> <laughs> she really got you there, mate. <laughs> Good Reaper Scout going across the map right now. Command Center, not on the low ground. I always autopilot here. I'm like, yeah, Command Center going down, not on the low ground. It's inside of the main base. <laughs> Caught myself this time around. Every, old, uh, every natural in StarCraft 2 is pretty much always down the ramp on the low ground, but not right here on Post Youth. Not right here. Reaper gets turned around and just has to go and find a different way to do something as Valerie does not find too much success. I'm kind of surprised this map came in. I feel like this map is very Zerg friendly. It's it's decently sized. There's a gold base you can take. Don't get me wrong. Some of the pathways are mm -hmm. narrow and good to push up and down on. I just feel like you can get so many bases so quickly as a Zerg on this map. That unless you're super confident playing a very long game... Which, I mean, Battleby might be to some extent. Like I say, just kind of yeah. intrigued by the choice that this map makes it through. Yeah, I guess as a Zerg, you do have to spread the Creeper really far forward as quickly as possible. Because if you want to take that gold base, which is definitely going to be the base that Wayne will be eyeing here after the third. You need to get Creep up on that high ground, right? So sort of where that second Overlord is flying right now. That is a, sec that is a section of the map where you really do need to have Creep if you're... Not the other Overlord, a little bit further down south of this particular spot. Anyways, yeah, you need to get Creep up on this high ground if you want to defend against a lot of those big attacks yeah. from the Terran a little bit later. Because those Golden Minerals are so, so juicy. It is true, right? It's actually a pretty cool gold base where, like, you can take it, but it's actually very difficult to defend unless you're really dominating the game already. So taking the gold, like, super early is tough. Um, so in that way, it's kind of a nicely designed gold. Ooh, extra see. extra gas taken, by the way. Yeah, and then the roach run, right? So maybe some aggression yeah. from Wayne. Absolutely. Very difficult to scout right here for Battle B. So it is link speed, by the way. He did not skip the Zerkling speed upgrade. So this could just be a Zerkling flood, although he now queues up six additional drones. That seems really early for a defensive roach run, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lag coming up as well. 
I don't know. I hmm. mean, you got a couple. Maybe you just got two or three roaches out. It's going to make sure that the Hellions can't really get by you or anything. And then you just head from there with the lair up. We can tech and do as we wish. And you can see the few lings just there to deflect the Reaper once again. So Wayne's defense is pretty much spot on so far. Not really letting anything kind of come through or, you know, punish. So in that regard, pretty decent. Absolutely. A little bit funky, though. That's for sure. We'll have to see exactly what Wayne does here in about a minute from now. As he will have access to that tech quite a bit sooner than what we normally see. Maybe not so much eyeing the gold minerals just yet. Although he is posturing in that particular direction here. Another gas goes down. He's going for defensive spore crawlers right now against any sort of benchy liberator play. Hellion's trying to go up the ramp. I think they had an opportunity, by the way, when the queens were distracted on the right to go into the main base. But he didn't really know exactly how many links were waiting. Yep. No, doesn't know at all as you see it again. The uh, cloak coming up. And the stim coming through. Engineering Bay, a few extra barracks all continue to build. Obviously, just rather be happy to build up into that later stage. Get the bio pumping and get those pushes rolling. As Wayne is just going to drone, 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 man. Hevo Champ is coming up. Mm -hmm. A lot of these banshees, though, to contend with. So we'll get that uh, moving across right now. Yeah, interesting little opener. We see similar versions of this build all the time, but then without, for example, link speed and with a bit of a later roach warren. But I guess all of the roads eventually do lead towards a very similar position. This battle be is starting to work on those drones here for just a second. Golden minerals indeed are going to be gathered here in just a moment. Additional golden minerals, I guess, because there's a few of those as well with that second base over inside of the main. Plus one, plus one for the roaches coming right up. Yeah, one-on-one -on -one missile upgrades, Roach be coming through. Hellions are going to go and hit a Roach for a couple of moments as well. So some wax over there. As our depots will continue to spread out. And again, we just get ourselves settled in. Those engineering bays getting up and rolling. And Wayne just building the infestation, but so he's so ready to play into Hive. Play into that later tech. Just going to be sent for the moment. So yeah, it's kind of on Six battle. Six-minute Hive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's all it's greed exceptionally from Wayne. quick. Yeah. yeah, it's super greedy here. He's basically just playing the survival game, I guess, and so far he's been able to get away with pretty much everything. His economy is, uh, especially once these drones are starting to work on these minerals here, it's, it's gonna be insane. That'll be really needs to figure out a way to shut this down. He's going into the armory, so he will be able to fire up plus two, plus two, nice and early, but if he's going for like a pretty standard two, two timing attack, I've got a feeling he's gonna be way outclassed by the Zerk army at that point. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm with you there as our missile and carapace upgrades continue through. That lurker den is very much so on the way up still from Wayne, so he, if he gets there, it's going to be tough for Battle B, but I really believe in Battle B knows that his opponent is being greedy to some extent and is ready to up something of yeah. an attack, because if he's not, then that is really kind of wild and a bit of a misread on his part. Very soon, we're going to be seeing Lurkers hit the battlefield. They're going to start up their ranged upgrades. Not even eight minutes into the game, it seems like. Going to be able to fire up 2-2. We can go into Vipers here as well. I mean, it's going to be very difficult for Battle B to win the game with just a Marine Marauder Siege Tank-based army. It's going to see the timing right now of the Infestation Pit. Yeah, starting up the Hive at this point in time wouldn't be too out of the ordinary, but he's not really punishing his opponent for the greed whatsoever. Nope. No punish at all. I mean, maybe now with this one push, but man, the creep spread is really out there. The Vipers are on the way. I just don't think Battle B gets to where he needs to be on time. It's just been such a passive game. You look at what's lost, right? It's, you know, very little. I mean, yeah. A couple of he, he forgot donated, combat yeah. shields, by the way. So oh, maybe wow. that's why he ends up playing pretty passively here. He started up combat shields together with 2-2, two, two, which... I guess shuts down any attacks, right? Like, if you want to go for a timing with Terran, you really can't afford having less hit points on all of your Marines. Yep. No, oh, absolutely. The uh, lack of uh, combat shield just hurts so much, but it's on its way now. Once it finishes, it's there. But like you say, that might just cost you the ability to be aggressive before this point or at any point sooner, right? So definitely seems like a bit of a factor. And the extra look has come about. Another you know, spore getting positioned. So this forward position is, is being broken down a little bit. We cancel a couple of the lurkers. Hello. We kill another one. So Battle B gets a couple of grabs. And so far, he's been able to take good trades because Wayne's not been able to utilize the tech that he's greeted into. He's not gotten the lurkers down just yet. The Vipers haven't shown up. Soon, this is going to change. But for the moment, it's been pretty well done. Oh, apparently requesting a quick little pause here. He's got Vipers done right now, too, by the way. There's a bunch of Vipers out in this game with loads of energy. Apparently, Wayne just needs to adjust one of his hotkeys really quickly. For the Lurker in particular. Yeah. Anyways, this is 
not going very smoothly for Battle because in a strange way... So it, it's kind of funny because it's not been a smooth engagement overall, I guess, for Wayne, even though he's had the superior army overall. So here's... Oh my god, some big blinding clouds, some good abductions as well. That's a painful exchange for the Terran. Yeah, you lose, uh, you take a couple of losses there. Battle B, again, had a few good moments leading into this. Now it's going to die off that little bit. It's going to be seeing 2 2 upgrades going through. The Lurkers, Hydras, Lings all on the way. Ghosts are coming up. And I'm just going to get all of that ready right now. As, I mean, he's going to need that tech. He's going to need those ghosts to be able to truly fight this Zerg army later on. Right now, he's gone down to four bases. The next challenge for Battle B will be obviously pushing out a base number five. That's a more exposed position. That's going to be a little bit tougher to do. That's something we've not gotten to just yet. Okay, here come the Lurkers. Those Lurkers are aiming for a good position over here. And like you were saying, without Ghost, it's going to be really difficult to fight this. Although up this choke point into a whole load of Siege Tanks is tricky too. One Snipe does end up going down. And you know what? Battle B survives there. I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that he... He managed to kill, what was it, three Lurkers? Just about a minute ago without combat shields and all that, right? Like he grabbed a bunch of them for essentially free. Those units are so pivotal here. And that may have actually just taken the wind out of Wayne's sails here. He may have just yeah, been forced to slow down this game a lot more. I think he had real potential to win the game with that first big swell of lurkers, but now he's forced to play it all a little bit slower. Well, I'm just going to be uh, having ourselves the a little bit of a reposition. I'm kind of with you, right? This idea of, like, I think losing a couple of lurkers makes a big difference there, but also... I do feel as though Wayne kind of went all from one direction. Like, there's other ways he could have moved. Yeah. He didn't have to just come through that one single choke point. So, yeah, definitely a, an interesting Absolutely, one. he could have split off at least a little bit on the right side. Now he's going to go up against a Terran player, though, who will have access to plenty of ghosts. Plus three, plus three is coming up here as well for Battle B. He has started building up all of those orbital commands. At the very least, we're at the beginning of that right now, where he's adding on two additional command centers. Usually they start up right around this time when the Terran is about to max out. And ultimately you're looking for about a dozen of them as Terran. You're now forced to play that macro game. Maybe Battle B didn't originally plan on doing that either, much like Wayne, but he is forced into that position because of that delay on the combat shield research. Any sort of timing attack from there has been slowed down significantly. So we'll get to see exactly what late game TVZ looks like on post youth. Yeah, again, uh, you see a little bit of that is going to be pretty cool. So it's going to be a nice little uh, opportunity to kind of, again, see the later stages, see something that we've not uh, necessarily been seen too much of. There's been a lot of faster games today, and when they've gone long, it's kind of been from weirder positions. I just kind of feel like Wayne's doing the right thing in terms of turning a lot of them out. You know, the right side's completely covered. He's got access to those upper left bases very easily too, and that's why I'm worried a bit for Battle B. If he doesn't get towards a fifth base soon, he's going to struggle to deny those forward bases being taken by the Zerg. And then the Zerg is very likely mm -hmm. to steal bases away from the Terran very easily. So, expecting that to be a, a little bit of a factor as our Ling Hydra Lurker sets up in the center just for a few moments, but nothing coming of it just yet. We were talking about how it can be quite difficult for Zerg to defend the gold base. Well, likewise, the same thing can be said for Terran here too, unless we send everything down a choke point. Wayne setting up shop, though, with the Lurkers right here on the high ground is very tricky for Battle B to break. He is going into that uh, that Liberator transition right now, so additional starports are coming. But we're a while away from Liberator ranged and really, like, you know, about a dozen of those units flying around the map. And getting, yeah, getting additional bases from this position is indeed quite complex, but he fires up three additional command centers. Knight is worm, by the way, not going into the main base where we sort of expected it to be. Instead, we're just using it to reposition a bunch of units and to, yeah, transfer everything around the map. Double Spire coming up. We've had a bunch of Infestors added into the mix as well. So we've kind of like skipped the early and mid game or we're just going straight to late game here, Marty. Yeah, no, we are absolutely right and ready to duel in these later stages. Couple of Vikings, couple of Liberators all coming about. The tanks are on the way as well. So all of that coming through. We are just getting ourselves settled down as the Hydra Lurker all gets gathered together as well. Just wait to see how this goes. Couple Very ambitious about. siege tank over here, by the way. <laughs> yeah. he, he's on a journey, all mate. The way around. <laughs> he was off on a journey. No stopping him. Well, a couple of times you get to come through and they land in the lurk. Is this gold base being taken? I like it because, again, it stretches you out to a base that realistically you just need at some point here as the Terran player. So, Battle be getting away with that is a big deal. I think Wayne should, again, definitely prioritize taking the top right, uh, bottom right and top left. 
Obviously, yes. you can't take all those bases, but mine as much from there as you can, because those are the bases that are going to become contested later. Those are the bases you want to take advantage of now, while the Terran player is clearly focusing in the middle of the map instead. Yeah, I also think we could see a one-two punch right here with the Lurker going up into the main base, distracting the bulk of that Terran army. Would have been a perfect opportunity to maybe try and commit to a fight over at the gold base, or at the very least try and hit the Terran somewhere where they may not be looking at that time. Instead, though, Wayne just throws it up into the main base and, well, forced to back off just a tad. We do indeed have the Greater Spire on the back of this, and there's also the Fusion Core for that ranged upgrade. With the new patch, the ranged upgrade for the Liberators has been reduced by one. It's actually quite significant. Yep. Range is a, uh, a big deal. So, uh, in the range setup, just going to be seeing the uh, Greater Spire coming through, plus two melee, plus three carapace. I mean... This really is just going later and later and deeper and deeper. This is not one that's going to get resolved immediately because the banks are building up as well. So we are absolutely seeing this just develop into that late game duel. Like I said, I think Balabi must have been hmm. fairly confident to go there because he lets this map come through. And if you let this map come through, you've got to know that this is a real possibility. So I really think he was yeah. kind of okay with it. So like I say, if that's the case, then hell yeah, let's show you know show us why Battleby. Show me why you're okay with playing this map that is generally good for Zerg. You know, show us why you're okay about it. I think Wayne should really... Ooh, big fungal growth over here. Grabs a bunch of those Terran units. Not bad whatsoever. I think Wayne should really be considering taking that base all the way in the bottom right hand corner. Ultimately, a lot of these games are decided by the Zerg player stealing what was originally intended to be one of the Terran spaces. Right now, he did put a Nidus Worm in the exact location where the hatchery is supposed to go, but I really think one of his goals should be to try and mine out one of those bases quickly, because Battleby is not going to be able to easily split up his army to defend both this base right over here on the far left and then also the one in the bottom right hand corner. So Wayne can certainly make use of that much more mobile Zerg army at this point. I think instead he's trying to catch the Terran off guard with tech transitions. So he's ready to now suddenly whip out a whole bunch of Brute Lords. Those Brute Lords are going to be powerful, but we already have a lot of ghosts. Infernal Pre-Igniter coming up too. That's going to be... Well, he doesn't have to supply for it right now, but... He's gonna be ready, I guess, to make a bunch of Hellbats and really... Okay, now he shut down his own Nidus Worm there. He killed it so he can make the hatch <laughs> there, but... Yeah, he's gonna need to make some decisions here very soon, because... Slowly but surely, Battleby is uh, gonna mine out those bases on the left. And after the bases on the left side are mined out in about 5 to 10 minutes, he's got his eyes set on the bottom right. Yep, and that uh, settled down is in Philip Igniter and all of our upgrades continue through, including that... Uh... A little cheeky uh, fusion core upgrade. Is that the Caduceus reactor? Is that what we call it? If I remember. Yes. Yeah. It's um. That is it. it it's it's a late game upgrade. You know, you may as well get it at this point. The game is generally the consensus, so we are gonna get to see that. And uh, yeah, we just develop this game deeper and later, and this is gonna be a fight for game just bases on the map. Right now, Wayne is doing a great job, I think, of just taking bases around the map. But that's not to say that Battleby can't force his way into those positions at some point and to take them back. An interesting position here, for sure. So that'll be apparently comfortable to play this much more turtley style that we do see from the top tier Terrans all the time. Maro is a big fan of this play style. Obviously, Clem has been doing it a lot. Bion has been doing it, right? Like all the top tier Terrans, the ones that we see play all the time, they love playing this passively. It's just also really easy for Terran to slip up and accidentally make a mistake. Like say, for example, you're not prepared against the fungal growth. Keep in mind that those infestors have additional range now it's very easy to just lose all of your ghosts. And when you lose all of your ghosts, you essentially end up losing the game. So you have to be super cautious. Tactical nuke here. I Okay, that's for style points, I guess. Fair enough. Looks cool. Well, I mean, put some pressure on that base. Could have just killed it, I think, with the ghosts. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. This is for the fans. This one's for you guys. Hey, maybe he's just like, if I launch the nuke, he'll be concerned where it is and he'll look everywhere. Maybe he likes that part of it, but... I mean, I like that he's putting attention to this base. Even just the sign of that already, I think, is a, a good sign. So, yeah. very into that as we continue through and wait for the next move to be made between these guys. Wait to see what that might be. I mean, realistically, neither player really wants to fight right now because they're happy and happy just setting up later and later into this game. Again, becoming the aggressor at this stage typically makes you or sets you up in the worst position. So, that's probably what they're avoiding. Again, just slowly take down these bases and, uh, so, you know. Passing your seatbelts, guys, because we're in for kind of a long ride right now. Absolutely. There's still one expansion, too, by the way, in the top left-hand corner. 
there's a another yeah another expansion that needs to be decided here later on battle b has not really been checking for it okay wayne is going to be taking it right now i think it's absolutely critical for one of those bases if the zerk wants to win at the very least for one of those bases to go in favor of the zerk mm -hmm. so the reasoning for it is pretty straightforward generally speaking late game zerk does not trade quite as efficiently as terran late game unless your name is Sarah, i guess he tends to uh be very efficient with those spellcasters in particular. But because of that, usually Terran is not really allowed by the Zerg players to mine 50% of the map. So Battle B's goal here will be to try and mine 50% of all of the resources on the map. Wayne exactly trying to do and prevent that, right? He's trying to make sure that he can take one of those expansions from the Terran. So that way, even if he trades cost inefficiently, he can just reuse some of those resources against the opponent. Already though, the banks are looking massive here. Both of these players have well, easy times remaxing. Yep, there's just no reason to kind of rush into, uh, like I say, fighting, right? There's not really been like a lot of activity this game. It's been fairly, like, there's been fights, but it's been fairly passive overall, so no reason to spend your bank before now. So we really just kind of speed on through into building that bank up. We get it going very quickly, and that's very much so what we're seeing right now the effects of that and the size that, that bank can become when it goes uh, kind of unhindered and just left to mine throughout, because we've not even really seen many worker kills. 19 Drahoon no. 6 SCVs for the scope of this game, it's pretty tiny. Honestly, the amount of resources lost in total, so we're up like, I don't know, like maybe 25 to 30,000 or so, it's really not even that much, considering the size of the banks here for both of these players. It's been... Like, we're, we're, this kind of could have been the situation we're in at like minute 35, right? And instead we're already here at not even 21 minutes into the game. Oh, that Siege Tank is blocking it. Previously it was a Nidus Worm, now it's a Siege Tank. Oh, are there any Corruptors here? Base has a bad time as uh, we do see one or two Corruptors. Obviously Ghost trying to get the Snipes up from underneath. And we do have the Vikings fighting back. The Vikings are going to put in a lot of work. A few Hydras are going to help to scare those off for the moment, but... And seeing how that continues, we just see how uh, re-engaging. Even the Overseer is actually kind of an expensive loss. They do not come free. As that goes to our Vikings, continue to chill back. And that's more Corruptors in production on the side of uh, Wayne. So you're definitely seeing his priority, making sure that he's got that economy, uh, sorry, that uh, air army fixed up and ready to battle as much as possible. Okay, that fungal growth was really lovely, actually. Scaring off that Terran army. Big fungal right now, actually. Not scaring it off anymore. All of the Vikings are going to be slowed down. Even a couple of sport crawlers are coming to the front, but ultimately there may just be enough units right here for the Terran player who's just sniping down and pointing his Vikings at all of those brute lords. I thought that that fight was going to go pretty poorly there for Battleby, but I don't think the entire Zerk squad was present. He's got a lot of units all spread around the map. Bunch of lurkers over here, for example, in the top left hand corner, trying to somehow sidestep past those liberators in the planetary fortress, try to create some chaos, but... All right, that fight, ultimately pretty good for Battleby, who's now taking one of those expansions. Another tactical nuke. Yeah, nukes just kind of continue to power up here. This is honestly kind of wild, right? I mean... Yeah, basically playing a situation where Valopi is able to keep on taking very good trades, but man, he's got so many of those trades to do because his opponent is just that rich. So we're a long way from seeing a solution to this game uh, kind of figured out or all just yet. I'm just going to be seeing these lives continue to siege up over that left-hand side. Just going to be seeing the workers still firing away where possible. And the snipes all coming through again. Corruptors, Hydras getting pushed back immediately. I mean, Battle B so far can't seemingly lose a fight, so Wayne is definitely struggling here. No. This Battle B opens strong each and every time they engage. You're absolutely right. Wayne not really fighting nearly as efficiently as he should be aiming for, losing a ton more resources now than his opponent already. And we're not really in a situation yet where we can consider this really an economical advantage for the Zerk, right? I mean, the banks are pretty much even. That'll be at this point is mostly done, I guess, building orbital commands. He's only got seven, Wardy, which is actually pretty, you know, for the stage in the game, we kind of expect like a dozen of them at this moment, I guess, but he's got seven orbital commands, which is respectable to say the least. The one thing I do quite like right here for Wayne is the fact that he's got that base in the far top left. The one that I tried pointing out earlier, he has been mining that one for a while. But I think Battle B is okay not having his opponent uh, dealt with over here. I mean, maybe he can send a Liberator or two to try and harass it. But as long as he takes that mirrored base in the bottom right -hand corner of the map, he should be fine. Yeah, again, it's really kind of about just being able to take these bases, right? And being yeah. able to kind of, you know, if you mine the same amount as a Terran, we've already seen the lack of efficiency from Wayne. And on top of that, we, we talk about how efficiently he should be trading. And I can only agree, like, you know, you don't expect to trade efficiently, but 
you got to be ha so much kind of efficient. You can't just completely lose everything. And that becomes more and more of a problem as this base becomes attainable by Battle B. Wayne is going to run into a lot of trouble trying to get down to that bottom right-hand corner. So that's definitely going to have an impact the deeper that we go on this one. Absolutely. The micro required on both sides here is very, very substantial. And so far, Bellaby seems to be getting the upper end of basically every exchange. Again, we have Banelings rolling in. I mean, a good unit, of course, if you can get them on top of all of those ghosts. But if not, and it sort of pop like that, that's a lot of resources gone. We have a bunch of Brute Lords right now on the right side of the map, ready to deny another expansion. But I think Bellaby is nicely situated over here, too. Another tactical nuke right on top of his own army. Questionable at... <laughs> at least yeah. but i think he's gonna be moving out of the way in just a sec you would think okay settling uh his, his superiority just like that nuking his own army that's one way of doing it yeah i think it's all over the place by the way they just continue to run around here there and everywhere again if battle b can establish that bottom right side we keep saying it but that base is so important he's, he's doing it slowly yeah. I, I think he's just denying it and he's just slowly getting it he is not rushing yeah, it because it's, it's so easy good. to be split up yeah so, so here's once again a whole lot of brute lords transitioning from another army into brute lords once again the first big wave of brute lords did very little so wayne is hoping that he can get more value out of this one the thing that makes those brute lords somewhat powerful i guess is to get the correct fungal growths and then also parasitic bombs and all of the correct spell casting down but it's so easy to accidentally slip all of that up so it's a delicate dance. It's it's between these these armies, I guess, but it's really a big fight between the spellcasters as well. Those Vikings and Brute Lords, they're important, but it really comes down to a lot of the ghosts, a lot of the infestors, and then also a lot of those vipers. And of that last one, I don't think we actually have that many. No, we only have one viper in total. Yeah, the spellcasters, you could argue, are kind of lacking as well, right? I mean, yeah. when you get to this stage of the TVZ, you need spellcasters as the Zerg, because that's going to be the only way you can really find any sort of good fight. So to be missing those yeah. spellcasters should definitely kind of get alarm bells ringing a little bit. And, uh, yeah, Wayne, I, I like the fact he's keeping the Corrupted Count up, but honestly, yeah, most spellcasters, I think, at this stage are kind of a necessity. You just don't see Zergs win at this point in the game with less spellcasters than this, right? Like, that's just not a thing. That's not a factor. It doesn't happen. You're absolutely right. Wayne at this point has a massive army, but I think he needs to add on a bunch of additional infestors and preferably also a bunch of vipers. It is easier said than done though, because those units require a ton of micro and there's already about 17 moving parts in the Zerk army. So I understand why he's avoiding it for the time being, or at the very least not focusing on it all too much, but that'll be his... Uh... Yeah, inching uh, ahead when it comes to the advantage right now. He's going to be taking that base you've been shouting at him about in just a moment. Pesky little Zerkling burrowed for now, but the, the Liberators are going to be able to make short work of that in just a sec. Yeah, they should be able to. A couple of SCVs go down the center. We have our planetary chilling between all the bases as well. So I'm just going to be sitting out over there and we wait to see what the next uh, part of this plan is from Wayne. Because I think it is really Wayne that has to make a move. Again, now your yep. resources lost a 16k difference. You are in trouble of potentially being unable to protect this base, which you have to protect because you're already in a bad position. Those are some good fungals no on the Vikings, but where exactly no Vipers, no Parasitic Bombs, there's no follow-up. Now we fungal down to the bottom side to stop the Ghost, but the Vikings win in the sky. If the Vikings win in the sky, the Broodlords are the next target, so they have to go running away. They know they can't just stick around here, and that is a big part of the problem as we continue through. And this is honestly looking to be worse and worse as... This honestly just feels great for Battle B. I mean, he's got bases, yeah. he's got he's got everything realistically. Bottom right, just again, the one base he needs to take, get that back up and go in one small. He's getting but... it. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's getting there eventually. Sure, yeah, it's gonna take him a little while, but we're... <laughs> he's actually building a new command center over there. He wants a fresh, a fresh new repolar CC experience. for this particular spot. Yeah, yeah, of course. Now this uh, this is this is starting to look a little bit desperate right now for Wayne. Like he's got all of the tools at his disposal. But it's just that controlling those tools is so tricky. Love this, by the way, here from Battle B. Using a tactical nuke as well. If it's not spotted, I mean, this guy is having a grand all time. Okay, it does get spotted, but now he was forced to overextend it with the Brute Lords in order to achieve that. So the 100 minerals, 100 gas spent on the tactical nuke. It got him a couple additional Brute Lords. And all of these very cost-efficient trades will ultimately lead towards a yeah, significant advantage for the Terran. So this is going to be one of those awkward moments very soon where Wayne has actually mined out all of the minerals that he can mine. The only minerals that will soon be available on this map are going to be in the bottom right corner. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it is getting to that point, right? We are getting to that stage where it's going to be a pretty big uh, fight over the bottom, right? I mean, the problem for Wayne is he can't put any attention there because his army's so slow moving, so he has to keep it here to defend top left, which is why eventually, maybe if he mines Fungal? out top left, he could go bottom yeah. right, as that is a huge fungal. It hits everything, but there's even more Vikings still to show up. This time, the Parasitic Bombs are on that first half of the Vikings, but the rest of the Vikings are putting in work, Loco. Damage being done across the board. Ghost firing away. Corrupt is taking some big shots too. I mean, this is crazy, but it is a massive win for Battle B. He will have nowhere near as much rebuilding to be done. Resources lost hugely in his favor. That is insane. Like, whenever we see Serral get a fungal like that, it's game over. But now we see Wayne getting basically half the Terran army fungled. And Terran wins that engagement. Great control right there on the end by Battle B. And no proper follow-up from Wayne. He decided to commit to that fight because he realized that is the, the biggest opportunity I'm going to get here. Yeah. In the meantime, Battle B taking those expansions in the bottom right-hand corner. Yeah, this, uh, he's slowly rebuilding. Maybe he needs to uh, use some of those starports he's got to yeah, max out once again. There we go. We're making some Metavex, a couple Vikings. We're shopping for two units at a time, apparently. We're making two of everything. Yes, 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 we are. Well, we, uh... Just gonna be seeing, I mean, obviously a couple of these spores getting knocked down. It's just gonna be, again, really difficult, right? We're just at this stage where... You know that as Wayne, you've just lost a fight, and what you rebuild is very much so more of the same. And you also just had yeah. such a good fight previously. So, oh, in theory, you should have done, right? Like, it was the best possible start to it. Obviously, it didn't end up good. But this is all being, you know, got to be kind of, to some extent, weighing on your mind here. So, yeah, I really feel like that's a bit of a problem. We do see these uh, Brutalords dropping in. Oh. The Vikings are going to come up. They're going to get aggressive here for a couple moments as well. We do have the Corruptors still giving chases. Vikings and Libs are going to go around. Yeah, not a lot of uh, missile turrets in this section of the map, so those Corruptors were thinking about chasing. What he really is aiming for, though, is Parasitic Bombs. Great split right there, but that'll be getting rid of that uh, soft unit pretty much right away. Don't bring it back in. That would be... <laughs> there you go. That would be a little bit sloppy. Fungal Growth, Parasitic Bomb, getting that Wombo combo, I think is the only way that Wayne can really properly get an engagement here where we end up winning, because... If he keeps trading the way that he has been over the last few engagements, he is going to fizzle out as much money as he's got in the bank right now. Here we go. A couple of snipes once again end up going down. Big fungal Huge growth fungals. once again. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. The snipes, though, are going to continue here with that fungal growth wearing off. The Vikings also having a grand old time in disguise. GG is cold. And <sighs> battle be, man. Yeah, yeah. What a game. Dominates the late game of this TVZ dominates it every single fight was just absolutely in his favor he was not letting any of these fights go the other way and uh that will very much so be that as we get ourselves to a gg's here but game number one 30 minutes it was a very slow going start right neither player really wanted to do much but you saw why because battleby was just like well i don't need to i'm very comfortable later in the game yeah and so it's definitely kind of all eyes on wayne like hey wayne you got to do something now buddy because if you don't do something here soon you're gonna be in trouble Absolutely. Um, very well done right there by Battleby. It looked very dominant, right? So <laughs> it's funny to see players uh, GGing out whenever they still have a pretty large bank, but I think yeah, Wayne was feeling that that game really wasn't going anywhere anymore. All of those engagements past like minute 25 or so went pretty heavily in favor of the Terran. And in, like I was trying to say, Wayne already mined out all of the bases he was ever going to get, or at least he was close to mining it out. And Battleby just got a fresh new expansion in the bottom right-hand corner that he was going to start mining. So, yeah, he could have stuck in that game for another minute or two, but it wouldn't have been an overwhelming advantage at that point for Terran. So he decided to rip off the Band-Aid himself, and we'll see how it goes in game number two. Yeah, time to, time to reset a little bit, time to go again. I mean, Oceanborn is not going to play necessarily the same. It can be a long map, but I think it's much less naturally going to split and stall out like we saw. And maybe Wayne does find something just more mid-game, more early focus to get himself back on track on this series and get himself a map win tied up and send us to a game three, uh, which is definitely very possible still for him. So let's see if he can find a way as we head on into game number two. In the top left-hand side, down a map will be this red Zerg player. It is going to be Wayne. And his opponent down in the bottom right. Some amazing engagements in game number one. Microed very well by none other than Battleby. 
Yeah, I keep enjoying watching Battle B play. It just feels like we're consistently seeing him... Uh, consistently seeing him just kind of play to a high level, consistently kind of impress. Just very cool to see. Very happy to see him doing well. And every time I see him, it's always like a pleasure to watch him. Like, he might not be going out there and winning every single time, but you can see the potential is there and he keeps refining. And at some point, I feel mm -hmm. like he's just going to pop off one day. And everyone's going to be like, wait, what battle beat did this or that or whatever? And then somebody's like, well, yeah, you know, honestly, we kind of saw this coming, you know? Like, he's been yeah, improving. He's been on the up and up for years. Yeah, exactly. And he's still, yeah, I, I feel like I've been watching Battle B play for like five years and he's only 21 years old at this point in time. Yeah. So. He's young. He's been making, he's yeah. been making, yeah, he's still a young player, but he's been making a lot of improvements for many years, and it's still, like, an upwards trajectory, you know? Like, you see players sometimes sort of stabilize at a certain MMR, I guess, or, like, a certain skill level, but that'll be definitely uh, still making progression. Yep. Still making progression. So let's see. see. And uh, I honestly just hope he has a really good run in one of these seasons, one of these regionals. Maybe this is the start of it. Um, mm -hmm. it'd be really cool to see him like make playoffs and see what he can do there. It'd be freaking awesome. So, yeah, uh, we'll see what Wayne does. Wayne's been one of those players that's actually not always making playoffs, but is fairly consistently there as well. So, always cool to see him being active, looking good. And, uh, it's actually been pretty darn good. I feel like Wayne goes through these phases where sometimes I watch him play, I'm like, huh, that wasn't so great. And then the next time I watch him play, I'm like, man, he really can't still beat anyone. <laughs> so, yeah, keep, keep in mind, he had a good opportunity in that previous game, right? So he lost three Lurkers right before his Lurker timing. And then with the leftover units that he still had, he decided to go up a choke point into a ramp. Like, it was all just a little bit of a mess there. I think if that, like, I don't know, sequence of 30 seconds or so would have gone better for him, he probably would have been able to shut down the Terran at, like, you know, their four command center built. And we we yeah we probably uh, would have been on this map quite a while earlier so Wayne definitely still created opportunities for himself but this is going to put a lot of pressure on him because I think he's going to be avoiding that late game to the best of his chances like he's not going to want to play a late game like that again no I don't think he is I think uh, he showed or he was shown that his opponent's very competent in that stage of the game so now there's just no real reason he'd want to go for that round two so just reset and uh, except this is going to have to be a little bit different. But to be fair, if I back in Wayne here, I think he can play very differently. Like, he does not necessarily always want to play for that late game. So he's very experienced yep. being able to kind of do things differently anyways. So I guess that's kind of a factor as well. Yeah, maybe also Battle B, by the way, wasn't actually intending on playing the late game necessarily like that, but he forgot Combat Shield, remember? It's been a while, but mm. his uh, his timing attacks sort of were thrown out of the window when he realized, wait a second, every single attack with Marines sort of requires that uh, that style to, well, at the very least, have 10 additional hit points on my units. So maybe he also didn't really intend on playing a long macro game there necessarily right from the start, but ended up working out for him there. So far, by the way, just a quick triple CC opener right here for Battle B. Transitioning not so much to watch the starport on the back of it, but a second barracks. Yeah. Second barracks coming up, which means that we can really get set up uh, quite nicely for a couple of moments. Gonna be seeing that factory, gonna relocate a little bit as well. Yeah, just a couple of moments again set. As we have the uh, two barracks coming in, so that will be a lot of Marines, that timing window to get some damage done early. Against a fast lair of Wayne, who's not really going for any other tech alongside this, if Wayne does something like very fast muters here, he could be in a lot of mm -hmm. trouble against like a 16 marine drop. Now, not saying that's definitely what Wayne is going for, but that lair is quick. There's no bane nest down. There's not really any setup at all for the future, so I guess we're about to see. Yeah, no bane nest. Uh, bane link nest. No, no roach warren either. What are the alternatives? Hydra, then I guess. We have seen Mio Micah play with some very quick Hydra Dents. Maybe that is what we have got going over here. I don't think that's the strongest style to go for, but we have no tech at all. It is indeed going to be a straight Spire. Bailing Nest on the back of it as well, so... Wayne is going to... Probably could have started up the Bailing Nest a little earlier in that case if he had money for both, but... Anyways, he apparently felt like he did not need it. But you're absolutely right, though. Marine pushes are scary against this. Now it's just going to be Queens and... A bunch of slows, or not slow Zerklings, but a bunch of regular Zerklings without any upgrades, without any Banelings. Yep, no, it's going to be a little bit of a, a funky one for sure as we get settled up. Just have ourselves a few moments of readying here and wait to see where we go. See it's a 60 Marine drop with 14 Marines. Oh, that's a, that's a new one. 
Yeah, that's a new one. Yeah, sometimes the numbers don't. It's funny because every right? StarCraft fan knows exactly what that means, you know. Oh, there's actually <laughs> even less than that. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> it is really a 60 marine drop, but it's but you know just less marines. <laughs> that only makes sense if you've watched a lot of StarCraft. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like a triple reaper opener with two reapers. It's perfectly viable, but. Anyways, Queen's pretty much the only line of defense, but there are some slow bailings and... Oh, sorry about that, guys. That was room in the plane, but... Didn't they get picked invited. up. They went invited. Yeah. No. <laughs> that medevac is empty, too. I wonder what they said to the medics. Ooh, gotta oh, go wrap around right here on the Hellions. Okay. That'll be slipping up a little bit here in game number two. I was gonna say, not gonna begin hide a second time at this rate. <laughs> a little bit of Ling Bane comes by. Just... Settle down. One on upgrades, combat shield coming about as well. Nine Nuras though, coming up right now for Wayne. And that is where the Zerg will take full map control. I don't think Battle B realizes exactly what he's playing against just yet. Main downside for Zerg with this opener is that those Evo Chamber upgrades are exceptionally late. So Battle B will likely be starting up 2-2 around the time that Zerg starts up 1-1. But these Mutas are completely unscouted. At the very least, I don't think he's seen them yet, but he did start up a missile turret at the third, so that's actually super handy. None of that, though, inside of the main base, and he's actually... Ooh, did he just all army hotkey the Mutas back? I think he did. Yeah. yeah they're a little bit delayed now. Yep, they're going to take a couple moments to get across here, so I'm just waiting for those, and then they'll be able to show up, but missile turrets obviously on the way, and Battleby currently is looking to get set up in a nice way to be able to deal with this, so... I mean, honestly, these mirrors get deflected, and this defense is looking good for now. Looking great so far. Yeah, and this is that moment where I feel like Muta openers just aren't that amazing. You know, like, you kind of rely on tricking your opponent almost, because you delay your upgrades for such a long time. Basically, for the next... Until Zerg finishes up 3-3, if we're ever going to get to that point, but until that moment... Battle B is going to be ahead in upgrades, so all of those Ling Bane fights are going to be a little bit worse for Zerg than they normally would be. Now, of course, we have Mutas instead, which is nice and all, but we see those going down so frequently. So look at that, 2-2 two, two for Terran has already begun a while ago, and now finally 1-1 one, one has started for the Zerg. So these upgrades are so much later than they would be with any other build. No, absolutely. It's a, it's a huge difference that it makes, and it does really add up over the course of time as well, right? So. Upgrades do you cost you. It's one of the prices of going for these mutalisks and having to go for them like you did. I mean, not no one made you do that, but choosing to go for them like you did really does then have that cost of, well, you better, you know, do well with the mutas. And again, if you don't, then yeah. that's kind of on you. That's kind of, uh, I don't want to say your fault, <laughs> but yeah, you know, you put yourself in that position and you're the one that's then got to dig your way out of it. So Battle B is saying, yeah, you want to play passively? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, this one if you want to push me into this corner, that is where I like to live. Remember game number one? This is where I want to be. This is uh, yeah, what, what made me win game one pretty smoothly there. So Battle B, sitting back once more, goes into a, a Thor right now too to really help out. Now you still have to be careful though, because that Ling Bay Muta army is not to be underestimated. Up a ramp into Widowmines. Not where Wayne wants to be, but there are still opportunities here for the Zerg to get some damage in. But Battle B, more than happy to just sit back and, well, keep on macroing. Yep, sit back and chill. I do see him. About to have his 2 2, so he'll be able to take a lot of fights once he has 2 2 from there. And now he's going to maintain an upgrade lead all over again for a long time. And, uh, I mean, I think the biggest concern is, right, your opponent's playing a lot of meters, so if you ever move out onto the map, you're terrified of the counterattack where the Mutas just rip your bases apart, so he's respecting that. He's playing it very slowly instead and just kind of hanging back at home mm. instead, so that's what he goes for. And uh, that's where we currently sit. Yeah, crossing his T's, dotting his eyes over here, grabbing as many of those missile turrets as he feels like he needs. Burrowing, uh, or burrowing Widow Mines Rudder. Here we go, though. This is the moment where apparently the Zerg decides to collapse on top of this entire Terran army. That one Thor having a grand old time. Good splits right there on the Marines on the right side. On the creep, a little bit more difficult to pull off. Now, reinforcing Terran units show up. Stimpak gets reactivated. And that'll be does push back this Zerg force. I'll just push it back. He's chasing down a little bit. He's going to get some creep tumors at the very least. Start to clear up some of the middle of the map. Make the future of this game a little bit more attainable for himself. So away goes Battle B. Off on a little bit of a mission there. A few more of these creep tumors are still going to end up being shot down as well. So we work our way through those. And again, make as much progress as possible as this Widowmine goes off. Splashes some of the Terran units. So not exactly ideal. 
As more Banes come through, obviously still having the creep spread here, but this position from Battle B is pretty darn good. A tank to support it, yeah. reinforcements on the way, catching a bunch of free units. He's getting a lot of shots off on units when they're just kind of arriving and so on, so that's going a huge distance as well. It really feels like Battle B, man. He's up a bit of supply. He's looking good right now. He's got so many Banelings, though, to contest with here in just a moment. The Zerkin count is relatively low, but I'm a little afraid that Battle B could be overextending just a tad. He doesn't really need to be sitting here onto the creep. Now, the Mutas are going across. I like that a lot, although the Widow Mines ooh, just barely get picked off. These Widow Mines also will try and set off, or will be set off, rather, by the Zerk, and ultimately this position will get cleaned up. Lots of Mutas going down, though, in the process. Additional ones popped out of the sky right now, too. Battle be forced to go all the way back home, but I think he will be relatively happy to do so. Here come those Bailings, though, that I was talking about. Widow Mine! Ooh, almost connecting with everything. Yeah, Wayne maybe needs to think about how far he's going to chase, because when the splits come through here, these Bailings are not really finding any good connections. Did we get rid of enough Marines that the Mutas can be effective? Well, at the very least, one away to Ultras now. Wayne ended up doing pretty well i mean he reset a lot of the supply count from his opponent there so that really took a, yeah. a big swing and that's a, a big deal right now i think that was a bit of an overextension right there from Bettleby. just parked out onto the creep taking a little bit of a camping trip right there on the zerk side of the map and then suddenly all of those zerk reinforcements show up i like the transition here towards ultras Mostly because Battle B will be unlikely to really have a ton of ghosts here anytime soon, because you don't really go ghosts against Mutaling Bane-based armies. If you can suddenly show up with a bunch of Ultras here, Wayne may actually be able to catch the Terran off guard. But Planetary Fort is coming up over on the right side of the map. That's going to be the fifth base for Battle B. You should have a very solid economy. Yep. Absolutely. As our Ling Muta just going to take a couple moments, knock down some rocks, open up some space. And we've seen a few Marines come through, and they're going to go after a couple of Crypt Tumors and again just clear up some of the map. But this is a big changing point in the game, because now you're going to see the Ghost Academy comes down. Battle Bee's realizing, okay, I can't just play this aggressive bio game anymore. I'm going to have to have yep. some higher tech support, and that's going to be in the form of those... <laughs> that's disgusting. Um, it's going to have to be in the uh, form of those Ghosts, so he's going to have to slow it down to tech up. And that's just going to, again, change the entire pace of this game, which has been very fast-paced and action-packed so far. That'll be starting to push again, but the Ultras are popping. It is not time to go fighting. Absolutely not. Battle B, by the way, delaying his upgrades. 3-3 for a long while there, and he's still leading as far as those goes. He did not upgrade there because he thought he had an opportunity to win. In the meantime, though, the Muta count, okay, does jump right on top of the missile turret. No easy way of repairing your way out of that. Marauder stimming forward to try and chase down the Mutas, but... They're going to have a tough time as well. And suddenly those Mutas are finally getting some of that value. Push as well onto the creep. I like it, but it's very dangerous when your name is not Clem to micro multiple engagements, especially onto creep. So he does decide to back off and, and chases down these units. Hey, the cheeky little Widow Mine in the corner. Those triple Got some Widow work Mines. Done. Those three Widow Mines off to the right hand side. If that Medivac can kind of bait these Mutas across there, that would be great. They might target fire down the missile turret. Oh. And hoo -hoo, that was dangerous. Yeah, the idea there was very good from uh, Battle B, but the response was better from Wayne, of course, as he is still kind of flying these meters about. I mean, I guess at this point he doesn't really want them, I can only assume, because he's really being quite careless with them. This planetary fortress may live as we lose Ultras. Oh! We're not going to be able to have the DPS to get rid of it. Wayne just throws so much for nothing. Oh my god, that's a huge amount of money given away, and suddenly Battle B has almost doubled the army supply local, and he's coming across the map to fire up a storm. Corrupt as a building, they ain't useful right now. Oh god, he's just lost the game, no? Maybe not lost, I think he may have bad. just lost the game. Yeah, the repair on that planetary was pretty late, and I think he saw an opportunity, but then right at that same time, he, well, activated the repair on all of those SCVs, and then he decided to double down. Suddenly, that Terran army is looking mighty powerful. Corruptors, not the unit necessary here at all. Maybe they were made to try and deal with the Liberator transition, but the Liberator transition is no longer important here for Battle B because he is smelling blood in the water. GG is cold. And it's Battleby who wins a very impressive series here, 2-0 to zero over Wayne. Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, first game was a real showcase of the later game, and it got a little sketchy here in this second game as well, right? You know, there was moments where we're like, okay, this could be kind of, like I say, scary, a little bit weird. But we make it happen, we get there, and Battleby is going to be one of those players to improve to 1-0, and o, which I don't think, especially 2-0 and o over Wayne, who we're used to seeing do well in these events, I think that is going to be a shock for a couple of people for sure so that's a big one and that is going to be a very happy battle b what a way to open up his run in the esl european regionals 
take a look at these updated uh, not standings. I wanted to go to the schedule as we have uh, Battle <laughs> B2 over Wayne, and he has that blue little dot uh, to help signify where he's at in this Swiss group of mana. He's going to be playing against Goblin and for Jumi here in Marine, Harston versus Euthermal, all coming up. StarCraft 2 is going to keep on bounding through the day. We'll see you guys in just a few for that PvP. It's been a little while since we had a PvP, so time to go back to it. We'll be right back after this.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. PvP time has Goblin and Mana look to take each other on in this matchup. PvP, a close one. This is one of the ones I looked at today and I was like, I actually really could see this one go in any which direction. This has no limits in my eyes. I can see this being a couple of long games as well, perhaps. So, very excited for this PvP local. What are your thoughts going into Mana versus Goblin? <laughs> Yeah, difficult one to predict for sure, right? In a way, it's Mana who's been playing this game for a very long time. It's not like Goblin is a, a newcomer by any stretch of the imagination, right? Like, he's been playing this game for a long while too, but this is kind of like a, a newer generation of Protoss taking on a bit of an older generation of Protoss. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Definitely, in my book, this could, yeah, this could really go either way. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, uh... Very fun. The admin is the one holding us up this time around. How about that? Players are ready. We're ready. It's <laughs> just like having a break. Long day for them. As, uh, we are only a few matches left, by the way. Three. Best of threes remain. So really not too bad in terms of scheduling. We are moving along. Of course, again, first couple of days, you know, you expect to see a couple of the maybe one one sided matchups because you've got the, the top guys against the, the bottom end guys as well, right? So, you mm -hmm. know, the first day or two meant to be like this, but... General, we've had some fun games. I think Battleby taking down Wayne is such a cool result as well. Really love that. As uh, and now we are officially allowed to begin. And we're going to kick off onto Oceanborn. Yeah, maybe only our first series of the day was a little one-sided, right? Like that was two Hellbat pushes that in was, a row. And that was very one-sided, yes. I was a little afraid that that was going to be all of our games today after watching yeah. that. Like, oh man, I hope we're going to get some high-level StarCraft 2 and... Well, then the first series is like under 12 minutes of gameplay in total with a good old Hellbat push, which is a build we have seen many, many times before, but it's been very competitive. We've had some very fun matches here for sure. Yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a great time as we ready ourselves up into this next game. I'm going to be starting off in the bottom right side with the Platinum Heroes Protoss player. This is Goblin. And his opponent, up here in the top left, he is Mana. Mana, Mana. What do we say, uh, Horty? I, I say Mana, but everyone's like, it's Mana. Like, same with Mana. Because <laughs> if ma you say Maru, yeah, exactly Maru, the same you thing. have to go with Mana Ma as well. <laughs> yeah, I say Mana. That's how it's said. Mana. Imagine that, having accents, man. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? What a wild it's life. one of the downsides of being like a native English speaker, you know? I feel like people are going to judge you more harshly. Yeah. I can say like aluminum and then any, you know, I, I can go with whatever pronunciation I want. If you're going to yeah. start saying aluminum, people will get upset. <laughs> I know, it's actually crazy. It's okay, I'll get by. There's worse things in the world. <laughs> we'll, we'll live. We've got stuff I think you'll get over it, yeah. Yeah. Well, we can no, Starcraft to watch. Actually we can get over any problem It that actually way. mentally drags me down every day, but <laughs> with the Starcraft here, <laughs> with four weeks of the ESL regionals, I'll be okay. Got uh, a month of Starcraft 2 happening, basically, with loads and loads of games. Every day apart from Mondays, where you have the ESL Open Cups. It's incredible. Perfect. Yeah. A lot of games to watch over there, too. Yeah, man. Probably seen... so, look, quite a few of the same names, too, by the way, which is fun. You seen Rogue coming back? Yeah. Yeah, man. I've been casting a bunch of Rogue games. He's actually yeah. looking so strong. Yeah. What's funny about the Rogue games is that he's playing strategies that are maybe a bit outdated, like strats that were popular a year and a half ago. But macro and micro-wise, he's still got it. So yeah. that's going to be really exciting. Yeah, it's been fun to watch him uh, return. It's really good because he's like, he has a bad seed right now, obviously, because he's not played in any ESL events this year. So he always, like, his first round ESL Open Cup career matchups always, like, you know, this week it was against Classic, which was great for yeah. this game, like, 40 minutes long or whatever. Absolute banger, so, yeah. Oh, I haven't actually seen that one yet. Yeah, that, that one, you, you gotta watch that one. It's a great best of three. That is awesome. Okay, I'll definitely have a look at that as soon as I can. That, uh, that sounds like a blast. It's gonna be a Stargate opener right here, by the way, from Mana. We've already seen a couple of Protoss versus Protoss series today. Looks like everybody's approaching this matchup slightly differently. We already brought it up, but there's been a change in the most recent balance patch to the Sentry. It's now overall just a little bit more sustainable, and would you look at that. Three Sentries, wow. the start of a match? That no, would not have been possible in the previous patch. No. I, I, sometimes you can go like two stalk, you go like three stalkers, three Sentries eventually, but this is three very early yeah. Sentries, right? So, 
Um, this would be considered very greedy in the past. This is manageable now. Again, the sentries do not die as quickly to oracles. So that Stargate open of mana is not going to be like a, oh, just fly two oracles in, you're going to get a bunch of freebies. That's not the case at all, in fact. So, yeah, in that regard, we're looking that pretty and good. Let's just have a few moments of setting up again, PvP. Uh, we'll take a little bit of getting going, especially when we're going to more or less see both of them expanding. It is obviously different pathways. That's a robot facility choice from Goblins, so he's going to set up to kind of play just overall a much more defensive game where Mana will play Oracles into Blink. He's going to be all about that map control, moving around the map, being able to see everything. These are going to be two very different uh, situations here in the near future. Absolutely. It'll be up to Goblin to try and minimize that damage taken. He does go for his own Twilight Council here eventually too, but... He will certainly be the one that needs to deflect whatever mana is going to be sending his way. The first proper unit that's being sent his way is going to be that Oracle. A couple Stalkers being warped in. Good timing on those right here by Goblin. There's not even any probes really to protect yet, but his main base was already sealed off and looking pretty protected as it is. We've got three sentries over there, man. That's an army all on its own. Yep, a triple sentry. On a little bit of a move about. As you see, a couple Stalkers in this sentry coming about also. Just going to be seeing our blink coming through, the gateway still coming up, a couple more probies continuing to come around. And again, just continuing to get that blink on the way in here from mana. But, uh, Goblin's chasing as well, I actually missed the fact that he had Twilight Council, so that's just bad looking at the production tab for me. So yeah, he's going to get the blink up just with that robo already settled, settled. And yeah, that means he can get a prism up nice and quickly as well, so already moving in toward that for the next few moments. Absolutely. Blink is going to be slightly earlier here for mana, but really nothing to write home about. It's one of those situations that's quite difficult to actually estimate. So instead, he's just going to prevent his opponent from easily taking a third Nexus on the back of this. Puts down the Stasis Ward over there, but Goblin no intention of really doing a whole lot of aggression just yet. As a matter of fact, he's building up his gateway count. So we'll have to see what he decides to do here in just a moment. Instant Immortal on the back of this too, though. So we're just happily macroing up. Yep, model on the way. Blink coming up on both sides. The prism continues to go out the far left side. A couple oracles are moving about as well, so away they go. And the sentry is going to start firing also, just going to try and get a little bit of something. As the stalkers, though, intercept the prism, and that is a big deal because that just means Goblin's early mm. investment is already being shut down a little bit. So that just becomes a little bit pricier. And uh, yeah, that kind of sucks, man. You build a robo early, but you lose the prism. Now you lose one of your ways to harass. So that's obviously really not great. Okay, a couple probes here, also in some trouble. Not really getting a lot of counter damage done at all. Just looking at the chat prediction real quick, but apparently 87% of votes are going in favor of mana for this one. That's surprises me a little 87, bit. 87, wow. 87 to 13, yeah. I, in my mind, it's closer to like maybe 60, 40 at best, but... Ah, hmm. Honestly, to me, there's more 50, 50 because Goblin's pretty darn yeah. good. That's some, that's some name recognition right there, but it's not like Goblin's <laughs> yeah. like an unknown name, to be fair. Oh, that's, that's wild. Well, Goblin's been playing for a long time, but I guess not quite as long. Are we going to try again with the Blink? There we go. Not quite as long as Mana. Blink forward Ooh. right now as well, though, from the player in blue. Luckily for uh, Goblin, he does save that Immortal. And honestly, he got punished for it. In the meantime, though, a load of damage is being done in that Mineral Line. Those Oracles swooping back in. Just like that, 11 probes fall on the side of Goblin. Yeah, so Goblin actually losing a lot there. That was a good play by Mana. Very well handled, put himself in a good little position. That was very cool to see. Now we move on and see what the next step of this is going to be. Let's see what the players are going to get up to now. As obviously Goblin is ready to fight across the map, so he does have an army supply advantage. He kind of wants to send this right here, so he is literally mm -hmm. about to do exactly that. He is about to send it. As the Stalkers gather, Pylons, Battery, all coming through as well. So I'm just going to bring all of that up for the moment. And see where we go as yeah. the Stalkers do a few more shots of damage. He's going to take that Nexus, though, over at the third base right now. Warps in a bunch of Dark Templars, hoping to maybe even out that work account a little bit. Working, uh, yeah, from a uh, an income deficit is always difficult, especially in the mirror matchups. But just Stasis Warps over here, okay. That Dark Templar, though, having a grand old time. The very least creating a distraction, and sometimes that's an opportunity for the aggressive player to move forward, and that's exactly what Goblin decides to do right now. Okay, there's the sentry with the guardian shield really helping out quite a bit, but still Dark Templar dealing damage. And when you look at the work account right now, it's pretty much even again, Wardy. It is indeed. It is uh, going to be leveling out completely as we do have ourselves the, well, few DTs continue to come about and just going to keep on swiping around for a little bit here. Keep our stalkers on the move. And we're going to have ourselves this fight actually breaking out. We do have mana trying to jump in. He gets rid of the immortal straight away, so that's going to be a good grab. 
I mean, is that going to be enough? The army supply of mana definitely starting to look a little bit better. We'll lose a couple of the oracles, but that means three shots onto the stalks of his opponent. He blinks to chase mm -hmm. down. And I think he's going to be loving this situation. Absolutely. Goblin Doe finishing up the third Nexus right now at the bottom of the map. So he is going to be able to start transferring some of the probes over in that direction. Income wise, it's not looking all too bad anymore here for Goblin. Mana uh, right now. Okay, still in a little bit of trouble. He's really struggling shutting down the Dark Templar. I mean, now he's body blocking it. That's something, but he needs to get some reliable detection out here. It's surprising. He's like, guys, let me go in. Yeah. <laughs> As... <laughs> guys, step aside, please. I, I mean, <laughs> I just it... want to kill some probes. <laughs> he lost one of the oracles, right? So he actually has a lack of yeah. revelations compared to before. So that oracle that went down. I was like, oh, well, that kind of saved you a couple of shots on the stories, but actually, it's a pretty big deal. Because now yeah. SDT gets to work again on that battery. And it gives you a chance to get rid of a pile on the right side. So, Goblin up 15 workers, down a bit of army supply. Mana can't move out because he doesn't really have reliable detection right now. And he's just not mining. So, Goblin is putting himself into a winning position with the DTs absolutely delivering in a huge way. Ghost Dark Templar have been so valuable. And even when you do have an Oracle, these units are very spread out. Obviously, it's a, an energy based cast, right? From the Oracle. Revelation is not just something you can do on cooldown. So you need to have the energy for it, and Goblin is just, yeah, sending in one at a time. Now, luckily for him, he does ultimately, mana that is, he does ultimately get that Photon Cannon done in the natural expansion. But previously, Goblin felt compelled to go for pretty much an all-in, and now it's mana who's going to try and do the same thing. In the meantime, though, Goblin is shutting down the production in the main base, going after the pylons. Yep, I mean, mana is basically all-in with this push across this other side of the map, so he needs to get some work done here. I think he very much so knows that as well. I think he's very aware of the situation that he is playing in right now. And so he's just going to try and make the best of this situation, which is not exactly the prettiest. He continues to try and play on this side, but it is going to be Goblin Hold non defending And it really feels as though this is very likely going to be uh, very much so on the road to a GG because Mana does not have a lot to play with at home. His army's not very strong anymore. I feel like he sees this. I feel like we see this. I feel like this is just a question of time. Absolutely. Goblin may be on the ropes a little bit earlier on in this particular game, but he's now cruising. Feeling comfortable, goes into the fourth Nexus. Man, I could have maybe attempted to cancel that one, but problem is those Immortals, right? They put in so much work, and the Goblin army here is just simply too big. Curious to see what Mana wants to do right now, because sitting back is probably not the play, but what exactly do you do? You have to, I guess, wait until your opponent comes across the map, but there's really no reason for Goblin to be aggressive. Unless Goblin feels like he can win the game right now, and he may very well be able to. He could just sit back and happily mech her up until he's, well, maybe a little closer to maxing out. Ultimately, he doesn't really need to. I think he's gonna think he swap in now. as many units as he can. Yeah, he I just send it. Yeah, he has the prism out. There's no reason not to kind of go poke the other side and see what you can do, so... I think it's time we go, go, go. Here we go, Absolutely. making that move. So we are gonna head across the map as Goblin. His army supplies up by 20, I just managed... It's not just numbers, I feel like it's the tech as well, although Mana's about to have a second Immortal. He doesn't have a Prism to micro those Immortals, so they're immediately going to be vulnerable in comparison to Goblins. And uh, Goblin is obviously up a base as well, so you know, even if he just trades decently here, he's continuing to put himself in a great position. Super Battery will pop, and Goblin will respect that back away for a couple of seconds. Not make this too crazy a situation. No reason for him to really take any risks. The cooldown of that ability is quite long, so Mana's not going to be able to chain that. He will have it available again in maybe a half minute to a minute or so from now, but that will not be for this particular battle. And this is, yeah, Goblin just plowing through whatever he can hit right now. Those Immortals of his are having a grand old time. There is still one Immortal in blue also helping out at the bottom of this engagement. But that guy, he's got his work cut out for him, but now oh, he's no. dead. So, <laughs> GG. It's Goblin who wins game number one after falling pretty far behind not that long ago. Yeah, no, he, um... It really looked as though he was in a bit of trouble, but man, the DTs just did work. And yeah. they did more than just work. Like, they went overtime. And I guess that's why Twitch chat only put 13% on Goblin, because they didn't see the DTs coming. Always expect the DTs, guys. Well, they're invisible. How can you see something that's invisible? Well, that's that's the talent of being a good StarCraft player. Mm. Seeing invisible things. Yeah, they have that blurry on the you, you see a lot of things that are just... You can't... Okay, that's... Mm. Well, as, as a great StarCraft player, I can see my demise every game to my own supply blocks, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. No, those ZTs put in a, a ridiculous amount of work, right? And it can only trace back to those oracles. First off, putting in a ton of work in the natural, and then, well, not being around to defend at home. 
I guess that made the uh, the defense against those Dark Templars so tricky. And they, they just kept putting in work. You must have killed like two dozen workers there. Oh, you know, that was a... Uh, it, it was a lot of kills. It was just disruption of the mineral lines. You were having a body block. You couldn't go across the map. You name it, the DTs yeah. screwed it up, basically, for mana. And uh, heading into game number two, he's going to be hoping for the reset here. Let's see if he can get it going. It's Ghost River as our map. So let's jump on in and see whether mana can bring it back to a game three. Or if Goblin is going to send it. I mean, we talked about this map being shorter and aggressive. But it is still kind of hard to push into three bases. I feel like that's the biggest challenge of this map. So does that affect us in PvP? Well, I guess if we get there, it does. But getting there may be the challenge as we head into this one right now. It is going to be to start everything off on game number two. The blue Protoss player in the top left corner of the map, Mana. And his opponent, up 1-0 in this best of three series, he is Goblin. Only 13% of guys in the chat ended up voting for it. I can't believe it. I can. Twitch chat being Twitch wrong? Chat wrong? Do you think again? that's possible? No. Yeah. No, 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 no. No? Twitch chat is never wrong. Okay. It's one of the beauties of Twitch chat, Wardy. The beauty of that is that people can type anything they want in the chat right now about you. Can you just <laughs> confirm they're never wrong? They would never write something bad. No. I don't believe that. No, no, no. Well. <laughs> it's the internet, Wardy. Nobody writes anything evil ever. I'm way too emotionally invested in what gets said in chat two minutes from now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So Ghost River has that very quick air-to-air -air rush distance in particular. So if you go for a Prism or, for example, an Oracle, you can get it across the map significantly faster than on other maps. Besides that, the ground-to-ground -ground is also quite quick, especially when you knock down the rocks. You mine out those mineral fields up to the northern sections of the map. So this can be a very aggressive map, but we have seen some trouble, like you were saying earlier, with players able to get into the opponent's third base. So even though it's like a flat piece of terrain and you can sort of fight over at the third base location, those rocks really tend to get in the way that are blocking that spot. And it's um, it's actually quite a dynamic map. The Even yeah. though it doesn't look particularly complex at first glance, because it seems like just a, a very cheesy map, I guess, with a lot of quick rushes and stuff, it's, it's a lot more strategic than just that. It's a surprising map, right? Like, I, I think it really is because, like, you don't expect a lot from it. And then it's like, hey, look, I actually provide really good games. And you're like, whoa, I'm pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I feel like that happens a lot with me on this map. So, hmm. like, I like from I, I'm, I'm kind of like I wanted to hate it when I saw it was in the map pool. But the more I see more games, and I'm like, man, yeah, I guess you didn't suck as much as I remembered. you. So good job. <laughs> Well, to be fair, you also did cast a lot of the TOMC games, right? So some of the maps are genuinely not as great as some of the others. And although, honestly, sometimes it's like an acquired taste almost, right? You have to you have to see a map a bunch of times. You have to see how it really develops or for you to appreciate it a little bit more. But yeah, it's been a lot of fun to watch the games develop so far. Anyways, we've got ourselves a proxy pylon going up for Goblin on the other side of the map. Probe Scout from Mana just got the ninth, and there's a proxy gate. Proxy gate in it up. So we are just going to get aggressive here from Goblin as Mana tries to expand. Goblin wants to punish it straight away. This is a very Goblin move. It's going to be four gateways in total. He's won against Max Max a few times with this. So uh, mm -hmm. definitely don't uh, disregard his four gate. He's very good at being aggressive. And he has some potential here as he gets ready to go. Absolutely. A good old four gate. A build order that we have seen ever since the early days of StarCraft 2. Not the go-to anymore, by any stretch of the imagination, but it can still certainly catch players off guard. Mana, though, does already have that Robo facility, right? So he's actually Crota boosting out an Immortal right now. He's got a bunch of sentries, too. Obviously, those sentries are very good defensively as well, going for the additional shield battery. Shield batteries are going to be powered with a pylon that's on the high ground. So Mana is set up for the defense, but it's still very difficult to handle. Yeah, it's definitely anything but easy. At this point in time, as we do have our units getting ready to start pressing forward, it's going to be time to go, go here. In just a moment from Goblin, a couple of hallucinated stalkers love that. If you can absorb a couple of immortal shots, that would be Ooh. great. As he gets good force fields, honestly, he's going to be able to fight those uh, sentries quite nicely. And uh, Super Battery already having to pop, but the immortal can't join the fight. I think that's pretty okay as well. The sentries trying to tickle each other a little bit. I mean, their, their tickle beams do a lot more damage now than they used to, but it is kind of funny to watch that fight, and basically nothing other than the hallucinations ended up dying there. I don't think we saw a single unit falling. Either way, 
That is a good start, of course, for Mana, who does have a slight economical advantage, plus the Defender's advantage, plus, of course, the Immortal production. Okay, ooh, Sentry's over, oh, this time, very exposed. We do have a Prism picking up the weakened units. Yep, Prism doing what it can. We do see the few Sentries still pinging away. Just gonna be pushing forwards. Force Fields continue to come down. Not great at the moment, honestly, for Goblin, because he just can't really fight nope. with everything because of those Force Fields. The batteries are about to be drained of energy, but we're just not quite there yet. You know, we don't have quite enough done. As Mana is holding on, and if a hold is made, then Mana is going to be loving his spot in this game. Absolutely. The um, Immortal production right now is amazing. Second Immortal just became available, and I think the two Immortals and a Prism alone can kill yeah. this entire army here from Goblin. They're so powerful. Obviously, don't lose the Prism. That would be a disaster, but he's trying his very best to just... Yeah. yeah, Goblin is trying his very best to just deal whatever damage he can, but I don't think this is really going to work out. Lovely control yeah. here by Mana. Keeps everything alive for the time being. Yeah, I was going to say, these sentries are actually packing more of a punch than I thought they would, but uh, I guess that is the new sentry buff, and at the end of the day, it's still just not enough, right? And these couple of devs are going to start moving through, and it really does seem as though we are getting into a better and better spot here for our, um, for our Blue Protoss, looking to even up this series, take us to one and one, and take us to a game three. Is It's really just a battle against those sentries, but... I mean, without an expansion or anything, I mean, even these Adepts right now might be able to shade through into the main. Goblin doesn't see it, so he obviously is not in a position to take damage. Uh, that's no. obviously really not ideal. No, not ideal is uh, one way to put it for sure. <laughs> that is not ideal here for Goblin whatsoever, who was already all-in, but now he's even more all-in. He's all-inner. That's all I got, anyways. Triple he's Immortal is just insane. Yeah, yeah he's all-inner right the now. The pretty good, man. Immortals are pretty I mean, good. They haven't died. They haven't yep. died. They're immortal. Kind of had it in the name, I guess. Up to that name. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, beautiful and synchro. More beautiful. Those, uh, those sentries actually. So I, I still kind of look at sentry battles. I find myself looking at these sentry fights. I'm like, oh, the sentries don't really deal any damage, but they're really they putting do, man, quite they, a bit of work. They yeah, they really do deal more damage than you expect them to. It's funny how that works. Mm -hmm. Oh no, they they pack a punch for sure. They do not mess around in the slightest. So. Uh, as we head into well, game especially three. with that first fight, you know, like that first fight put me in a bit of a lull there because in that first fight, we just yeah. saw a bunch of force fields going out and nothing actually died. <laughs> but then the follow up attacks, those sentries put in the work for sure. They absolutely did. Yeah, they, yeah the sentries were uh, a good showing. It, it's funny, you know, because like initially it's like sentries don't do much, but it's because of the force fields, not the fact that the sentries yeah. can't do anything, right? So. It just kind of exactly. changes up why they can't do anything. But, uh, you know, they actually do pack. Like, when they were fighting at the end, I was like, are these immortals ever going to kill the sentries? Because the sentries are just, like, whacking away. Like, I thought mm -hmm. they were going to get a kill. If there wasn't a battery there, maybe they could have done. So, uh... Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to jump nice, into... Uh, nice work right there, though, by Mana. It's good to see him uh, evening up the score here. Yeah, and especially... maybe that means Twitch chat was indeed right. Well, not yet. Right now, it's, uh... One one, you know. So no one's right. Yeah, yeah. No one voted for the no draw. One's... Everybody's been wrong. <laughs> so dumb going to one one. You guys didn't predict this. Oh. <laughs> the series still has to be played out, already. We we, oh. we still have one map coming. No, well, you, we can't just call it now. Just to prove Twitch shots wrong. <laughs> you, you would do that just to prove that Twitch chat is wrong. No, just to prove that wow. you were wrong because you said Twitch shots always right. Well, it's I said personal. that, and then I saw Kalaris type in the chat that Twitch chat is always wrong. So if I say Twitch chat is always right, and Kalaris in the chat says that Twitch chat is always wrong, we end up with Schrodinger's Twitch chat, I guess. It doesn't really... <laughs> it's wrong Anyways, and right at the same time. We don't know until we open the chat. <laughs> Our final game in this best of three. It's going to be an Al uh, or El Cyony. There you go. Alcione is what you can say as well, I guess. I've heard multiple pronunciations. So spotting right here in the bottom left-hand corner. He is Mana. And in the top right-hand side from the Platinum Heroes, looking to recoup his winning streak from the start, it is going to be Goblin. Alrighty, trying to bring a cheeky all-in in game number two. Didn't really work nearly as well as he, of course, hoped, but when you're 1-0 ahead in a best of three series, you have a little bit of room to play. So let's see what Goblin actually intended on going for, you know? What, what did he have prepared? Say he lost game number one, what would he have done in game number two? I don't think he would have gone for that same build. You don't think so? I think he does. No. I think yeah, you think like, so? Yeah, I think he likes it. His ability does okay. a lot. But yeah, I think... I mean, maybe not, but 
I think Goblin believes in those aggressive games just as much as he... It's PvP. I think you have to believe in those kind of aggressive games just as much as you believe in the other games. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I kind of think he might have done. Yeah, I guess if you occasionally win with a build like that against, for example, Max Specs, you get a lot of confidence with it, too. It's true. Confidence is key. I think it's just when you're down a game, you do what you're comfortable with. I genuinely do believe that's what Goblin is comfortable with, you know, so... Hmm. Yeah, fair. All right, let's see what, what we have from both of the players here. Goblin with a little bit more gas mind so far. Taking that gas, guys, are just a bit earlier. Cyber cores are done right now. Okay, we have a sentry and a stalker on one end of the map. And actually, Mana decided to cancel the second stalker and also build a sentry of his own. I'm so glad the sentries showed up in the PvPs after we really talked about them in the very first PvP of the day and then we proceeded to see no sentries across three games. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we the found Asian them. server PVPs. Yeah, we we didn't really see a whole lot of them. It's like, wait, <laughs> did, did, did we forget to patch Asia? Like, what happened? <laughs> the Europeans generally play it all a little bit differently. I mean, to be fair, that was Nanami versus Haas. So I, yeah, we shouldn't have gotten our hopes up. I don't know, man. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow. Well, the, uh... In case you missed it, we have about four weeks of uh, non-stop StarCraft coming your yeah, way. We do. So non-stop. If you uh, if you are tuning in right now, today is the first day of this long-running tournament, so you can basically tune in every day except Mondays, right? Is what you said because that is the day that the ESL, ESL Open, Open Cups Cup. are running. Yeah, we take a break on Mondays. There's lots of StarCraft. tournament games. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, if Mond you're tired of StarCraft, you can watch more StarCraft. Yeah, sadly, guys, on Mondays <laughs> you have to watch StarCraft on a different channel. Sorry. <laughs> and we, we actually only have three tournaments that day that span across like 12 hours of the day, so... You know. So rather than a 12-hour tournament day, we have a 12-hour tournament day, is what you're saying? Yeah, well, instead of one tournament, it's three tournaments, you know, so... Yeah, this is a bit rough. I mean, tomorrow you can even start your day with GSL before Asia starts, so... That is also going to be a lot of fun. Come on. Not bad. The game's been running for nearly a decade and a half and still tons of tournament content for StarCraft fans out there. We do have a Twilight Council here, a little bit quicker for Mana. He's going to be going into that Blink upgrade once again. Goblin prioritizing the Robo facility, but following it up as well with a Twilight Council of his own. That means he's going to be able to get that Prism out. He can start zooming around the map. Yeah, got the Prism, takes the map control. Remember that first game, Goblin lost his Prism so early on, so he never even got a chance to show what he could do with the Prism or anything of the sorts there, so that was a little bit unfortunate. I'm just... Uh... Do you go with the prism about? Hallucination tries to move through, but nothing to come of that just yet. Let's do have a dark shrine building from Goblin, so we got that ready to rumble. Absolutely. Delaying his blink upgrade or anything along those lines for quite a while, and that means that mana, okay, he's not going to be relying on, well, any sort of, uh, for example, oracles for detection this time around, because those DTs in game number one certainly did a lot of work for Goblin. Mana just going straight into the Robo facility here. Get some more of that reliable detection going instead. I love the reliable detection. Yeah. Feels good, man, you know. Have an observer that should never die until your opponent's op shows up and you snipe it. <laughs> yeah. Only invisible units can see each other. Unless they're roaches. It's so sad though as well, like... Because I actually think that first game with two oracles, and he only just lost one of them as it kind of like flew in. It wasn't even really targeted. Yeah. It. And like, if he has that second oracle to provide extra revelations, he would have really minimized the losses. And then, you know, Matt was in a good spot initially, right? The DTs are really what killed him. So, just had that oracle, who knows how differently that game one could have gone. So yeah, I think he's going to take mm -hmm. no uh, no second guesses this time around. He's going to be safe, secure. It's game three. It's an important kind of you know momentum builder. If you win this one. You go into round two feeling great. I think that's a big deal. Absolutely. Yeah, you get to lose three series with the format that we have. So it's not like you're out of the tournament right from the start. But of course, you end up moving on if you end up winning three series. So it is much nicer if you uh, get your first win under your belt. So we just have a nice little macro game here for the time being. Nothing all too aggressive from either player. They understand how important this match is. Looks like it's going to be Goblin who will be moving across the map first. Yeah, well, Goblin has a bit of a timing because he has the power of the two immortals, right? So it's definitely mm -hmm. like this kind of powerful moment where it's like, hey, I'm about to have Blink myself. If you're not being aggressive, 
these two immortals are going to question whether Mano has enough to defend or not. And if he doesn't, then you can maybe get a cancel up on the third base. That would be huge. If Mano's got enough, then that's all good. But him not being on the map actively with the blink and taking advantage of that blink is definitely why Goblin is here. You can mm -hmm. already see now, Mano's already had to blink back once. He does have a battery. He does have sentries. And I think Goblin's realizing that overall, this is probably enough to play defensively Ooh. with. So we're going to be okay as our stalkers come through. And a little bit of a chase down happens. Yeah, those Immortals are so incredibly powerful here. Force fields all around as well. I like that exchange a lot, though, for Goblin, getting a, a lot of his expensive units here from Mana. Mana only has one Immortal when raining right now. Looks like the Archon is going to fall. Shield battery is nice, but battery overcharge was already used previously, so he's not going to have it for another little bit. Nope, not going to have it for a little while here. We're just going to see ourselves. The unit's still powering away. I mean, we need to get rid of that Immortal. If we can get rid of that one Immortal, that would be huge right now, Mana. Obviously, he needs to find a way to accept board. There it is. There's the dive. Immortal for an Immortal, but that's fine because he got an extra Immortal here still as Goblin. And this is definitely looking good for him as he backs it up a little bit. But, I mean, he's still pressuring that base. And as long as this base takes damage, Mana is essentially just forced to fight into him. Absolutely, yeah. Those shield batteries are really powerful. He's got four of them, but the Nexus is not covered by it. So Goblin can just sort of sidestep a little bit further towards the right here. Okay, there's another battery overcharge. Goblin decides to back off for a little bit, but I don't think he's going to be gone. I think he's going to be back in just a second because he's got an opportunity to kill his opponent's Nexus. Now, he doesn't really need to do it because Mana actually is quite far behind when it comes to the worker count at this point in time. But I think Goblin is feeling like he can get a snipe on that Nexus and getting a snipe on that Nexus is probably getting a snipe on this entire series. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge thing, right? So why not just go for it? it at the end of the day, it's very hard to kind of oh. run up here and lose everything terribly. This is the Immortal now. Maybe that's the end of yeah. this because now you don't have that any longer. Maybe it is time to back it up. But um, I don't mind him for trying because he's in a good enough position that it's hard to lose so much considering most of his stalkers, uh, army is blink stalkers. It's hard to lose so much kind of attacking in that you kind of die afterwards, right? So why not give it a go, try to get that base? In this case, it didn't work out, but yeah, he's one Immortal worse off at this stage of the game. I think that's fine. Double Forge right now going down for Goblin. He also already finished the Dark Shrine. We have Charge about halfway done. So he's ahead in Economy. He's ahead in Army. He's ahead in Tech. He's ahead in every pillar of the game. He's even taking another Nexus on the right side too. Now, it is important that he doesn't get carried away because it can still slip out of your fingers very, very easily. So I quite like here. Yeah, Goblin just going back home. Try to lean into that advantage for at least a little while. All of this gets scouted right now though by one lonely Adept. Waiting for a recall? Never gonna get it. No. He's like, I was Set promised a way out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, Man, buddy. I did not get him uh, the full story. Back to IFEU. 1-1, one, one, charge. All building up. Uh, again, Goblin just taking advantage of the fact he has a chance to attack up now. He's down on the attack upgrade, right? But going double upgrades, and again, shit, a number of units is likely gonna power him through upgrades. Only really matter when the game is close. When the game is not very close in the mirror, Usually the, the upgrades don't have too much of an impact. In a situation like this, the numbers are just so much more valuable, so... Yeah. yeah. That's uh, kind of the way we're heading, and we are basically waiting to see how aggressive Goblin wants to be. Does he want to go fight in again? What is his plan going to turn out to be? What will work? I think so. Out? Yeah, he, he's got a pylon set up over at the gold base, so that, I guess, is his alternative. He knows that there is a new base building right now for mana all the way on the left side of the map. So even just getting a council on that, forcing the council on that would be absolutely massive. So that's exactly what he decides to go for. Just try and shut that down. Shut it down, get out, or just fight. Yeah, if it's mostly just Blink Stalkers right now for mana. It's actually exclusively Blink Stalkers here for mana. Okay, well, maybe chase it for a little bit and then go back home. I mean, this is super painful for mana because slowly he's fizzling out here, right? Like Goblin is going to max out within a minute or two. And Mana is not even going to be remotely close. His economy is nothing to write home about here. He doesn't have good tech. I mean, I guess his upgrades are decent. He's going to finish up plus three eventually, but uh, this is a tough one for Mana for sure. What in the world do you do? Yep, yep, yep. I'm just going to be seeing our uh, Stalkers and Mortals continue to come about. Because he have a dark shrine of his own. No, he never made the dark shrine here either, so he doesn't really have that comeback. He's, he's got potential. no comeback potential, right? Yeah. PvP, yeah. it's there's, like there's really nothing. Yeah. It's so sad. It's like do you have DTs? Do you have disruptors? No. Well, okay. I mean, at this point, Mana's best bet would be split his army and like fight multiple places, but he doesn't really have yeah. the army size to do that either. And Goblin has the map control to stop him setting that up. So 
all of the outs for mana seem to be blocked off, <sighs> apart from just Another trying one. to survive. And yeah, you can't get this fourth base up. I mean, do you just kind of eat across the map and just hope his mana at this point? I mean, probably not, but... He's going to have to. I, I don't really think he's going to have an alternative here. He hopes, though, I guess, that he can use those batteries to his advantage. Now, this is pretty good with a lot of those units stuck between the golden minerals, but ultimately, Goblin's army is just so much better. I don't think mana is going to get a much better opportunity than that. He wants to yeah, get to the safety of those batteries. There's the overcharge as well. Immediately, Goblin decides to go back home. He doesn't really need to fight here. He did, by the way, Goblin that is make another Nexus. So now there's a Nexus building at the Golden Mineral line, and that is going to extend his lead even more. Now, that being said, though, Mana's still alive. If he would have been able to finish up a fourth Nexus, this would have actually been quite playable. But him, yeah, getting that one canceled twice is super rough. It's another unit now scouting yeah. that six o'clock position, too. So what in the world do you do here as Mana? Nothing. I think. <laughs> I, I think really not much, Cry. much at all. Yeah, it, it's just rough, man. It's just I rough. think I think going into disruptors is an option. Maybe he could have fired that up a little bit sooner. Like if you need a comeback potential, a big Nova is the way to do it. It wouldn't be super reliable, but at least there's always a chance that your opponent makes a mistake. If we're gonna keep playing these armies, it's, it's very tricky. Yeah, I, I mean, he's making his way to it now. Could you have done it sooner? Yeah, perhaps. I mean, maybe that's just a risk you take, right? Because you should be able to identify that the way this game has gone has not benefited you at all. Like, you've not done anything to really hurt your opponent. And, well, oh. this blink in is pretty much just going to be the, the final blow. As mana has to type out, GG, well played. Goblin proves the Twitch chat is never right. <laughs> never. 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 You went You went as far as Kalaris with that one. I went as far Very as Kalaris. Very nice. Yeah, Kalaris also said that Twitch chat is never right, so. Oh, you know. Anyways, nicely played away. though by Goblin here. Yeah, man. Game number three looking very dominant. Game number two didn't quite work out in his favor, I guess, but that was a, you know, effectively just an extended one base all in, and Mana handled that quite well. Maybe the century changes make that a bit easier too. But game one and, and, and three here, um, the ones that he ended up winning, I mean, he, he looked solid. Yeah. Not really oh. making a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Oh, it was. Uh... That was a, a convincing series from Goblin. Gets me excited to see Goblin in the next round as he'll move to 1-0, of course, joining many others here so far. So uh, with that said, we are going to be taking a couple of moments to head across into this uh, next matchup. As you can see, this one is maybe more of the one, more one-sided ones today in history and in expectations. And that is because it's going to be, of course, Hero Marine taking on Fujumi, where Hero Marine is going to be a pretty hefty favorite. So definitely expecting that to be a... Uh, uh, kind of the expectation. We'll see if what Jimmy can bring up a surprise. That last match of Group A, we've got that single Group B matchup coming up afterwards. So we'll be heading into that shortly. Austin Mutham will round out the day. Two best of three is left. And we'll see you guys in just a few to get that going.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back. It is time for Jumi versus Hero Marine as we are ready. Hopefully the players are as well. Twitch chat is ready to see Hero Marine destroy apparently 99% local was telling me in the break. Wow. It's 98 now. I guess a couple of Fuyumi, uh enjoyers decided to come and clutch and put a few points on the line as well okay, for him. 98. But... <laughs> Yeah, it's still heavily well. favored for Hero Marine as of, uh, well, as of right now. Submissions are still open, so make sure you participate in the chat as well. Our... There's one more series after this one, right? Yeah, we are, we're almost at the end of the day, man. It's kind of flown yeah. by a little bit. Like, we've not had the longest games. I wouldn't say we have the shorts. We did have a 30-minute TBC, no. so... It's, uh, after this, we're going to have Harstam going up against Euthermal. We already brought it up. Euthermal is playing a random, which... According to Wardy, has never happened before in the ESL event. I didn't uh, want to make that claim, but I, I don't I, remember no, the last time it's in happened. One of, in one of these regionals, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not. Because yeah. the regionals are just a few years old, so I feel like we would have known about it or remembered it. Um, mm -hmm. It might have happened in like, the history of... It's definitely happened in the history of StarCraft. It depends what you kind of count as like these events, right? I would count these as like since we started doing these online events. So yeah, yeah. Since then, I'm pretty sure it's the first time. Alrighty, well here we go. Game number three in our, or sorry, game number one rather in our next best of three series. Spotting right here in the bottom left -hand corner of Amphion, he is Hero Marine. In the top left hand side, we're gonna have ourselves the blue Protoss player. It's for Jumi. The good old Terran versus Protoss. Yeah, I like this matchup. It's fun. Mm -hmm. It's fun, there's lots a of little different bit of openings. A mix up too. Yeah. yeah. There's just a lot of ways to kind of play it out and everything, so yeah, really enjoy this one. I always think it's good and obviously excited to see what we get here. Between here Marine and Fujumi throughout the course of this best of three. I feel like it's probably gonna be a lot of Fujumi trying to play a bit of trickery perhaps, or trying to get a sneaky one. I mean it's just a rough draw. Not only is Hero Marine one of the tougher opponents, just you know, statistically Fujumi has never been able to do much against Hero Marine at all, so it's uh yeah. Gonna be a tough one mentally for Fujumi as well to be like, hey, never beaten this guy before. What do I change to do that? Well, yeah, that, <laughs> if you knew that, you wouldn't have been losing to him all this time, right? Yeah, that's the tricky part, right? Like, Terran has quite a few builds that are pretty safe against practically everything, so it's not like you can just go for a really cheeky opener and just try to catch them off guard. Not exactly sure if Hero Marine is gonna necessarily play like the safest style either, because he does, of course, like being in your face and. Well, just doing that Terran thing where they're just trying to be as annoying as possible in the earlier stages, right? But I do agree with you, just playing a straight up macro game right here against the biggest of gapes is going to be very tricky. That's exactly what Hero Marine likes to do. He's been competing at a high level for many, many years, and it's never going to be an easy opponent. He's never been. Nope, he's never been an easy opponent. He's not going to suddenly become an easy opponent. That much is for sure. You see this Reaper escaping back up the left hand side. He's just getting out of there for the moment. Getting out of trouble. I'm going to go cause some trouble in the base of his opponent. So, away we go. Trouble on bound, on route into the main. Obviously, would like to scout. Stargate is being built here, and that Reaper has a free way to go see it. As this Reaper is going to get a probe as well. Adeptus wasn't here, and that is going to be one dead probe. Looking for two, but it's going to be scary with the other probes chasing back. So, a good little bit of control at the end there to help you save a second probe. Here, Marine gets out of there with that Reaper, and did see the Stargate along the way. Absolutely. Seeing the Stargate is very nice. It automatically means that, for example, sending, in an extreme example, a Raven across the map, right, against a Phoenix opener, that would be quite suboptimal. I uh, don't want to be losing any of your units for free, so maybe it's going to push Hero Marine into a bit more of a defensive position as far as flying units go, but there's no denying that this also sort of forces for Yumi into, or for Jumi into a more... Yeah, defensive spot too, right? Usually these Stargate openers do lead towards Colossi eventually, and well, you can keep the Terran, you can keep the Terran occupied. It is, it is going to be Phoenixes, by the way. He decided to hide what he was going to make, but I mean, if you're going to hide it, it's probably going to be Phoenixes. Either way, um, this pretty much always leads towards a bit more of a macro focus style from the Protoss too, so I think Hero Marine will be more than happy to play against this. Yeah. No, I think so. That's, uh... I think, honestly, Hero Marine's just like, cool, Phoenix, well, I know a bunch of good timers that work well against Phoenix, and that's what Hero Marine loves in this TVP. Hitting you and hitting yep. you hard at the right kind of time to just punish what you're doing. He's very good at that. I'm really expecting to bring it out in this series because 
yeah, I don't think Hero Marine's here to mess around. I think he means business when he shows up to these events. And he knows that he's going to be a favorite against Fujumi. He knows it's going to be tough for Fujumi to get through to the long game. So why not try and pressure that point early and just have a quick, easy round one? That's his expectation. It's up to Fujumi to kind of uh, disrupt that and to kind of, you know, disrupt our expectations of that as well. So let's see what he tries to do again. Just Phoenix into Robo, probably Colossi. Just going to play it very safe initially here on Amphion and just work from there. Yeah, absolutely. There are, of course, some powerful timing attacks. We've already seen Terrans mess around a little bit with the left side of the map in particular, mine out those resources and try to push through that left section of the map. It is only accessible after either destroying a bunch of rocks or after going for those mineral fields. There's that Robo Bay. We are going to make a safety immortal in the meantime. So for Jumi, just going for the macro game so far. Not really trying to trick his opponent. He's going to try and test the waters and see where he's currently at. So he's letting Hero Marine do whatever he likes. Hero Marine is going to get rid of that bunker. Realizes he doesn't need it. But there's the stim pack, there's the combat shields and the plus one infantry weapons. All of those are going to finish up right around the same time. It's going to be a nice little power spike for those Marines. Yeah, I mean, once those Marines are powered up, that's obviously going to be one of our first time is get across and see if there's anything we can do with them. So we'll be kind of keeping our eyes on that. And as well as these went down, Marines that are already chasing the Phoenix back a little bit. The Robo Bay is about to finish up as well, so that's going to be online in the next few moments. The Marines get here. Phoenix, very nearly goes down. Not quite, though. Just about able to survive off over to the side. Okay, and here we go. We are going to start mining out some of those mineral fields, it looks like. I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to be for aggression, because at this point, there's no siege tanks, there's no widow mines, or, or sorry, <laughs> widow mines, well, there's no widow mines either, but there's no medevex is what I was going to say. I think this is just for Hero Marine to maybe find a base that he can easily expend to and send some SCVs across. He is, however, marching right now. Any Stimpak is going to be costly, because these units are going to deal damage to themselves. He Battery's finds one of the Immortals, though. Yeah, oh. Shield Battery is not done yet. Colossus is not here yet. Immortal is going to not be targeted, but he's going to get a really good trade against these very expensive units. Now, finally, the Phoenixes do show up. Oh, my Colossus God. Colossus is going to pop oh out right my. now, but that is so much damage. My God, he got the Immortal, too, at the end. Yeah, it's very smart to ignore the Immortal at first, right? Because the Immortal doesn't yeah. really do great against Marines. What's the Immortal good at? Not dying quickly. So actually, if you hit the Immortal, the problem is, is that then you're wasting loads of shots on it. But realistically, an Immortal doesn't kill Marines quickly. It chunks, and it doesn't really do much. And it chunks again, like, you know, the other units were way better targets. And that was a massive trade for Hero Marine. Yeah. Resources lost twice as efficient Perfect for him. Perfect timing too, right? Like, he, yeah. he finished that fight basically as the Colossus spawned. Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely spot on. Takes a third base now, and this is already a great spot, because now Fujimi's going to struggle to have the right amount of tech units up to really defend against future attacks. This is already trouble across the board for Fujumi. Perfect timing right there by Hero Marine, catching his opponent off guard. And any timing attack right now from Protoss has been thrown out of the window. Not really a whole lot you can do here as Fujumi, other than just sort of take your expansion and try to macro here from behind. But this is that moment in the game that already can be really scary for Protoss when everything is normal. Right now you're finding yourself pretty far behind against a Terran. And then it's a Terran as well of Hero Marine's caliber. Yeah, this is rough. There's a Ghost Academy coming up as well, so that is going to make any sort of charge slots, any sort of, well, Archons, any 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 real Protoss army a little bit easier to deal with. And Hero Marine, just tidying up the game a little bit, getting the perfect trade there earlier on. Scar just done, uh, he's going to start pumping out some more army units here. Should be seeing some Vikings momentarily too. Yeah, well, he knows what his opponent's doing as well, right? So he knows it's about Phoenix Colossus, and so if you're doing that, Viking count is king. You get enough Vikings up, you can trade with the Colossi in a big way, or the Phoenix in a big way, that opens the door to eating up the Colossi. There's just a lot you can mm -hmm. do there in general, um, so it kind of makes sense. And Yeah. Yeah, this Protoss army is not very good without the Colossi, right? Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> without the Colossi, there's like four units left over. So if you can deal with those, uh, you can probably just push for the win. The only thing I don't quite like here for Hero Marine is that he didn't fire up any 2-2 research yet, so he's really, I guess he's really committing to a big push. Yeah, I mean, just delaying the tech for the or delaying the upgrades for the tech instead is a very common thing to do at this kind of point in the yeah. game, right? Two two versus like double tech because you, you basically go ghosts or Vikings okay, or both, well. and then no upgrades. This is just going to be a one sided fight. That's an absolute stomp. And uh, now it's going to chase. There's a prism here. It misses the pickup on Colossus one and two. And <laughs> did you? <laughs> that was pretty much a perfect game right there for Hero Marine. He did not struggle at all. That timing with the Marines was. Practically flawless. He got everything and then some with that push. And then the follow-up aggression was really, really strong as well. I mean, 
Yeah, that was that was really good. If you're a Hero Marine fan, if you're a Terran fan, you probably really enjoyed that game. That was insanely good. Yeah, that was just ridiculous, wasn't it? Yeah, it's not like Yumi I mean, really. Nothing to yeah, really say. Uh, like, I mean, the Phoenix yeah. went there. The, basically, the Phoenix went on the natural. But when the first attack happened, if the Phoenix there, you lift up a bunch of the Marines, you take the DPS away, maybe you hold. Battery was. Yeah, that's, that's one of the downsides of playing Phoenixes, right? Like, you're just so dependent on those Phoenixes, too, but you kind of need to play them at least somewhat aggressively. And then if yeah. suddenly there's a, a huge army in your, in your natural expansion, those Phoenixes are fast, but not fast enough. Maybe he could have recalled them to get him into the fight a little quicker. You know, maybe he didn't have the energy for it, but. Anyways, doesn't really matter. In the end, it was Hero Marine who ended up winning it, and he'd done it. Uh, he, he's done that very dominantly. We're going to go for round two right now as we head into TVP Crimson Court. Hero Marine looking for 2 0 to start off his ESL Spring Regionals campaign. And to uh, round us out for Group A today. Again, all the Group A matches are well, one playing a day. We're going to have one Group B match at the end. I imagine just some scheduling requests there as we get ready to jump into Crimson Court. Absolutely. We are. In me. Alrighty. Yeah. Alrighty. Oh, spawning right here. In Good. the bottom left hand corner with the blue protos pieces, we have four Jumi. And the top right with the red Terran pieces is gonna be Mouse Sports Hero Marine. Who's been with that team for ages? Yeah, we used to have this it's been a time. very long time. Yeah. That's uh, pretty much the longest running partnership in StarCraft 2 and in, in a big way in a lot of esports as well. So it's uh, a really crazy one. As you just drop down, cheeky little barracks and a cheeky little gateway on the other side as well. So we get ourselves settled in here for the moment. We get everything ready to go. Yeah, so what exactly do you change here for, for Jumi, right? Like, that's such a frustrating game, because you have everything going for you, but you're just out of position, you just barely didn't see that move out. It really is a... Uh, a it's very... Like, StarCraft 2 is very difficult in many ways, right? But it's just so easy for a game, especially with Phoenixes, to go horribly wrong. Because usually when it goes wrong with Phoenixes, it just is an absolute disaster. Yep. At least when you lose a Stalker or two with a Blink Stalker opener, you can sort of recover. But when something goes terrible in your... Or, or something goes poorly in the early game, it usually goes quite terribly for you, so... I wouldn't be surprised if this is maybe going to be more of a blink stalkery type of opener. We'll have to find out in just a moment, but well, yeah, this... it's not like Hero Marine won't have an answer against that either. Uh, it's one of those things, right, with the Phoenix, where it's like you're just so reliant on the Phoenix camp being good, and the Phoenix are very safe in good numbers. The moment you lose one, you're nowhere near as safe in one way, and that means you overcompensate, and then you're not safe elsewhere. And this knock-on effect is just absolutely huge. So, yeah, well. Uh... I guess we'll see what happens in the end as our creeper comes up, factory going through, Cybercore and Nexus all on the way out. Simulator building from Fujumi. Let me get this uh, ready to rumble as our Reaper continues to go out across the map as Hero Marine looks for early info, of course. Figured out it was a Stargate super early on last game. Let's see if we can spot the tech choice early this time. Yeah, so last time around when he saw the Stargate, he decided to commit to a triple Rex opener, but of course a delayed factory and then also a delayed starport. This time around, though, already making some deviations as he's already finished up the factory at this point in time. No tech uh, yet here for for Jumi, so I'm expecting that this is likely going to be a Stargate in just a moment. It's a little bit more of an expensive structure compared to the Twilight Council, although well, so far he's just stacking up the, the resources. Losing a bunch of probes at home as well. That adept is yeah. way across. Two probes going down. I mean, we're going to delay the CC. Is it worth it? Well, I mean, it's decent to delay, delay the CC, of course, but... I mean, two probes are still two probes as well, and we're still also delaying that tech. We've got the money, as you mentioned, banked up. We're just not spending it, because I, I assumed he didn't want to show what it was so easily, but at this point, the tech's so now. late. Yeah, this feels bad. Robo, robo facility. Do you really need to hide a robo for that long? Are you that concerned? Like, he's building it right now out front, too, so there's a good chance that these Terran units are going to find out about it in just a moment, regardless. Gets an adept in exchange for a Reaper. I think Hero Marine will be pretty happy about that. Yeah, I think the Robo is obviously something which is just... Well, I don't even know. I, I mean, that, that to me feels like it's almost the least punished by a late build, right? Because, like, with Blink, you really want that timing to be done. The Phoenix, the count is important. I mean, obviously, the Robo is important because the timing of the Immortal popping out and everything. But a lot of the time, initially on the Robo, yeah. you get, like, an Orbs and then maybe a little Harassing Prism. 
So the fact that it was Robo late due to the gas being delayed or whatever is like maybe the least impactful. It's fine. But then I kind of just hate that it's a Robo, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Robo openers in general either. It never really seems to work out that well. So again, you kind of turn into like almost like a Terran punching bag from here, right? Like Terran just gets to sort of do yeah. whatever they like. And I don't think Hero Marine really minds that at all. He's looking around, making sure that everything is pretty safe. He's seen the robo facility timing from his opponent, so he knows that he doesn't really have to be concerned of anything here in the future. And again, Hero Marine can start building up for a timing that he is most comfortable with. Now, he did go for the bunker, by the way, just super safe, not really taking any risks. Yumi's economy, though, is looking a little bit better here than Hero Marines for the time being. Yep. Absolutely. His, uh... <laughs> Ego looks fine, but I mean, at the same time, Hero Marine's getting into everything he wants. He's getting the tank, the Marine, the Raving setup all kind of going, so that's kind of everything we expect as the double Widowmine drop comes in. One drop, two drop, probes pull away already. And we're going to go Kaboom just for a couple, but the other Widowmine still has to be dealt with. If you don't deal with it, then of course, you are going to be having to delay your mining oh. time even longer. And we're going to save yeah. both Widowmines. Beautiful for Hero Marine gonna hide it in the corner jumi decides to go into the glaived adepts here so that is the ultimate goal i guess to try and just turn this into a bit of a protos all in too hero marine already preparing though against any sort of real twilight council follow-ups here with that raven too he would be fine against say some cheeky dark templar coming in a unit that we've seen do a lot of damage so far here today that's right but not so much in this particular series i guess huh no didn't really get a chance to build it. Glaives from Fajumi is kind of fun, though, right? I mean, maybe if you just go yeah. for, like, a big glaive immortal attack, you can catch your Marine a little bit off guard. Maybe that's where your opportunity comes from. I don't hate it. It's something different. It's a little oh, bit off beat. Oh, it? Yeah, this one, that sucks. Yeah, it's a bit different. It's a bit off beat. And that's why I kind of like it. It may not work. I oh. feel like it's got a better chance <sighs> to work. And holy goodness, how did that happen? That could have been an absolute disaster right there. But luckily for Fujumi, he did defend that very cleanly. Yep. Wonder if Hero Marine maybe could have retargeted and still reached the tail end of that pack of units. But, anyways, yeah, probably too far Hero away, Marine right? really not taking a lot of risks here. I think probably just a little just bit too far. Building away. it up. Anyways, I mean, here comes yeah, the attack, right? Probably. So, I mean, the thing, the thing is, Hero Marine is not ready to move out anyways because he doesn't have stims. So the defense looks good. The full wall is there. It looks. Horrible to try and attack into this with a glaive to depths. Yes. Um, there's there's no there's no third command center with this, so he's not taking any risks economically or anything like that. He is perfectly set up to defend whatever. Even a raven right now, he realizes he doesn't need it at home, so he decides to send that one and see if he can maybe move it across and throw some auto turrets in the opponent's mineral line. There are a lot of siege tanks set up. We're gonna do a little bit of elevator play here. Okay. Well, the Viking is going to put on a bit of work. God, this is going to take seven years, though, to get up to the high ground. I was going to say, yeah. we're going to ferry the entire unit comp up there. It's going to take a long while. And now Stimpak, I mean, it's a ticking time bomb here. Quite literally on the right side of your screens, it's finishing up. And the natural expansion is going to be denied for a while, too. I mean, for Juma, we got to go do something. But I, I get it. Like, it's almost impossible to find the moment because the moment isn't there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it's just a, a complete wall. wall off. Complete wall of the natural. And now plus one, combat shields and Stimpak are done. And that is going to make this Terran army that was already very difficult to beat here for the Protoss player even more powerful. He's hoping maybe he can stumble upon something here, destroying the rocks more or less out of frustration than really out of any necessity. Ah, oh, he's going to march back home. Oh, it's the march of shame. Yeah, I, you, I, yeah. I, I, going you can't do anything with that army, but I also don't think you can go home. I mean, walk, walking back home is bad enough, but walking back home when you're still, it's not even like you expanded behind to be like, okay, this ain't working, no. backup plan. He's like, I'm walking back home. Maybe he's just going to wait for Storm and just send it still on two bases or something. Like, maybe hope Hero Marine messes up and moves out. The problem is all these adepts become worse the longer this game goes. So your army yes. actually is a ticking time bomb in itself because these adepts really just suck. The longer, the more units there are, they just don't trade well enough. They can't stand up for themselves. I mean, there's no real good way to trade out adepts because it's going to be tough to find a way to send them into enough mineral lines to trade them out. So it sucks, okay, man. a couple of adepts good. over here, though, getting some damage in, yeah. Okay. Look well, at that line go. of red, though, on the okay. minimap right now. There is a huge army. Now, that was 10 SCVs. That's not bad at all. I, I mean, there you go. There's a way to throw some adepts away, I guess. But at the same time, it's also because Hero Marine is on a one-track mine across the map. 
He'll see no third base. I'm not sure he's really too bothered about no third. I think he's going no matter what. I think he knows his opponent's investment to this was way too much and didn't do anything at all. So he knows he can get away with just sending it. And I mean, the tank siege, the battle oh. oh, is just going to have to deal with these adepts. But I mean, this is looking fine. The tanks are going to melt the adepts away. <laughs> it's not even going to be close. Storm oh, finishes. the storm. Yeah, he didn't even realize, I don't think, that Storm was going to be finished, but he dorks. He was already running, and then the Storm was put in the path of those Marines. I mean, an amazing fight right here for the Terran player from Germany. Honestly, brilliant stuff right here fr from Hero Marine in this entire series. Just looking rock solid, not really making any mistakes, not really taking any real chances. GG is called a clean 2-0 win right here for Hero Marine. Yeah, the expected result comes through Hero Marine does well. Everyone was thinking it was going to happen. No offense for Jumi. Um, if he got the win here, everyone would have been very impressed and would have been really happy for him, but it was obviously yeah. just not meant to uh, realistically be on this one. And uh, Hero Marine is indeed going to go and take himself a win and put himself onto the expected start again. Hero Marine is one of the players you could probably expect to go 3-0 and in a group like this and just kind of make it straight out into that, uh, you know, playoff, so... No harm done for poor Jumi, like I say. He's got a long way to go in this tournament. He picked probably one of the rougher opponents just because, again, great opponent and someone he has a terrible record against. So it was always going to be a tough first round of matchup, and Hero Marine kind of set that in stone. Up next, Harstom, Euthermal, best of three, random versus Rodos. So we have no idea what we're about to cast. Uh, so that's all the more reason to stay tuned. Watch, you might get a great matchup that you love. You might not, but then it'll be too late. You'll be watching anyway, so... <laughs> we'll see you in a second. More StarCraft is on the way as one last best of three comes up.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Well, we've made it to the end of day number one of the ESL SE2 Masters for our regionals. Asia and now Europe, of course. Uh, America's begins in a couple of days, so make sure you get hyped for that as we get ready for our random versus Protoss matchup. You thermal play in random. Austin playing Protoss. We had to fix up all the graphics. No one had a random uh, race icon on any of the graphics ready to go. <laughs> so uh, trying to prep the graphics until earlier today was not easy. Uh, but it's all set to go now as uh, Uthel shows up playing random. You literally have no idea what's about to happen. How do you even no. veto a versus random? I guess you just veto the worst possible maps for like certain matchups. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so. Yeah, it can be a bit tricky, I guess, for Protoss in particular, right? When it comes to deciding where you want to, for example, place your very first pylon and whatnot. Because against Protoss in particular, I feel like random can actually give you a slight advantage. Because Protoss does tend to position their structures differently depending on the matchup. But yeah, a bunch of Dutch YouTubers facing against each other. Can you believe it, Vordy? That's Casted embarrassing. by a Dutch YouTuber as well. <laughs> I know. <clears throat> All right, well, we actually have very exciting news. It's going to be PVZ from half number one. As hmm. Spawning in as the random player in the top left-hand side of the map will be Ethermal. And his opponent down here in the bottom right-hand corner, playing with the blue proto species, it is Harstem. You know, I think... Picking side Delta is actually quite clever because you can get away with a low ground wall off on basically any map, I guess, or sorry, against any race, I guess, because that's kind of the issue you run into, right? Like, say it's a Protoss versus Protoss, it's kind of tricky to go for the low ground wall off. Say it's a Protoss mm -hmm. versus Terran, you really want to... Where do you decide to put your first pylon? So against Protoss, I mean, your thermal is not going to tell his opponent what he is going to be playing, of course. That's the advantage of playing random, but I think against Protoss, random is actually, yeah, quite strong. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I think Pros has affected the most. Like, with Terran, there's so many just baseline openers you can do to turn into different things. You know, Zerg can kind of figure it out before they've got to make too many decisions. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, not a bad uh, not a bad time to be uh, kind of playing uh, random when you get up against the Protoss players. So. It's, it's so difficult to judge how good Euthermal truly is, though, right? Like, he obviously doesn't actively compete in a lot of tournaments anymore. He makes a lot of, you know, videos about them, and he obviously messes around in events, and he plays high-ranking players all the time. But technically speaking, Harstam should be significantly advantaged in this particular series, especially when Euthermal does not spawn in as Terran. I, I, I think Harstam will be 100% happy here that he went for the low-ground expansion, that he went for... Well, uh, that he spawned in, I guess, as, as as a Zerg player. I have a very hard time imagining that Euthermal is going to have a, a good time against Harstom's Protoss when he's playing Zerg. Especially At the same time, I guess that also means Euthermal can like throw like a, a curveball and go for some something crazy, but I'm not sure. I was going to say, especially because Harstom PvZ especially has been so good lately. Like, I mean, he knocked Draenor yep. out of Atlanta, right? I mean, he has been absolutely one of the players to watch in the matchup, so... Yeah, hard to really imagine. I mean, we'll see what Euthermal does. I feel like we're going to be seeing something kind of aggressive. I think we're going to even see, like, very fast Hydras, for example, is the kind of thing I've seen him do a couple of times when playing against Pros players with his Zerg. So, yeah, we'll see what he gets up to. The Stargate comes down here from Harstam, though, and that's going to just be a very standard opener for PvZ, of course. No surprises there. So, uh, yeah. He just gets to play a very normal opening from here. And, I mean, if you're Harstam, you're just playing as safe as possible. No, absolutely. I think Hearthstone, you just go for the most standard of standard build order. Because usually that means you can't really die to anything silly, right? And that's your main goal, I think. When you're going up against a player who you're not 100% certain about, but who you feel like you are better in, especially when it goes to the later stages of the game. So Oracle with adept aggression, very powerful. We'll probably see a nice and early third Nexus just to be able to match that Zerg economy pretty much regardless. There's your Thermal, though. Going into a lair. He left the drones in gas. He's skipping the third hatchery and he's going straight into a lair. Could be Spire, could be Nidus Worm, could be Swarm Host, could really be anything. But at the very least, it's going to be something unorthodox. Yeah, I think Hydra's personally, I think Hydra 10 fast Hydra's be kind of aggressive off of it, maybe. So we'll see. Yep. Like you say, it really could be anything. I I'm basing this off of like a game I saw like a, Void Ray first. a long time ago. <laughs> 
Okay, they should. Oh no, there's an Oracle into a Void Ray. I was gonna say that would be a super late uh, first unit, but no, it's an Oracle into a Void Ray. Void Ray, I guess, is the Jack of all trades flying unit, right? You can't really take yeah. a lot of damage. And you know what? It's so good against someone who may be being very aggressive because you can knock down nearby overlords, so Night Sim becomes a much tougher, uh, you know, idea. I think mm. that's a, a big part of it, right? So it's also there safely early on. We're gonna see Overlord speed off the lair. Okay, he's thermal. I'm waiting to see what this build is. It doesn't require a lair anymore. He does realize that, right? It's been a couple years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... He fired it up right as the lair finished. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that is a bit of a funny one. I would imagine we're going to be ferrying a bunch of queens Le across the map. Lair for the drop lord? Just he yeah, hasn't yeah, started yeah, the drop exactly. lord yet. Yeah. Cool. Okay. okay. Well, maybe we just went to lair. I, I was really hyped nice up for the lair finishing, man, and then nothing yeah, happened. Yeah. Okay, there it is. There it there is. Three drop alerts coming in. Does he see it? I think he just spotted it. Did Harstam just... I think he must have had a glimpse of it with that oracle. Yeah, I think so, too. And he's going to start batteries up. He has absolutely realized exactly what is going on. So Harstam knows. Harstam is aware. And Harstam is going to be putting himself into... I think pretty, uh... <laughs> There's not even a room in all three overlords. I like that there's three drop alerts. Now Harstam is going to have to play uh, like Whack-A-Mole with Overlord, you know, like which one actually has the units inside of it. So mass drop. One of them is going to go into the main base. Three of them are going across the map. One and a half or so of those are empty. Firstlings will be unloading over here. He's hoping an all army hotkey and that units are going to be able to stream into the natural two. But it looks like that is not the case here for Harstam. Mm, he's going to get the Adept there. The Queen's dropping off on that third base. The Stalkers and the Adept are going to sit pretty well choked up. And we do have that uh, battery in position as well, so that will help them to keep alive. Right now, I think Ethan was just missing the DPS to really do anything through a battery. Overcharge <laughs> available. Oracle will go down quickly, but man, there's just there's just too many units here. Stalkers and Adepts can just fight back. And no, and we know which Overlord the Queens are in there. So the Overlord goes down, the Queens are stranded, and well, I think we're waving goodbye to game number one already. Harstam making a good defense, although now again, surrounded by those Lings, that's not what he really wanted to happen. So a minor problem along the way. Yeah, a little bit of a bump in the road, more so than anything, though. Assuming these probes will stay alive, at least the majority of them, he should be okay. Harston with some nice hold positioning over here. Those Stalkers putting in quite a bit of work. Queen's decided to turn around. Glaives, by the way, is just about to finish up here, so Harston is going to be able to retaliate eventually and should be having a pretty easy time against those Zerklings as well in just a moment. I mean, honestly, even if he kills this entire base, right? The entire third base falls, Harston is still a hit. Yeah, I mean, he's got 60 probes to, like, 30. Like, he's in an amazing position. It's so hard to lose this game, right? And it's actually getting exactly of Glaive, so there's nothing that really <laughs> you fights the You have to try to lose this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so, indeed. G, indeed. That's going to wrap us up nice and quickly there as Halstom takes game number one. And uh, that's what we kind of, I guess, expect, which is, you know, win. So, good start. He gets the job done. Obviously, Euthermal brought the aggression, so Euthermal tried to be pretty aggressive. Didn't work out. See what he has planned for game two, but I guess that also depends on the um Yeah, I guess that also depends on the um the race that you roll. <laughs> yeah, it is kinda wild. It really does add an extra layer of strategy, I guess, right? So I'm a little surprised actually that Side Delta was allowed from the vetoes, because this is a relatively straightforward map, I think, I guess. Uh, especially against Protals. We'll have to see exactly what game number two is gonna be. Apparently that will be Dynasty. Yeah. Alright. Didn't we see Dynasty earlier? We did see Dynasty earlier, yes. Yeah, I mean, that was, like, was uh, the, the tournament. I'm like, PvP. I don't think so. No, that was the Protoss versus yeah. Protoss game that we that saw. Was that was an absolute game. banger. <laughs> yeah, really I thought it was really fun, game. but some people could categorize that as stupid, sure. I, I mean, I don't think some people, I think everyone categorizes it as stupid. That doesn't stop it being fun. But it, it was stupid. A 17-minute long game where both players have only two bases? Yeah, that was a, I'm, I'm, a bit of a special and one. The guy, <laughs> and the guy wins, but then refuses to not walk through the wall, like the one mineral wall against choke like <laughs> yeah, very okay. fun oh, that was a real but yeah that also like that game number one though just now between harstam and euthermal i think that's a good example as to why sometimes cheeses are not necessarily that great at the professional level right i get that question all the time like why don't we see like a 12 pool rush or like a full-on proxy on the other side of the map like yeah technically they can work but against high-ranking players, like, for example, Harstam, they've played against that a million times. They know exactly what to do. And even though that probably wasn't considered, like, the perfect defense by Harstam, maybe he could, like, criticize his own game. He was still so far ahead after that exchange, so... And it's gonna be, uh... It's gonna be tough if Euthermal decides to cheese every game like that. 
He then was just like, I forgot overload speed and overload speed all in. Instant classic. I was like, <laughs> no. Yeah, that, that probably would explain why we didn't know what the heck was going on when the uh, <laughs> when the overload speed started and the lab finished. Definitely he literally right. said in the chat, I forgot overload speed with an overload speed all in. Yeah. Instant classic is what he calls it. Nice. Instant classic. Well, I wouldn't say it was quite a classic. So. No, I don't think it was really a classic. I don't think anybody's going to take notes from that one and decide, right. you know what, I'm going to give that a try. It's matchup guessing time. I think we see PvP. Mm -hmm. PvP? PvP? Yeah. Do you really want to play PvP against Arstom? I hope for you, Thermal's oh. sake. Oh, okay. He oh. spawns in as Terran, and guess what? <laughs> guess what? Once upon a time, he's a Terran player. It's rigged. Yeah. It's rigged. What if he just randoms as Terran for the rest of the tournament? And then he ends up winning. Could be. God. That would be insane. Yeah. All right, in the bottom left-hand side, up a game from the Shopify Rebellion will be our Blue Protoss player, Austin. His opponent looking for a good YouTube video title. Can he find one? It is Euthermal. I cheese Harstam in every game in this X amount of dollar tournament. Something like that. My opponent did not expect this in this X amount of dollars tournament. It's very important to put the, the dollar value in the, in the title. I forgot overload speed in an X dollar tournament. <laughs> and, and, and then you're like, oh, well, how did you win? It's like, no, I actually got smashed. I you lost me the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, it's an eight minute video yeah. of you thermal absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yes. It's just for the title and the thumbnail. Yeah, something along those lines. Well, great idea. Well, so far that first game was not quite ideal for you, Thermal, but now he's playing Terran. So in case you haven't watched a lot of StarCraft, you Thermal for about a decade was a professional Terran player. So he should know how to play it. But then again, he hasn't really played at this level for quite a while. I can imagine he feel, he still feels far more comfortable playing Terran than he does with, with Protoss and with Zerk, but he's going up against Harstam. And Harstam is, of course, one of Euro's greatest Protosses. So... It's an uphill battle, no matter what. Absolutely is. As uh, you see Reaper coming up, Orbital Factory all coming through, and all of that on the go. As you see our Cyber Gold coming in as well, Nexus also on the way out. Just bringing this up, getting this going. Away we go. I kind of like this map choice actually as well here for Hearthstone. Like he went for the high ground pylon into a gateway over there. I guess if it would have been Zerk, he could have expanded to the gold. Yeah. So there's actually... Because that's the, the main dilemma you run into here as Protoss. Like, where do you put your first structures? Yeah, well, this map... super important. Hmm, not bad. Yeah, no. It feels as though the maps are kind of giving Hearthstone ways to kind of decide where to expand. He's not doing it too quickly or anything. So, just being very calm, being very patient. He's not taking my approach when I play against <laughs> random players, which is just to instantly cry and complain. He's actually thinking about it and thinking of a good approach to deal with it. So, yeah. All right. We're going to go... Double Reaper production. Normally we see the big switcheroo and we go for a bunch of Hellions instead, but... This is one way of doing it. It's gonna be a Stargate, by the way, here defensively for Harstam. Could obviously just go into an Oracle. If he's feeling really threatened, he could even go into a Void Ray. Again, no normally not units that we see made, but it's possible. I refuse to believe you'll build a Void Ray. I don't think so either, but Does I mean, Avoider even I feel help like you? as, as Harstam, you just you just play survival, right? Now, there's no way he's going to do it as his first unit, but maybe as soon as he realizes this could be some wild aggression. I think you just keep building Phoenix. Phoenix is pretty good against Akro now. Yeah. Nah, that's true. I feel like as Harstam, your main objective in a, a game like this is just to try and get it to the 10 minute mark, you know, like <laughs> try to just survive for a while. Yeah, you can see a couple of Hellions going to show up on the uh, natural there. I'm just going to be seeing those probes. We're going to be coming about a little bit. We got ourselves the Reapers moving around also. I'm just going to be having the Viking, the Marine, cloaking coming up. Uh, start cloaking for a second, cancel it. So just trying to fake an idea or something. And those Reapers are going to be out of there. So, so far, so good. Absolutely. So there is, of course, by the way, a qualifier for this event. So... Euthermal certainly managed to win there as well, playing a random. It's not like he just signed up for this event and got to play immediately. Certainly already showing us some games, and he's still a very formidable player. Yep. 
Well, that was, that's just, now it's not only you're facing pro gamers. Yeah, that's very true. <clears throat> I mean, it's impressive to qualify as random in the first place. And it's random, like, it, it can look good, even in his non-Terran matchups. It's just, it's always going to be mm -hmm. an uphill battle. But that's the fun of kind of watching him in play. Like, what can he actually achieve here? Can he take a map? Can he take a couple? What kind of crazy stuff does he come out with to try and win? Obviously, overload speed, all in. Attempt in the first game, that sort of stuff. It's gonna be, he's going to be an entertaining player to watch over the next couple of weeks. Pretty normal build, though, all things considered right now from your thermal. Nothing all too crazy. I mean, we had those additional Reapers, but I'm kind of waiting for where he is going to be throwing the curveball next, you know? Like, what he is going to be bringing. I'm kind of uh, expecting a battle crew. Yeah, you know, anything wild here. But so far, this is surprisingly normal, and that puts him in a pretty good position. But of course, again, you have to win against Harstam then in a macro game, if that's the goal. Is that really something you want to do? It's going to be charged, by the way, on the back of this right here for Harstam, not favoring the quick Wolsai or anything like that. Hmm. Yep, yeah, I'm just getting that charge upgrade started. As you do see the Phoenix showing up, we're going to grab a couple of SCVs, so some damage being dealt. It'll just cause a little bit of trouble. I mean, already nice, right? You're just chipping away at your opponent's economy and making it more difficult for them. You're just, again, putting yourself in a good little spot in these early stages. I mean, again, as far as Hosman's concerned, he sees everything. He sees the standard setup. He's moving into charge. Yep. So he's getting a good, you know, answer to any kind of bigger attack coming his way. All of that coming through. And that ready to rumble. Yeah, the problem here for you, Thermal, is that he's kind of playing against Harstam, who will play against this sort of style all day, every day, right? Like, this is something that you, Thermal, has practiced, but not nearly as much as Harstam, I can imagine. So Harstam will be more than keen to just keep playing this. The charge slot follow-up is kind of cool, but the problem is that charge slot don't have an easy time getting to the other side of those gold and mineral fields. Then again, though, this is, of course, triple Nexus economy right now. Ooh, one cheeky little widow mine. Triple Nexus economy right here for the Protos player. Your thermal praying that he was going to get a massive connection right there with that mine. There are a couple here hiding behind that structure. Nicely done, but this is one of the few flying or one of the few early game units for Protos that does stay alive against a Widowmine hit. Yep, you can take one hit, just don't take a second and, and don't let two units near each other get hit because the splash will oh. kill us. You can get a few probes, so damage being done. This gold base being punched a little bit as these marines show up okay. as well. They'd like to get some damage dealt now. Units are going to be on top of this pretty quickly. There's lots of charging over, and these Marines are now stranded. So, unfortunately, this is not going to go anywhere for you, Thermal. This is going to be a pretty quick shutdown, in fact. Yeah, even if there was a matter of fact, those uh, Phoenixes were already heading back home as well. So, no easy way to pick it up. Okay, now Stimpak finishes up. Generally speaking, finishing up Stimpak before a fight is preferable. Yep. Stimpak is uh, pretty useful, so... <laughs> it's all right. It's, it's all, right. all right. It's okay. Even in the hands of a random player, you know. Okay, Widowmind Drop is going to move across the map once more. Robo Facility, only about halfway done at this point for Harstam. Yeah, he doesn't really want to commit into a whole lot of those Phoenixes, on, or sorry, a whole lot of those Widowmines just yet. Big Widowmind Drop, it looks like there was. Wow. We have no Bye -bye. reaction here from Bye -bye. Harstam. Huge. Well, at the same yeah, time, we're going to get forced fielded to the low ground. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Interesting moment. He cleaned out all of those window mines here, so he doesn't even need the detection, I guess. Now he's also lifting up a couple of units on the other end of that force field. Loads of SCVs go down, and well, there it is. Maybe not the cleanest of games right there for the Dutch Protos, but still a solid victory nonetheless. A solid victory. That really uh, went by very quickly, didn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. We had high hopes for this one. It didn't quite yeah, work out right hopes. there for you, Thermal. Yeah, unfortunately, that was not... Uh... Not the one, and uh, we'll have to see Thermal trying to come back again later in the uh, tournament to try and get his victory with Random. Hopefully at some point, I, I really hope he gets... I, I think he can absolutely A, get a map win, and B, like a series win. But, yeah. Like, it's obviously... Hosnum is just such a difficult opponent, especially because Hosnum has been playing so well recently as well. I will really stand by this. He's been playing great as of late, so... Yep. Yeah, this was uh, unfortunately not meant to be it, and that means that Hosnum takes it 2-0, to zero, and that rounds out our day as we have a look back on what happened here in Europe. It all started off with that PvP with Shadon taking down DNS, and then always a Clem, Spirit, and Battleby all 2 owed their ways into those 1-0 uh, positions. Battleby over Wayne, probably the most impressive result there. Goblin 2-1, Mana, and then Hero Marine and Hosp made it look easy at the end to join the 1-0 crew at the end of day one of the European round robin Swiss format. 
the ESL Regionals, SAT Masters Spring. Wow. What day? Yeah. It actually flew by. I mean, we've been here for quite a while, of course. I think we've been, uh, it's been like we've been hours. casting games for a little over like seven, maybe coming yes. up on eight hours. I'm not exactly sure. It's been a while, but I mean, a lot of fun games. We, we, Absolutely uh, not a disappointing game or a day one rotter. We whacked a whole lot of best threes in those days, so that's uh, that much is for sure. As uh, mm -hmm. that is very simply just going to be it, guys. That is day one in the bag. So we're going to be back tomorrow. I'm not going to be here. I believe Steadfast is hosting. I don't know with who else, but... Um, it's me. Oh, it's you. There you go. Loco's going to be here. He's going to be back tomorrow, so he's back around. I'm going to be here. Perfect. Well, yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Hope you guys have a great day. Yeah, we had some fun matches. We'll be looking forward to more of them tomorrow. Again, loads of best of threes every single day for the next four weeks, apart from Mondays, where you can go watch the ESL Open Cups. So make sure you sit around and watch this channel. Everything happens on this stream as well. No B stream. Every game in the regionals happens on the mainstream this season, so it's even more StarCraft than before. So again, sit tight, look after all of that, enjoy it. Like I said, we'll be back tomorrow for more StarCraft 2 from the ESL SD Masters. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and ESL Shop for helping to make this happen. We appreciate you, and we will see you guys tomorrow for more SD2.